A Warrior's Soul. Highland Heartbeats Book 8. By Aileen Adams. Chapter 1. Can We Ride No Faster? Roderick's voice was almost a growl. Bryce McDougall exchanged a look with his brother, Fergus, whose notoriously thin patience was growing thinner by the moment. It showed. On the other hand, Bryce found Roderick's anxiety humorous. It was his nature to find humor in the truly ridiculous. And at this moment, Roderick's behavior fell well within the ridiculous. Roderick rode in front of Bryce and Fergus, every movement jerky and sharp as though he were nursing a grudge and hardly able to behave himself as a result. Didn't he know that when he acted that way, it only made his friends want to slow to a crawl? It wasn't that any of them wished for Roderick to delay in seeing his bride for the first time in a week. They were in agreement that his marriage was a fine, solid decision. The best he could have made. Roderick and Caitlin were clearly meant to be man and wife, as they had been since childhood. Bryce would never begrudge a friend his happiness, especially a friend who meant as much as Roderick did to him. He'd never been one to experience anything more than a brief flash of jealousy from time to time, and that was always in the most extreme cases. So it was not Bryce's jealousy of Roderick's marriage, which was beginning to make Roderick rather unbearable. It was the way Roderick insisted on conducting himself of late. Not an evening had gone by without him mentioning her at least once. Wondering aloud what she might be doing, how she might be feeling. Wondering if Sorcher's home was truly the best place in which she should spend her time while the four of them were out, earning a living. It had gotten to the point where once Fergus had asked, and who is Caitlin again, when Roderick mentioned her name. They'd all laughed, including the new bridegroom, but that laughter held an edge of truth to it. Perhaps Roderick should have taken time away from their work in order to be with her. Not a possibility, unfortunately, for he needed the silver as much as they did, nay more, as he wished to secure land for his bride and his family. The modest farmhouse came into view once they made the turn from the main road, with its lush trees on either side, to the narrower trail which led to the McManus farm. The land was open, sitting as it did at the apex of the fork in the River Nevis. It was a lovely sight, to be sure, especially since the four of them were rather filthy and seemed to be holding a competition with the horses for who could smell the worst. So far, the animals were winning, but it was a close contest. A home-cooked meal and a night spent indoors, even if it meant sleeping on Sorcher's kitchen floor, would be a treat. Roderick rode ahead, as Bryce had known he would. The McDougal brothers chuckled to themselves, perhaps more than a bit relieved that their friend would finally be with his wife and leave them alone about her for the time being. Do ye think we ought to wait outside for a moment? Fergus wondered aloud as they approached, Roderick already having disappeared through the kitchen door. Inside the house something clattered and broke. I think we ought to give them more than just a moment. Bryce laughed. Come. Let us water the horses and perhaps have a bath. You could certainly use one, Fergus observed, nose wrinkling in distaste as though he did not also carry the stench of horse and sweat. The two of them grumbled good-naturedly as they tended the horses, hobbling them in a particularly thick patch of clover, before stripping off their filthy clothing. I must say I'm not sorry to be doing this, Bryce groaned as he stepped into the cool clear water. He'd never been one to believe in an afterlife, much less anything better waiting for him in some far-off invisible place, if such a place existed, however. A high shrill voice cut through the heavy late summer air. What do the two of you think you're doing there? Bryce was already in the river up to the middle of his waist, but Fergus hadn't yet gone in past his knees. The strident female voice made him stumble in surprise, sending him splashing full-bodied into the water. Bryce laughed at his brother, but Sorcher did not. Where have you lot been, that you do not know of the rains which have swelled the river? It's dangerous being in there. She approached the bank with hands on her hips, glaring at the two of them. The current is strong but not overly strong, Bryce assured her. Fergus shook his head, flipping back the soaked hair which had hung in his face when he emerged from the rushing river. You've a talent for surprising a man, he observed, crouching low for the sake of modesty. 
Ok, I'd have held my tongue longer for the sake of observing ye, if I hadn't been concerned for your safety. Sorcha smoothed back the grey streaked hair which a steady breeze had pulled loose from her braid. The pair of ye looked so pleased to be washing the filth from yourselves. Bryce had never possessed much patience with women, they were beyond his realm of understanding and so rarely relied on sense and logic, but Caitlin's aunt was a different matter. She was a lovely person, which perhaps was the highest compliment he could pay. He'd known many who were not nearly so lovely, after all. We'll be safe enough. He grinned. And if I feel the current pulling on me a bit too strong, I'll be sure to call out to ye for help. She shook her head. I'd give your head the dunking it needs more like. She glanced toward the house, a sly smile crossing her face. I suppose my nephew and niece are inside. I, which is why we're outside. Fergus snorted. I'm certain ye could both use the bath after spending your days in the saddle. She ran a hand over the soft brown flank of the gelding Bryce had been riding since they departed Dremarban, and crooned soft words into its ear. I would have preferred my nephew join ye prior to spending time with his wife inside my home, but I cannot ask for everything. He ought to scrub the place out after spreading his stench about, Bryce suggested. I'd be more than happy to order him for ye. I, I'm certain of it. Sorcher grinned. I've never seen a lot so ready to break each other's private bits. Fergus snorted in disbelief at the older woman's turn of phrase, perhaps even a slight twinge of embarrassment. But not Bryce. If anything, it only made him like her more. He could understand why Roderick had taken to her in such a manner. At least his friend had a kind, motherly woman to call his aunt after having married Caitlin. She'd always been a mother figure to him, Bryce knew, and it meant a tremendous lot to him that she was still part of his life. So too did it mean much to know his new wife had a home to live in, and someone to watch after her while he went off to his work. Bryce was a reasonable man. He knew his friend was loyal, steadfast, brave. He also knew he'd rather be home with his wife if at all possible. It pained him endlessly to spend even a day away from her. Many were the nights when they'd spoken among themselves, determined to draw him out by telling old stories and jokes when he'd fallen into silence after speaking of her. To his credit, he'd done his best to play along. Never one to dampen the mood if he could help it. But Roderick's heart wasn't in it, just the same, and they'd given up after a while. Best to let him stew in his thoughts, far away from wherever the men happened to be camped for the night. Just as it had before, it would be a difficult parting when the time came for them to leave. Only the fact that Quinn hadn't met them at the house, meaning he'd still be in the village or on his way back, allowed them to linger as they were. Well, Sorcher asked, gazing down at the two bathers from the slightly elevated bank. What will ye be embarking on this time? Bryce shrugged, careful to keep himself far enough below the surface to maintain even a slight sense of modesty. While he enjoyed conversing with her, he wished she'd find something else to do at the moment, but the house was likely off-limits just then, and she wouldn't wish to intrude on the newlyweds. We cannot say just yet, he explained. Quinn rode ahead to the village, so he might get word of another task for us. And you're certain he won't dally? she asked with a knowing gleam in her eye. So, Caitlin and she had talked about the men with whom her husband spent his time. Quinn was notorious among them for his roving eye and way with women. I'd like to see what he could find in terms of companionship with the small bit of silver in his pouch. Fergus laughed. We made certain of it. I don't trust him on his own after so many days spent outside the acquaintance of lasses. A wise decision. Sorcher smiled, nodding. Then she turned in the direction of the house and cupped her hands around her mouth. I'll be needing to prepare dinner for my guests, in case anyone inside the house cares. I'll want to enter in a minute or two. The door opened moments later, Caitlin's familiar black hair fanning out when the breeze caught it. You can come in any time you like, and many thanks for the embarrassment. Bryce raised an eyebrow as Sorcher headed toward the house. Hum. Already finished up in there. Perhaps our friend was a bit more enthusiastic than we gave him credit for. 
The brothers did their best not to chuckle knowingly as Roderick advanced. His brow was deeply lined, his mouth a sharp slash across the lower part of his face. You won't say a word if you know what's good for ye, Roderick announced as he stripped down and plunged into the river washing his clothing as he washed himself. Here, he said, tossing two small cakes of brown soap to the men. Many thanks, Bryce replied, glancing at his brother. Fergus shrugged. She's feeling poorly, Roderick explained without being prompted. Told me she's been losing the contents of her stomach all morning. Och, that's a shame, Rice muttered as he washed. Poor timing, to be certain. That isn't what bothers me, Roderick replied as he savagely washed his tunic. His movements were sharp, jerky, making Bryce wonder if he shouldn't warn against rubbing holes in the already worn cloth. It's that she's been ill like this for days. And there is no way for me to know about it when she is. Anything could happen here. Anything at all. It was a familiar concern, one which the rest of them were unable to offer a solution to. Just as they'd always been unable to do before. The way Bryce saw it, life was full of choices. This or that. Live in front of the hearth, comfortable, growing fat and soft over time, as a life of action and activity faded away until it was nothing but the vaguest memory, or continued to travel across the countryside in search of new adventures, while not unimportantly providing for one's family. In Roderick's case, choosing to make a living as he did meant spending time away from his new bride. He might instead decide to accept his brother Porrick's offer to make a home in the Anderson clan, according to the order of his birth, Roderick as the eldest surviving son should be the one to lead the clan, not Porrick the youngest son. However, Roderick wanted nothing to do with clan leadership. Bryce could understand that. Still, after three months of taking on assignments, stopping at Sorcher's farm whenever possible, it seemed to all of them that Roderick should have adjusted to being without Caitlin. After all, as Quinn had made the grave mistake of pointing out, the couple had spent seven years apart after Roderick left to join the army. Roderick hadn't taken well to that bit of flippancy, and Quinn had earned himself a split lip. As it turned out, while they'd easily jested with one another for as long as they'd been acquainted, there were certain topics a man did not appreciate being used as fodder for jokes. Bryce knew well when to hold his tongue, and he did so while the three of them finished bathing. He ran the soap between his hands and lathered his beard, then the thick hair which hung down to his collar. A mix of brown and red, more of the latter than the former. At the very least, his friend's inability to stay away from his wife meant the occasional warm fresh meal from Sorcher's kitchen, and the promise of a pack full of food to take along when they left. The smell of roasting lamb greeted Bryce as the three of them walked from the river toward the house, making his mouth water in anticipation. It would be a pleasant afternoon and evening to be sure. He was glad Quinn took so long in the village, as they'd been on horseback for nearly a solid fortnight. Even a man whose life had been spent more or less outdoors, no matter the time of year, appreciated the promise of rest. Roderick was first inside the house, followed by Fergus. The pair were immediately put to work by Sorcher, who ordered them to scrub potatoes and turnips as Caitlin still wasn't feeling herself. Bryce laughed at the look on his brother's face, the only time he'd ever spent in a kitchen was while eating. Caitlin did not allow Bryce to enter, catching him by the arm before he could cross the threshold. The troubled look in her eye put him on his guard. He allowed her to lead him behind the house, where the land came to a point at the river's fork. It was a lovely scene to be sure, with the tall grass swaying and rippling in the breeze stretching out before them. Caitlin Anderson didn't look as though the landscape gave her much pleasure. She looked rather put out, in fact. She took a deep breath, closing her eyes as she did. Forgive me, she whispered, but I needed to get away from the house for a bit. While the meat is roasting, I cannot seem to avoid feeling ill. Her skin had an odd grey colour to it, and he began to wonder if there wasn't something to her strange illness after all. Perhaps Roderick's worry wasn't entirely without merit. Do you need to sit? he asked, casting his eyes about for something suitable. She shook her head, eyes opening. No, thank you. It's kind of ye to ask. How was your journey? He knew what she was asking. 
He did well. No danger to him. Did I not offer my word? Something he never would have admitted to Roderick, or, frankly, to any of the others. The morning the group had left on their first mission after the wedding, Caitlin had all but held a dirk to his throat and forced him to give his word to protect her husband. He'd wanted to tell her the dirk was unnecessary. The four of them, and any other of the men they'd lived and fought and travelled alongside, had protected one another for years. There was no hope for any of them to survive otherwise. A woman, even one who Bryce could admit was unique to her sex, wouldn't understand that sort of brotherhood. Yes, that is true, she murmured, sighing, turning her gaze toward the horizon. I fear for him. For all of you. We've been at this line of work for a long time, he reminded her, aware that it was awkward and perhaps little consolation, but at a loss for anything more to say. For it was true, they knew what they were about, and the fact that one of their number had taken a wife didn't change that. Even so, it meant the actions which might have once been performed without a second thought, were no longer as easily managed. Roderick had more than just himself to consider. Bryce turned to her, hoping to choose the correct words for once in his life. It seemed the wrong thing tended to fall out of his mouth, just when he was trying his hardest to do right. It's important for men such as us to act without fear. When we fear, we pause. Hesitate at the wrong moment. In a fight, especially a fight in which there is quite a bit of danger, hesitation can be a deadly mistake. You're telling me I ought to discourage Roderick from thinking about me while he's with ye. To be honest with ye, lass, I'm not entirely certain what I'm saying. It's of little use to tell your husband how to think or what to do. I've learned that particular lesson the hard way. I'm sure you have. She chuckled softly. And I understand. But I worry. I worry so terribly. I wish there was something I could say or do to ease your mind. She turned to him, eyes now hard as flint. And he couldn't help but wonder how he'd fallen into her trap so easily. You can speak to him on my behalf and convince him to allow me to accompany you on your next mission. He laughed. That was the wrong thing to do. What's so amusing, she demanded, hands on her hips. He'd seen that posture many times in their short acquaintance, had heard the threatening note in her voice. She was not the last to be laughed at. He'd like as not earn her fist in his eye. I'm sorry, lass. Forgive me. He cleared his throat, forcing himself to think of sad or tragic things to keep his mirth at bay. The very thought of her accompanying them was truly humorous. I've travelled with the lot of you, she insisted. I know what it means to ride for so many days at a time, to sleep out of doors, to eat whatever is handy. You cannot frighten me off, Bryce. I'm not trying to frighten ye off, lass. Believe me. I know you're not easily frightened. Even so, that was a far different situation. You were our mission then. Keeping you safe was our goal. It would still be our goal if ye were to ride along, which means we would not be able to focus our attention on the mission at hand. Do ye understand? He hoped so, for there was no better way he could imagine to explain himself. She frowned, looking pained. That was the last thing he'd wanted to pain her in any way. Please, I meant no personal affront. I'm merely telling you what Roderick would. What are you on about out here? Sorcher called out. He'd never been so glad to see her. Surely she would be able to talk sense to her niece. He was already preparing himself to edge away from Caitlin and make his escape. Caitlin's eyes filled with tears of frustration. I was asking him to speak to Roderick on my behalf. Sorcher's expression hardened into angry lines. Not what he had expected to see, instead of confusion or surprise she was infuriated. You're still on about this? she asked, throwing her hands up in exasperation. I've never known another more determined to have her way. The two of ye have discussed this then, Bryce surmised. Indeed more times than I can count, Sorcher growled. Yet it seems she refuses to listen to reason. As if she's determined to ignore me. Caitlin looked ready to burst with anger. I'm not a child. 
Or had you forgotten? When she stomped her foot, Bryce had no choice but to bite his tongue in order to refrain from laughing. For someone who wasn't a child, she certainly made a show of behaving like one. Sorcher wasn't laughing. I should think any sort of travel would be the furthest thing from your mind in your condition. Bryce's jaw dropped. And to his surprise so did Caitlin's. Her eyes went wide, perfectly round, and her face went slack with surprise. Chapter 2 Bryce looked from Caitlin to Sorcher and back. It seemed wrong for him to be there, as though he was eavesdropping on something which had nothing to do with him. He felt acutely uncomfortable all of a sudden. And yet, when he made a move to flee back to the house, Sorcher touched his arm, signalling him to stay. Caitlin, meanwhile, was as stunned as ever. Sorcher's anger softened. You hadn't suspected, she asked. Caitlin's shoulders rose in a slight shrug. I suppose I was too concerned with Roderick's return to notice. How did you know? You've been ill in the morning. The scent of food in the kitchen makes you sick. You've been fatigued as well. You have not nearly the energy you once had. This is true. I supposed it was a simple illness, Caitlin murmured. Her hands crossed over her belly, as though she was still absorbing the information she'd just learned. Sorcher flashed Bryce an apologetic smile. I'm sorry ye had to be here for this, she murmured. It's likely an uncomfortable thing to be hearing about. Nay, nay, he mumbled. He was terribly uncomfortable, but did not want to admit it. Should Roderick not be here to hear of this? I, of course, Sorcher agreed, since it was clear Caitlin was unable to speak as yet. Her eyes were strangely unfocused, staring off into the distance, and her mouth hung open slightly in wonder. For a moment, the briefest, slightest moment, he envied her and Roderick. When his friend heard that his family was about to grow, he'd be overjoyed. Bryce wondered what that sort of joy was like. What would it be to love another as Roderick did? Certainly, that love tied him down and slowed him down considerably, but it also gave him something to look forward to. He had a reason to want to go home when a mission was complete. Bryce wondered what he had. What he would ever have. I thought I was only a little ill. Something that would pass. Caitlin looked at her aunt as though desperate to make sense of things. Are you certain? You would know better than I would. Sorcher chuckled. But I've known enough women in your condition to recognize the signs. A note of sadness tinged her voice. Bryce's heart went out to her. She'd never been able to have children of her own, though she'd been a mother figure to both Roderick and Caitlin in their youth. Caitlin's eyes met Bryce's. Don't tell Roderick. Please. That is not my place, he said, holding up both hands. You might as well pretend as though I was never here. So. Sorcher's hands found her hips. I think it's well past time to give up the notion of travelling with the men. It simply isn't meant to be. He was certain a miracle had just come his way. It would have been all but impossible to refuse her, had it not been for Sorcher's announcement, and there was no telling how long it would have taken before Roderick felt secure in leaving her again. He would keep this observation to himself, as he did so many others. His friends might have seen him as a jester, a light-hearted man who rarely thought beyond the current moment, but they didn't know what went on in his mind, mainly because he was smart enough to stay silent on much of what he observed. At that moment, while the three of them walked to the house, he knew better than to share his relief. It wasn't easy to keep a smile from his face. Caitlin's surprise wasn't the end of the day's surprises either. They were finishing up the midday meal, Caitlin clearly had little interest in what had been laid before her, but to her credit she tried as hard as she could to eat, when Roderick's head cocked in the direction of the open door. Hooves. Thank the heavens, Fergus muttered, before casting an apologetic look Sorcher's way. I do not mean to insult ye. Your hospitality has been far too generous. Ye want to be on your way. I would never take offence, and besides, this little house wasn't built to fit so many strapping men. She laughed. I'll have more than a few strong words for Quinn. What does he think he's at, taking so long to join us? The lad had better have a damned good explanation. 
Bryce rose from the table and went to the door, expecting to see his friend approaching on the black mount which he'd ridden since their return from Dremarban. It wasn't Quinn. Roderick. Bryce called out over his shoulder. I believe you'll want to see this. Roderick joined him, chuckling when he recognized his younger brother riding at the front of a trio of men. One of those men as it turned out was Quinn. So that's what took him so long, Roderick murmured with a shake of his head. Better your brother than a brothel full of women. Are you certain of that? Roderick raised an eyebrow. As for me, I'll wait to find out what Porik wants. What if they simply met up in the village and Porik wanted to visit, knowing you were here? You don't know my brother very well. Roderick chuckled, walking out to greet them. Bryce followed, as did Fergus. Brother. Porik slid from the saddle, clasping Roderick by the arms the moment his feet hit the ground. I'm glad to see you well. I feel the same, Roderick assured him. What brings you here to see us? Quinn greeted them. I'm here as well. In case you hadn't noticed. We see enough of you. Bryce smirked. If anything, it was a relief to be without you for a while. I met up with your man Quinn on the road. Porik smiled. I'd planned to pay a visit to Sorcha soon, but knowing you were here made me decide to visit now. I hear my name being used out here, Sorcha called out. Have ye eaten, Porik Anderson? He nodded and waved. I thank ye. I have a favor to ask of ye, however, just not of that nature. What is it then? Porik's look to Roderick was a sad one. Old Bess has died. A few days ago. I'm sorry to hear it, Roderick murmured with a sigh. She kept the house together for longer than either you or I have been alive. I and her loss is quite acutely felt. Porik grimaced. I'm sorry to say the place has all but fallen apart, and not merely because the rest of the household mourns her loss. She was a good efficient woman, but loath to share her methods with even those she trusted. What is it you're wanting from me, then? Sorcher approached. Surely you don't think me up to the task of running a great house such as yours. You're the first person who came to mind, and the only one I trust enough to even suggest this. His brow creased in deep lines. I realize the troubles between my clan and the McAllisters may sway ye against me. The older woman dismissed this with a wave of her hand. Bah! I care little for those concerns, especially since my niece is safe and happy. Besides, she is now wed to your brother, which makes you kin to me. Was it Bryce's imagination, or did Porrick seem to brighten a bit at her words? It was clear to him that everyone in Sorcher's acquaintance held her in high esteem, and thus took to heart her endorsement. His grin was a bit roguish. Will you help me then? As we are, in fact, kin to one another. Ah. I see what you're about. She grinned. Fine then. If you believe me to be up to the task, I would be more than glad to help ye. However, I would not be coming alone. You know your new sister is living with me, while your brother rides off on his missions or whatever he calls them. Roderick merely glowered at the tone she took. He knew better than to raise a protest. My new sister is welcome, Porik assured her. I'm certain the household would be a happier one for her presence. And you'll have much less to concern yourself over, Bryce pointed out, nudging Roderick with his elbow. Now more than ever, that's important. Why now more than ever? Roderick turned to him. Bryce. You've gone and done it now. Nothing had been mentioned during dinner of the child Caitlin carried. He'd so prided himself on watching his words up to that point. Why now more than ever? Roderick asked again, though Bryce was no better able to answer his question than he'd been the first time. He looked about himself, hoping to be saved. Sorcher gritted her teeth, tilting her head to the side with a harsh sigh. Aye, you're one to keep a matter to yourself, aren't ye? Judging by the look on her face, she might have slapped him upside his head if he were close enough. What have I missed? Roderick demanded. Caitlin went to him, taking his hand in hers. I believe there is something we ought to discuss. Do you think she'll forgive me for blurting it out like that? 
Bryce asked, wincing at the memory of how foolish he had been. I. Roderick may not, however. Fergus laughed. I wouldn't worry over it much. Sorcher sighed, patting him on the back in passing. It isn't as though ye told the whole story, and besides she needed the push to tell him before the four of you leave again. At least, as you say, Roderick will be able to rest more easily knowing she's safe under his family's roof. They sat outside, in the outskirts of the meadow, the grasshoppers and frogs making ceaseless noise on the banks of the river as the sun sank lower every moment. When the door opened and Roderick stepped out, grinning a little drunkenly though he hadn't touched a drop, they chuckled as one. It's been quite the day for announcements. He shrugged as he approached. I must admit, I'm not altogether certain which way is up at the moment. This way. Fergus grinned, pointing his finger up at the darkening sky. Thank you. Roderick cuffed him about the head. I should go in now, Sorcher announced, brushing grass from her kirtle as she stood. I have some packing up to do, if we're to leave in the morning. She joined Caitlin inside, leaving the four of them alone. Which reminds me. We didn't have the chance to discuss what you found in the village, Fergus said, looking to Quinn. Is there anything for us? I, of course. Quinn shook himself a bit. I'd forgotten. Yes, there is a possible task we've been asked to complete, though it leaves me wondering whether you'll wish to accept. What is it then? Bryce asked. The Stuart clan has a daughter about to be wed to an English earl, he explained, spitting on the ground at the mention of the English. The earl wishes his bride to be escorted from Stuart lands, not far from Lockerbie, across the border and into Earl Remington's protection. Lockerbie. That alone will take at least a week, Roderick observed, rubbing his chin as he thought it through. Where is the earldom located? Bryce asked. Near Carlisle. Bryce was familiar enough with the lands bordering Scotland to know Carlisle sat along the River Eden, which they would be able to follow from Solway Firth. It's quite a journey, Fergus mused. Which I was certain to bring up, and old Murphy was well aware of it. His man swore that the Earl promised to reimburse those who accepted the mission for the entirety of the journey, including the expense of travelling to Lockerbie, and were to take him at his word. Fergus looked doubtful. Have ye ever known Murphy or any of those he does business with to be unreliable? Quinn counted. Fergus nodded his concession. What say ye? Bryce looked to Roderick. Would he wish to be away from Caitlin for so long? Not only was the journey to Lockerbie a long one, but it would take days to reach the earldom before riding back. Roderick's eyes shifted in the direction of Sorcher's little house. He didn't need to explain where his loyalties were at that moment. I say we go. As soon as possible, in fact. He grinned. After all, I have a family to provide for now. Chapter 3 Alana If I close my eyes and remain perfectly still and silent, she will not be able to find me. Alana did this as she sat by her bedchamber window, where she'd been staring out at the darkening landscape. Alana The strident, demanding voice of her lifelong nurse echoed off floor and wall, carrying down the corridor, sliding beneath the crack between the closed door and the bedroom floor, and tapped at her ears. Where are you hiding yourself? Where would I be hiding myself, pray tell? Still she didn't move. She hardly breathed. It seemed as though she had barely breathed ever, since her father had announced her betrothal. A knock sounded at the door, which she did not answer. Perhaps nurse would leave, searching for her charge in the kitchen or the back garden. There was no such luck, which was not surprising, after all when was the last time she'd had any luck at all? She couldn't remember such a time. Ever. Alana Stewart opened the door this instant, nurse growled. Judging from the muffled quality of her voice, her mouth was all but pressed against the wood. Alana took a deep breath. What are the chances that you'll give up and leave me alone? You know very well that there isn't a chance at all. I won't be leaving you alone, young woman, so open this door immediately. She could imagine Nurse's breast heaving up and down, 
her ham-sized fists on her hips, face flushed both from irritation and the strain of carrying her sizable frame up the stairs. With a sigh, Alana rose from her chair and crossed the room in order to move aside the table which she'd used to keep the door closed. Nurse burst through almost immediately, and her tired eyes fixed on Alana. What are you on about? she hissed, immediately putting the room to rights. For such a large woman of advanced years, Nurse had never lacked for energy. At that moment, Alana knew that energy would have been directed at her, had there been nothing else to do. Why must ye ask questions to which ye already know the answer? Alana returned to her chair, where the view outside was now darkened to the point of being unrecognizable. What had once been acres of woods and a thin ribbon of running water in the distance, had become nothing but blank night. There was no moon thanks to the clouds which had built throughout the day. Weather which reflected her mood. Perhaps that was why she'd been so drawn to the window, either that, or the possibility of leaping from the window and avoiding her fate. You've been frowning and sighing and grumbling for days dear. Once the room was in its proper order, nurse came to her, and rested what she likely believed to be a comforting hand on Alana's shoulder. It was anything but. Nurse, who had always been Alana's one sure confidant, was nothing but an enemy in light of her taking Douglas Stewart's side. You are well aware of why I am, Alana hissed, shrugging her shoulder in order to shake off her nurse's touch. I cannot for the life of me understand how ye do not understand. Do we know each other at all? How can ye stand by me and pretend to wonder what the problem is? Nurse leaned against the wall, standing by the window so Alana could not avoid looking her way unless she left the chair, and that would be a wasted effort, as the nurse would merely push her back down. That had happened before. Many times. Alana braced herself for a dressing down. That had happened many times before too. Yet rather than opening her mouth to unleash a diatribe, she curved her lips into a pout. I know my love. I know what it is you're suffering. You know nothing of it, Alana whispered, staring out at a blackness through which she could discern little. Yet it was better, easier, to stare out at nothing than to look in the eye someone who, in her estimation, had brutally betrayed her. From the start, Nurse had championed Alana's father's plan to marry his only daughter off to an Englishman. While the two of them had an age-old tradition of smiling to Douglas Stewart's face, only to conspire behind his back, this time had been like something from a strange fever-induced nightmare. For Nurse had maintained the same cheerful demeanor in private, as she displayed in public. Rather than retreating to Alana's room after the announcement had been made in order to commiserate, to share in each other's pain and bewilderment, she'd all but cheered when Alana had turned to her in misery. The only real true parental love she'd ever known since her mother's death had been brutally torn from her without warning, without so much as an inkling of precognition. In her eyes, she'd gone from having a partner with whom she could face the world to being alone. Adrift on an endless sea, by herself, with nothing and no one in sight no matter which direction she peered. Ilana, love. Look at me. I would rather not thank ye, she whispered. It pains me to look at ye. Oh dearest. Would that you understood. I understand perfectly well. My father wishes to sell me back to the English as payment for having wed my mother, one of their kind. It's merely a debt which he has to repay. And I am the currency with which he will pay. Is that roughly the sum of it? No one is thinking in terms of payment now, nurse murmured mournfully. Least of all your father. Oh spare me. She shot up from the chair, nearly tipping it back in her fury, eyes blazing when she rested them upon her lifelong nurse. She'd look at her, all right, and she'd let the woman know with her notoriously expressive eyes just what she thought of her deception. You're a part of it just as much as father is. I'm certain the two of you have held secret meetings while my back was turned, in order to work out the best way to lull me into submission. Isn't that right? Nurse held her gaze, but only for a moment before she looked away. I. We've been meeting in private, but not for the reason you give. Nothing is missed by your sharp eye, is it? I ought to know by now. The way she behaved as though this were a situation concerning her, sickened Alana. 
as if she were the victim, rather than the young woman being sold into marriage to a stranger. Well then, why were you meeting with him behind closed doors? I doubt that at any time in my one and twenty years, I've seen you disappear with him behind a door which was then closed to me. Were nurse younger and a bit less, well, less, Alana might have suspected her father to be conducting a dalliance with the woman. She was old enough to know of his unsavory reputation among the village lasses, not to mention the whispers throughout the house, over the years of a young kitchen maid's or scullery woman's disappearance from the household. Those disappearances had occurred regularly, one day a woman was in the household's employ, and the next she'd be gone, and as rumor had it, this was the case when Douglas Stewart had tired of the girl's services. The very thought turned Alana's stomach. She wasn't over much fond of her father, and not just because he treated her as property to be bought and sold. Even before the announcement of her marriage, she'd borne no false impressions of the man who'd lead the Stewart clan for thirty years. She understood him perfectly. He was a man of appetites, who behaved according to his whims in everything but clan business. When it came to the clan, even Alana could admit what a shrewd, cunning and brave leader he was. As a man on the other hand, he was less than nothing in her estimation. He used women and threw them away, as he'd throw a nod upon leg of fowl to the dogs once all the meat had been torn off. And her mother had been his wife. The thought made her shudder. Elizabeth Stewart was everything lovely, elegant and beautiful, Alana could imagine, all rolled up into one blonde-haired, blue-eyed, gentle and soft-spoken woman. If the ideal of beauty had ever been personified, it would have been Elizabeth who did so. Married to the short-tempered, coarse, ill-mannered Douglas. The entire enterprise must have been a terrible strain, or worse. Little wonder then, that the angelic Elizabeth had perished at such a young age. How could someone so gentle and pure suffer a long life under such conditions? Alana glared at her nurse, who had yet to offer an explanation. Well, will you tell me, or will you not? Have you completely stopped being yourself? We used to tell each other everything, you and I. I we did that. Nurse's pout turned to a frown, then to a grimace. Och, my love, you're driving me beyond the point of self-control. It's been such a long few days. You honestly believe I'm cheered at the thought of you being sent away to marry a stranger, when all I've endeavored to do was to lessen the pain I know you're suffering through. The old affection hadn't died it seemed, because the moment it appeared that nurse was in pain, Alana threw her arms about the old woman's thick neck and peppered her cheek with kisses. Please nurse do not hate me. Close me away from you no longer. This is when I need you most, and you seem to have deserted me. Nurse's eyes filled with tears. That is what you believe? That I hate you? That I've closed you away from me, because I no longer love you? Och, I love you more than I could ever love my own flesh and blood, and have every minute of your life. They wept against the other's shoulder for a long time, days of pain and frustration pouring out of them both, until their loud gusty sobs quieted to a mere sniffling. Both of their kirtles were soaked from the neck down to the breast by the time they finished. My dear. Nurse sighed, wiping at her eyes with the hem of her apron before dabbing Alana's cheeks. You've been thinking about this all wrong, though I cannot blame ye. If I were in your position, I'd think me an enemy too. What is it then? Alana asked, sitting on the bed with Nurse's hands in hers. They'd spent many an hour like that, the two of them seated together, the ever-patient nurse listening, as Alana had prattled endlessly about the sorts of things young girls dreamed over. I suspect you've hated me, nurse whispered smoothing back a lock of Alana's dark blonde hair. I wouldn't blame you for it. You've hurt me, Alana conceded, though it would have have hurt half as much if I hated you. I could never truly hate you. I do not know what it is you believed your father and I were discussing, while we were closed off. No, then again, I think I might be able to guess. Nurse shuddered. As though I would ever. No, no, I didn't believe that, Alana was quick to assure her. But what was it then? What did you speak about? About my leaving the household once you've gone to England, of course. Alana gasped. How could she have been so blind? 
Naturally, once she had gone on to her married life, Nurse would have no place with the Stuarts in the great house. I am not the only one who shall lose her home, she whispered, tears threatening to overwhelm her once again. Oh Nurse, I was such a fool to only think of myself. Nonsense. I'm an old woman, a grown woman. I can make my own way. That was a lie, and Alana knew it. There would be nothing for her. I'll go back to my family, is what I'll do. My sister and her children and their wee bairns. They live along the Irish Sea, or so I recall. There are many babes in the family. I'll be busy and happy there. Alana was certain her heart was bound to tear into pieces. The thought of living out the rest of her days without nurse's ever constant presence was unimaginable. How could she survive in an unknown place with unknown people when there would be no one to love her? What shall I do without ye? she whispered fretfully. Nurse forced a smile. You'll go on, of course. You'll have babes of your own, and a household to look after, and your life will be full and happy. If only either of them believed that. You must promise me one thing, young woman. All pretense of gentleness disappeared, as Nurse's expression hardened into one Alana had rarely seen over the years but recognized just the same. What is that? Alana sighed, knowing well what was about to come. You won't try to run away again. Promise me. Swear it, Alana. Nurse squeezed her hands until the bones ground painfully together. Alana barely bit back a cry. It had been a terrible plan from the start, if it could even be called a plan at all. She hadn't given much thought to it of course, acting out of sheer panic after a long sleepless night filled with fretting and thinking about what her future might look like. Nothing she'd come up with came close to something in which she wished to take part, and so she'd gone to the stables at first light to fetch her favorite mare with food and a hastily gathered pack of clothing tied up in a linen sheet. She'd made it no farther than the village beyond Stuart lands, before three huntsmen had spotted her and demanded they escort her to her father's house. It had been silver they were after, and silver they'd received, along with Douglas Stuart's demand that none of them speak a word of what had transpired, lest the three of them meet up with him on a darkened road one night. They wouldn't survive the meeting, he'd promised, fingers grazing the handle of his war hammer. He kept the huge hulking thing on the table at his right hand, always. A silent reminder to all who entered his private chambers, of who held the power in the household and the clan. The men had all but fled, knees shaking, grateful to escape with their lives. While Alana had watched from the corner, trembling inside in spite of the brave face she tried to wear. Her father had dismissed her without a look telling her to go to her bedchamber if she knew what was good for her and to avoid meeting up with him. It would not go so well for her the next time they saw one another, he'd warned. She was smart enough to do as he said, eating the food she'd carried with her, rather than risking stepping a toe outside the door for the rest of the day. At least she'd be suited for her husband in one way, she thought with a rueful smile as nurse helped her prepare for bed. She'd already become accustomed to spending time alone, locked away, for fear of the man who all but possessed her. Chapter 4 It isn't as if they'll never see one another again, Quinn grumbled, as Roderick bade Caitlin one final goodbye. Their fifth final goodbye by Bryce's count. Let's go then, Fergus called out still with a good-natured note in his voice, which Bryce knew would quickly sour if the fourth member of their party did not make haste to join them. It was now well past sunup, the day promising to be a fair one and they were already losing time. They'd worked it out among themselves, and it appeared as though they might be able to make it back before the first frost if they were smart about covering as much ground as they could when they could. Clearly, Roderick had forgotten what they'd only just discussed. Come on then? Bryce called out, allowing the irritation of all three of them to reveal itself in his voice. There was a time for courtesy, and there was a time to get down to business. They would need to ride to the village and confirm with old Murphy, their long-time go-between, that they'd take on the responsibility of the journey. Just how Murphy managed to learn of the opportunities for work such as theirs had always been a mystery to everyone. He seemed to have eyes and ears everywhere. So long as those eyes and ears kept benefiting them, 
Bryce wasn't concerned about the specifics. Roderick mounted his horse, avoiding the eyes of his friends as the four of them started down the trail leading to the road. Bryce turned in the saddle as the others did, waving farewell to Sorcher and Caitlin. They would make the short ride to the Anderson house in a matter of minutes. Caitlin waved back, making certain to hold Bryce's gaze when she did. He knew what she silently urged just as she had urged before. And he would do his level best to keep her husband safe, just as he always had. Though why it had to be his responsibility was not a question he'd ever dare ask her. Of all of them, he was closest to Roderick. It made sense, he supposed, that he should be the one to watch over his friend. Not that Fergus or Quinn wouldn't be just as well suited to the task. Perhaps it was the easy kinship which he developed with Caitlin during their journey together, which had left her more likely to call on him then. She had seemed to latch on to him in a way, likely because he was always quick to throw a jest in Roderick's direction, and she had appreciated that at the time. She'd appreciated it most heartily, as she and Roderick had been in a sort of silent war. Before they'd finally come to their senses and admitted their love for each other. It all seemed very silly to him and had at the time. The trail soon opened to the wider road, well trod, and the four of them rode in two pairs toward the village. Roderick to Bryce's left, while Fergus was behind him and Quinn to the right. It was a real stroke of luck, your brother coming through when he did. Bryce chose his words carefully, still aware of how he'd nearly spoiled Caitlin's news the day before. Roderick hadn't brought it up, but Bryce wondered if that was merely because he'd wished to wait until they were away from the women. Aye, it was that, Roderick conceded. Leave it to Porrick to save my hide once again. I'll rest easier, knowing she's under his protection. Aside from you three and the Duncans, I trust him over any other man alive. If you only knew what your wife wished for me to argue on her behalf. No harm in telling him now with the four of them already well on their way to the village. She wouldn't have to know he'd told tales. Roderick merely rolled his eyes and groaned. What was it then? Do not tell me she wished to join us. She did that. Bryce chuckled. I should have known. I'd expected something along those lines between the two of us. And damn my weak soul, I was already half convinced it wouldn't be a terrible thing at that. What? I know. You needn't chastise me. I'm certain that by the time it came for us to leave, I would have changed my mind. Bryce wasn't so certain of this. Not at all. Well, as it is, the babe would have kept her in place at Sorcher's. I and I might have asked my brother to take her in then, had I known before he came. It all worked out as it was meant to, I suppose. I suppose so. Bryce glanced at his friend and it will continue to do so. We'll return before the first frost, and perhaps take one or two more journeys before winter comes in earnest. Perhaps it would not be ill-advised for us to take up winter quarters with your brother. Roderick stiffened in the saddle. We'll discuss it when the time comes. Bryce grumbled at the repetition of the same answer Roderick had given time and again, whenever the question of the coming winter was voiced. It's certainly something we have to decide, and soon. I don't know if I wish to spend another winter riding hither and yon, hoping the next village has an inn with an available room. I already spent part of last winter doing just that. We all did, Roderick snapped. You were not alone. Aye, but it's my nearly frostbitten toes I'm concerned with, Bryce snapped in return. Not yours. You can worry about your own. What are the two of you on about? Fergus called out from behind. The winter, Bryce replied, staring ahead. That again? Quinn asked, almost whining. Why must we go on and on about it? I don't wish to freeze this year, not if there is somewhere we might bed down until the worst passes. And ye know Porrick already offered us the hospitalities of the house, Fergus reminded Roderick. And your wife will be there, and ye might spend the entire long winter with her. Bryce knew this would sweeten the idea immeasurably. It was a bit unfair on his part to use Caitlin in his argument, but he needed all the help he could get. Just why his friend was so determined not to take Porrick up on his offer 
was a mystery to all of them. Roderick glowered for a while, the four of them riding in an uneasy silence, which only the singing of the birds and the occasional rustling of animals along both sides of the road broke into. They'd all known each other long enough to know when silence was the best course of action. All four of them were reasonable men, but even the most reasonable man had a breaking point. Push him too far, and one might regret having pushed at all. If only they could understand why the idea of making use of Porrick's hospitality was so unattractive to Roderick. It seemed simple enough to the rest of them. The house was there, with plenty of space for them to be comfortable, and the clan's leader had opened its doors to them. It was Roderick's damnable pride. It had to be. He wanted no man's charity, especially if the man was his younger brother. Even if it wasn't charity at all, but merely good sense and self-preservation. All Bryce knew was that owning ten toes was preferable to owning nine or fewer. Not to mention his fingers, which had also nearly frozen. Pride was little comfort when one had to adapt to life without all his fingers. They didn't exchange another word until the village was in sight, and it was already mid-morning by then. Murphy should be expecting us at the inn, Quinn reminded them. I told him ye would accept the task, and he said he'd wait here for us. The four of them went inside, after tying the horses off at the post running along the front of the squat little building. Just beyond the entrance was a large room filled with tables and chairs, where the inn's patrons were fed twice per day. It was not nearly time for dinner, yet several of the tables were already in use by men wishing to discuss business or merely pass the time in conversation. Murphy was one such man, and one swift glance confirmed that he still had yet to adopt the practice of ever washing himself or his clothing, though his main line of work had to do with horses and their typical filth. The occasional washing up might have done him much good, as well as providing mercy to those with whom he spent his time. What remained of his teeth showed when he smiled, waving the four of them over to where he waited. Ye took your time about getting here, he grumbled in his usual good-natured way. I was beginning to think I might have to find pleasurable ways to pass the time. There was no question of what he referred to, and Bryce chuckled to himself when he considered how grateful every lass at the brothel would be that they'd arrived before Murphy could pay a visit. If flies circled the man's head as they did the ass of a horse, it wouldn't have come as a surprise. Can you tell us anything else about the lass we're set to escort? Roderick asked. Or her father? Douglas Stewart. Och, he's a force of a man, to be certain, Murphy observed. Likes to believe himself quite the warrior, and perhaps he is. Though I've never heard the tale of him fighting in battle, mind ye. But he carries a war hammer much of the time, and enjoys bullying others with the threat of using it to bash in their skulls. He sounds like a charming man, Fergus surmised with a wry grin. Aye, so I would be certain not to dally when it comes to delivering his daughter, Murphy advised. He'll be expecting ye to deliver the lass in a timely manner and fully intact if ye get my meaning. Roderick cast a disparaging eye. As though any of us could be accused of taking liberties with a lass. I only thought I might warn ye, Murphy replied, mirth in his voice and on his face. Ye see the lass, she's a handful and I believe that's putting it mildly. From what I've heard, old Douglas Stewart has had his hands full with her ever since it was announced she'd be wedding this earl. Already tried to run away once, though she didn't get far. Threatened to starve herself too. All manner of devilishness. My friend, the one who came to me with the request from the Earl, warned me of her tendencies, which is why I'm warning ye now. She'll like us not use everything in her power to get out of Marion. Even if it means luring one of us, Bryce inferred. Aye. Just that. So strengthen yourselves. Murphy laughed, his sour breath assaulting them as he did. Especially this one, here. He motioned to Quinn with a fresh burst of foul laughter. Why is it that everyone assumes I'm quick to bed a woman? Quinn asked as they mounted their horses outside the inn. Perhaps because you are. Bryce laughed as the four of them started on their way to Lockerbie. Though even as he laughed, he made a mental note to keep an eye on his friend and the young woman they were set on meeting.
Chapter 5. Ilana. Where is she, damn it all? Ilana shuddered at the sound of her father's blustering voice. He did not sound pleased not at all. Mary leaned over, patting her hand. I will go with you, if you wish. Nay, you mustn't trouble yourself. She rose, brushing dirt from her apron as she did, forcing a smile for the cook's daughter. The two of them had been friends from youth, when Cook had come to work for the household. Cook, was one of the only female household servants who'd managed to maintain her position under their roof for so long. Likely because she was rather homely, with a face Douglas Stewart had often compared to lumpy porridge. He'd even gone as far as to wonder aloud, how any man had managed to get her with child. Mary, sadly, had inherited her mother's complexion. Though Alana wasn't certain whether she felt sorry for the girl, or relieved that she'd never have to avoid Douglas's attention. I'll finish the weeding later, she promised her friend, washing her hands in a shallow bucket by the door leading from the garden into the kitchen. She insisted on behaving as though nothing out of the ordinary was happening, which meant spending mornings in the garden, while the two of them giggled and gossiped about the goings-on in the house. There had not been much giggling as of late, try as Mary might to raise Alana's spirits. They both knew what hung over Alana's head, though Mary couldn't possibly understand what it meant to never know when whatever hung there would fall. It was as if she held her breath at all times, halfway to flinching back from the blow. Preparing herself. Alana brushed back the hair, which had worked its way free from the plait, which she'd wound around the back of her head, in order to keep it out of her way while working. She knew there would be dirt smudged on her cheeks and forehead, though she cared not. Her father rarely, if ever, took pains to present himself well to her. His chambers sat opposite the great hall, not far from the kitchen. She walked through with her eyes straight ahead, her head held high. Like as not the entire household staff felt sorry for her. Though she would prefer their pity to their relief at seeing her go, she'd far prefer them going about their business and paying no mind to her. She also knew them well enough to know the impossibility of such an occurrence. She was the daughter of the clan leader, the only living child, and she was soon leaving them. And she'd been more than clear on how she felt about this. Her only regret was not having planned her escape better, or at all. She might have had a chance if only she'd taken the time to think things through. A lesson learned far too late. After the failed attempt at running away, her father had made doubly sure there were eyes on her at all times. Even down to a guard outside the door to her bedchamber. He'd left the chamber door open to her, which she knew was an invitation to enter on arrival. She did so, stepping into the warm room, heated by the kitchen fire, pleasant in the winter but less so in the waning days of late summer. Close it, he ordered without looking up. She did so, then went to the table which he'd set with a map and two cups of ale. She wondered if one of those cups was for her, after all, she was the only other person in the room. The long wide table took up much of the space, the high-backed wooden chairs taking up most of the rest. She crossed the empty floor in two short strides and stood opposite where her father sat. His eyes were on the map, not on her. I've had word from the village, he said without looking upon his daughter. Escorts have arrived to accompany you to your new husband. They rode in early this morning after having journeyed through the night, thought they might reach us sooner, and took rooms at the inn, on learning there was still another two hours of riding ahead of them. She blinked, swaying slightly as the news hit her like a blow from her father's war hammer. She almost wished it were the hammer itself which had landed the blow, as it might mean the end of her misery. W.H. what? she stammered, hating her slow-wittedness but being completely at a loss nonetheless. Come now. You're normally quicker than that. He looked at her then, with eyes so unlike hers. She had her mother's eyes and her mother's complexion, fair, creamy, with just a dotting of freckles over her nose. Douglas Stewart's eyes were grey, flinty and shrewd. You've hired men to escort me, she whispered, struggling to catch up. Damn it all, she hadn't wanted him to see her at a loss. He had the advantage, he'd always had the advantage, but she might at least keep her dignity intact. Instead she was left whispering breathlessly like a dolt. I haven't hired them. 
Your soon-to-be husband has, he informed her with a sly grin. He knows what he's about that one. Knows it would be better for you to have protection on the road, but we both know what he's really concerned with. Pray tell, she invited. Like as not, he's gotten word of your slipperiness. I had hoped he would not, but there you are. He spread his hands in a mock shrug, sneering all the while. He was enjoying himself, she realized, which only made her hate him all the more. She'd never imagined hating her own father, the confirmation that she did, that she did down to the very bottom of her soul, brought her no pleasure. But there was no helping it, either. Word does travel, she murmured barely keeping her rage at a mere simmer. In her mind's eye she clawed at his face, tore out his nasty tongue, gouged out the eyes which had ogled so many an innocent young woman. He would never hurt another, not as long as he lived. A satisfying fantasy to be sure, but hardly one which could ever be brought to life. Aye that it does. He stood, lifting a cup in each hand and extending one of them to her. Come. Let us drink together, this once. To your happiness and good fortune. She knew better than to refuse, though her heart was hardly in it. Not that he cared. Why are you forcing me to do this, she asked. As we're sharing this first and final drink together, the least you can grant me is a little honesty. I thought the least I could grant you was a drink. He chuckled. When she glared at him, unblinking, he relented. All right then. Why am I doing this to ye? Because this is the way it's been since the beginning, lass. What do you think your life was meant to become? Did ye think you'd have a home here? Under my roof? until the end of your days. What would be so wrong with that, she challenged, though she had no desire for any such thing to come to pass. He growled, already at the end of his short tether. For starters, you're the daughter of the head of Clan Stuart. You're not fit to marry just another lad from the village, or even one of my most trusted men. And a good thing that, since his trusted men were a bunch of filthy rutting pigs. And ye must be married, he continued, as your marriage will ensure the continuation of our clan's stability and wealth. Is that why my grandfather sent my mother off to marry ye? she dared ask. They never discussed her, ever. A brief flash of something other than boredom and irritation crossed his face, and it was clear she had struck a blow of her own. For once, she had injured him. You've no right to be asking such questions, he warned, his jaw tightening with every word. And why not? She was my mother, and she came to you from England. The opposite of what I'm about to do. Was this the sort of arrangement made for the two of ye? I said you've no right. He slammed down the cup from which he had yet to take a drink. And I'll thank ye to keep your wicked tongue to yourself. A wicked tongue she had inherited from him, though she knew better than to bring this up at that exact moment. It was enough to know she'd unsettled him so. I only wanted to know what my mother might have felt as she made her journey, she murmured, suddenly demure and almost apologetic, so as to assuage his temper. He let out a barking laugh. What she felt? What of it? That doesn't matter a bit, which is something you'd do well to get through that pretty head of yours, my lass. Your mother was an intelligent woman, for she knew how to keep her mouth shut and endure. Keep her mouth shut and endure. That was all anyone expected from her. He leaned forward, hands on the table, peering into her disillusioned eyes. And even then, she managed to be lovely. Quiet, graceful, serene. All of which ye could never be. Each word slammed into her head. Into her heart. He was so brutal, so nasty, so completely unfeeling toward his own flesh and blood. For a moment so brief it might as well have been a dream, she had tricked herself into believing he might actually care. That he might feel paternal warmth for his only living child. She'd even imagined briefly, when he'd offered her the cup, that they might share a moment of regret that life had taken such a turn. That would never come to pass, for he felt no such regrets. Regret would require loving or even liking her. The realization stirred her rage. Yes, she was all those things. But she was never happy, she whispered, her voice like the hissing of a snake. 
Again his expression betrayed him, and this time he confirmed her suspicions. He'd loved his wife. And Alana doubted her mother had ever loved him. She had never been happy living under his roof, sharing his bed. Bearing his children, all of whom except one hadn't managed to live past their first year. How could she have ever been happy in such a marriage? When Douglas reacted as though his daughter had slapped him, she knew she was right. Get out, he ordered pointing to the door. And I hope to never lay eyes on you after this day. She held his gaze, lifting the cup to her lips, downing the sour yet warming liquid inside, dragging the back of her hand across her mouth, and setting the cup on the table with a sharp clang. For once we're in agreement, she said, turning on her heel and leaving his chambers for the last time. They ought to be here after dinner, he called out to her retreating back. Be prepared. Chapter 6 Bryce had never been half so eager to arrive anywhere. He was certain. Even during the worst weather, he could normally bear up under it and even maintain his good nature. That had not been the case in the many days since they'd ridden away from Sorcher's farmhouse. Quinn had come down with it first, coughing, sneezing, then complaining of aches in his shoulders, knees, back. Roderick had been next, then Fergus. Bryce had held out longer than the rest, but he too had fallen ill and there was a stretch of two days during which time all four of them rode while barely able to remain upright in the saddle. Only upon a visit to a local healer, who made her home outside one of the many villages through which they passed, had any of them begun to feel some relief. While the poultice she'd sold them stank to hell and back, especially as it required being applied to one's chest and therefore always lingered near a man's nose, it did its job. Three days had passed since then, and the four of them were beginning to feel more like themselves. They could ride longer distances without needing to rest, were no longer feverish and were generally in better spirits. Even so, their arrival in Lockerbie had demanded several hours sleep in the first inn they arrived at. Normally, they would have continued straight out to the Stuart stronghold and perhaps taken their rest there. Fatigue had simply gotten the better of them. I'll never get the stench of that poultice out of my tunic, Fergus grumbled, slapping the offending piece of clothing against a rock again and again before plunging it back into the stream in which they bathed. It had been deemed necessary by all of them that they at least make an attempt to present themselves well. After riding for a week while sick half to death, they all needed some freshening up. What would Douglas Stewart think about handing his daughter over to filthy, stinking mercenaries? Aye, once we've collected our silver from the Earl, I've a mind to purchase new cloth for another tunic, maybe two, Quinn agreed, wringing the water from his pale grey tunic before shaking and spreading it out to dry somewhat while he bathed himself. With the amount of silver we're due, we ought to be able to purchase a bit more than that. Bryce grinned, thinking about what he'd like to do with his share. A new saddle, perhaps, and new shoes. The leather soles of his only pair were worn practically all the way through, and the weather would be turning cold before much longer. The nights were already cooler than before. Let us make haste, he decided, before dunking his head under the surface of the crisp water, lingering while he ran his finger through his bushy thatch of hair to loosen any dirt. Perhaps a going over with a pair of shears wouldn't hurt him much, though he'd always felt his hair was his best feature the one area where he allowed vanity to reign. When he surfaced, Roderick was already on the bank of the stream, standing among the low-growing shrubs. You're in a hurry now? Why shouldn't I be? he asked, stepping out the water. They might all have been inviting trouble by exposing their skin to water so soon after being ill, but they were also painfully aware of how their stench and appearance might have affected the lass with whom they'd be travelling. It wouldn't do for reports to reach her new husband of their unseemliness. Roderick shrugged into his tunic. It's not as though we'll be able to cover much road today, what with the lass likely to be unprepared for us, he reasoned. Like as not, Stuart will offer us his hospitality while we wait for her to make ready. Aye, have ye ever known a woman to be prepared on time? Fergus laughed. He speaks as though he's ever known a woman intimately. Quinn jested. Longer than the hour or two at a time you have, my lad, Fergus sneered before dunking his friend. 
They all laughed heartily, even Quinn, when he surfaced and shook the water from his hair. All the same, Bryce continued once their merriment died down, I would like to arrive in time for the last to prepare herself for morning. Who's to say how many goodbyes she'll wish to extend? It isn't as if she'll be returning, and you know how women are when it comes to such things. Aye, Roderick relented. You make a good point. All right then, we ought to move along. It was a fine, clear day, with a hint of autumn in the air. Perhaps Bryce's favourite time of year. While he enjoyed a good long spring, the sense of waking up, of coming back to life after winter's cold, it was the return to crisp air after summer heat which he liked best. It invigorated him, which was a good sign after his recent illness. Gave him an appetite too, which was another good sign. They'd all eaten well at the inn, to the point of sending the owner back to the kitchen more than once. The poor man had looked nearly ready to throw a fit in despair toward the end, and had wondered aloud whether he'd have food left in the larder to serve his guests come supper time. They had each left him more than the price of the room and meal to make up for what they'd cost him. The much happier innkeeper had directed them to Douglas Stewart's home, and the road which they travelled was a busy one. They rode single file, careful to avoid the muck and filth running in a steady flow along the edge. The village reminded him of the one in which he and Fergus had spent their youth. By now, everyone he remembered from those days would most likely be dead. New faces would have replaced them, faces belonging to people who'd taken up the same tasks, the same day-to-day -day activities as ever. And when they died, the process would start itself again. A good reminder to him of just why he'd left. After a while the volume of travellers thinned, and they could ride in pairs once they had more of the road to themselves. On either side, as far as the eye could see, sat rolling fields dotted by the occasional farmhouse. Livestock roamed, men shouted orders to one another. A shout of laughter would sometimes rise up. Nothing out of the ordinary. Nothing they would not find while travelling a road anywhere else in the countryside. Bryce was glad for it as the last thing they needed after their illness was danger or strain. I suppose that's it, Roderick announced, lifting an arm to point to the house which loomed up in the distance. It was nothing compared to the Duncan Manor house, it might fit into a small corner of the place all told, but then the Duncans lived in more of a castle than a house, but it was far more impressive than anything they'd seen in their travels to or from the village. The Stuarts must be doing well for themselves then, Quinn observed with a wry chuckle. Aye, and with the marriage to an earl, they'll be more firmly situated than ever, Fergus added. A shrewd man then. Remember what old Murphy described, Roderick reminded them. He's fierce or believes he is, and a bully. I cannot speak for all of you, but I've no desire to feel a war hammer against the side of my head. They would have to be on their guard. Bryce steeled himself for what was to come as they neared the Stuart home, his eyes shifting from side to side all the while. There was activity outside the house. A stable boy groomed a young grey mare, checking the saddle and ensuring the bags hanging from the side were secure. An old woman, large as a mountain and twice as wide, shouted instructions to him from the doorway. Be certain she has enough blankets, she commanded. And did you add the packet of bread and apples I tied up? Ay, ay, the lad grumbled, muttering to himself. Bryce felt for him, as the role was a thankless one even under the best conditions. The woman folded meaty arms over an expansive breast, eyeing the four of them as they approached. And you'll be the escorts bringing my lass to her husband then. Aye, Roderick replied with a slight bow of his head. We were sent by Earl Remington to ensure the lass's safety. He to a sight better to come fetch her himself, rather than sending the likes of you, the woman snarled, before spitting on the weathered stones which made up the outside of the house. The men recoiled slightly out of surprise. Not that they'd expected a warm welcome, but this was beyond anything they'd imagined. Bryce reminded himself it wasn't them she spat at. It was Remington. Who was this man, and why hadn't he come to fetch his own bride? Not something any of them had discussed before then, as none of them would have an answer no matter how many times they turned it over. He noticed then the redness of the woman's eyes, how swollen they looked. How tears thickened her voice. 
she'd said my lass. She loved the girl and would never see her again. He decided she was only doing what she felt was best for the sake of someone she loved a great deal and shook his head slightly when Quinn looked as though he might raise an argument. The woman looked as though she could pack a punch and he was in no mood to find out whether she did. Is Douglas Stewart about the place? he asked in an attempt to turn the discussion back to the matter at hand. I, I suppose he is, she replied, and I suppose he'll make himself known to ye in short time. She sounded none too pleased. In fact, she screwed up her face as though she might spit again. Nurse, you did not tell me our guests had arrived. A man who could only be Douglas Stewart strode from inside the house. As Murphy had warned, a large war hammer hung from the man's right hand, as though to send a message to those before him. Bryce distrusted him intensely. A good day to ye, Roderick said, nodding. The rest of them nodded as well. I see we've been expected then. Aye, word of your arrival reached me only this morning. Douglas looked them up and down, one by one. I understand you've travelled far. Indeed. It's been quite a strenuous affair, Fergus confirmed, perhaps in the hopes that they would be invited inside and offered comfort in repayment for their pains. He was not offering silver, after all, and yet he would surely benefit from whatever the Earl offered in return for the marriage. Douglas merely shrugged. I suppose that is what a man learns to live with when he accepts payment in return for such services, I. There are days when I envy men such as yourselves, untethered as ye are. While men such as me have lives to protect and a clan to oversee. An uneasy silence fell over them. It was clear to Bryce that the man was trying to prove a point. He was their better, the stronger man, the one with responsibilities and respect. When none of the four visitors offered a reply, for there was none to be offered, Douglas took a step back into the house. Nurse, he growled, send the lass down. She'll be wanted at her new home. Bryce and Roderick exchanged a look when the woman disappeared, leaving them alone with the waiting stable boy. There was a strange quiet in the air, in spite of the stables and pig pen and barn sitting all around them. As though the very animals were afraid to make a sound, and those who cared for them were wary of showing their faces. Is there something wrong with the lass, do ye think? Quinn wondered aloud. It seems as though he's glad to be rid of her, does it not? Considering the trouble she's given him, who can blame the man? Bryce reasoned. Remember what Murphy told us. He's likely relieved to be free. I think that would make him better inclined to be courteous, Fergus grumbled. None of them had the chance to reply before a blonde-haired girl appeared in the doorway. She was small-boned, delicate, yet with a wickedly sharp jaw which Bryce supposed spoke of her nature. She looked upon them that sharp jaw clenched. There was no telling what she thought of them or what it meant to leave her home. It mattered not either way, just as it mattered not what he thought of her. She might as well be made of silver, for that was what she meant in the end. Are you ready to leave? she asked, chin held high. They exchanged a confused glance, the four of them. Bryce was the first to find his voice. You wish to leave now? This very minute? he asked, as though he hadn't heard properly. Is there something wrong? she asked, turning her cold gaze upon him. Blue eyes like ice. So that was who she was. Spoiled, about to marry an earl, knowing she'd be moving up in the world when she did. Looking down upon men such as himself, much as her father did. Not at all, he replied with false courtesy, a wide smile stretching his lips. Merely that we'd expected you to take your time, as most women do. She all but squinted, her eyes narrowed so, and her lips drew up into a pucker. As though she were sizing him up, and came away displeased with what she'd found. You'll find I don't adhere to the standards men hold for most women, she murmured. It's best you know that now. We'll take it to heart, Roderick interjected with a swift glance in Bryce's direction. And if you are prepared to depart immediately, I'm certain we can accommodate ye. Just like that, Bryce's hopes of one more night spent in a comfortable bed were dashed. And all because some spoiled princess of a wench had to have her way. Fine then, she said, taking the reins of the tawny mare from the stable boy. Let us be on our way not even a glance backward as they rode off. 
Not a look, a hand over her eyes to catch a tear. Nothing. As though she had no feelings at all. Perhaps it was for the best that they get started immediately. The sooner he could be rid of this creature, the better. Chapter 7 Alana had said her goodbyes. The shoulder of her nut-brown kirtle was still damp with nurse's tears. Mary had sobbed inconsolably when she learned of Alana's immediate departure, they'd only been working in the garden hours earlier. Everything had changed so quickly. It was easier not to look back as her heart shattered. Could they not hear it? Did they not understand? No, for they were merely men who were strangers to her. They knew nothing of her life, her heartache. Brutes. All of them. Nasty, ill-mannered men who merely pretended to be civilized. The way they spoke to her, as though they were anything better than the brute of a man who'd sired her. Or the man who had purchased her hand in marriage. While she knew nothing of him, she had little respect for men who purchased their bride sight unseen. Who married simply to secure a title or landholding. She had little respect for them because they so rarely treated their wives as a woman ought to be treated, at least in her estimation. Just riding with these four turned her stomach. All them long-haired, wide of shoulder, broad of back. The one with the dark beard had been rudest of all, though he'd attempted to cover up his rudeness with false kindness. She'd rather he be cruel outright. She was accustomed to cruelty. Nurse's tear-swollen face flashed across the forefront of her memory, but Alana pushed the image away. There was no time for such sentiment. It would only lead to further pain. Have ye had your dinner? one of them asked. Young, handsome in a roguish sort of way, his dark hair gleaming in the sunlight. She knew without asking that this was the unofficial leader of the group. He even rode in front, his gelding's tail swishing lazily back and forth, fanning the odors coming from its rear directly into her face. She wrinkled her nose in distaste, and wondered if this was what the entire journey was to consist of. The stench of horse shit and of four wild highlanders. Still, he was asking a question and deserved an answer. Aye I have. Good to hear. Very likely we'll be roughing it tonight. Roughing it? Her nose wrinkled again though this time it was an unfamiliar term which led to her reaction. Pardon me. He hesitated, as though waiting for her to say something else. When she didn't, he prompted. Pardon what? She rolled her eyes at the back of his head. Pardon me, what do you mean, we'll be roughing it? He means you'll be sleeping out of doors, in the open air. The one with the beard and unpleasant temperament fell in beside her, their horses abreast on the wide road. All apologies if that is beneath your standards, but your intended is not promising enough silver to afford us accommodations throughout the journey. The way he spoke and the inflection in his words brought her blood to a boil. I don't recall stating anything to that effect, she murmured, clenching the reins tight enough that she thought she might snap them. Sleeping out of doors is nothing I've not done before, thank you kindly. I was unfamiliar with the term, is all. I see. He replied with the briefest flash of a smile. I, I suppose you would have had to sleep out in the open when you ran away. If she hadn't been so concerned with keeping her mare moving straight along the road, without allowing his horse to push her off into the brush alongside, she would have reached out and slapped his face. As it was, her cheeks flushed heatedly as she struggled to control her temper. Bryce? The man riding in front shot a filthy look over one shoulder. What of it? he asked with an insolent shrug. He's only out of sorts, because he'd looked forward to a comfortable bed tonight. One of the men riding behind them snorted. The one riding beside him snorted too, and the two of them clearly enjoyed teasing their friend. Is that so? Alana asked with honey in her voice, tilting her head to the side. My apologies if sleeping in the open air is beneath your standards. A moment of silence and then the three men riding with them burst into hearty laughter, which Alana herself joined in on after a spell, when she saw how angry it made the man they'd called Bryce. What had she done to him to make him dislike her so? Nothing she was aware of. It was as though he'd arrived at her home, determined to be nasty, 
when she was little more than property being bought and sold and transported without a say in the matter. She had not even been granted a say in when her escorts would arrive. Demanding they leave at once was at least a bit of control she could exert over the situation, though it had pained her immeasurably. And yet breathing the same air as Douglas Stewart pained her far more than that. She refused to so much as think of him as her father from that day on. He was merely the man who'd sired her, and nothing more. The ache in her chest caused tears to spring to her eyes. No, she could not shed them in the presence of these strangers especially not while Bryce continued to ride beside her. She turned her face in the other direction, focusing her gaze on the stately birch and ash trees which would soon change the colours of their leaves. She would never see another autumn in Scotland. An invisible hand clenched her throat squeezing tighter all the time until she would either weep or die. Control this. Control it. Control it as you always have. Nurse was the only person who'd ever seen her cry, save her mother. Not even Douglas had ever witnessed his daughter's tears. As though he would care if he had. Might we stop, she managed to choke out. Bryce snorted. We've only just begun, and you wish to stop. There he was again. There was one good thing about his attitude, it chased away her sorrow. Her head snapped around in his direction, eyes flashing. If you'd rather I answer nature's call while riding beside you by all means. I will do my best. That got him. He looked away, what she could see of his mouth above that beard of his set in a hard line. She did not even need to relieve herself. She'd merely wished to escape behind a tree and cry for a spell. But she could not take back her words, not after having snapped them so viciously. When they stopped, she slid from the saddle and handed the reins off to the leader. He at least, seemed to have a bit of kindness to him. Not that she liked him any more for it, since he was delivering her to the man who'd force her into marriage. But he was better than Bryce. She wandered into the woods, his voice ringing in her ears. Don't think you'll be running away now, lass. I wouldn't dream of it, she called back, fists tightly clenched at her sides. A terrible man, awful, simply begging her to pummel him. As if the journey itself, and what it represented, weren't terrible enough. And my name is Alana. You'd best use it, she called over her shoulder as an afterthought. Under no circumstances would she be called lass for the entirety of their journey, as though she were nothing more than a horse or a head of cattle. She found refuge behind a gnarled old birch, and leaned the back of her head against it, closing her eyes to play her favorite game. Perhaps if she stayed perfectly still, and didn't open her eyes, she might simply cease to be visible. And they would leave her alone. It hadn't worked once in her lifetime, but that did not mean she would cease hoping. Now more than ever, she needed for something to go her way. Five days. It should take five days a week at the most to reach it. The voice floated to her from the road, and it must have belonged to one of the two men who'd been riding behind her. I. What of it? Bryce asked. Amusing really, how she could already pick up his voice from the others. Perhaps because he sounded so sullen and nasty. Do you intend to behave this way, for the length of the journey brother? Brother. So, one of the other men was his brother. Her heart went out to him, whichever one he was. Since only one of them had hair streaked with red as Bryce's was, she assumed that to be the one in question. He had best not if he knows what is good for him, the leader grumbled. There is too much silver being promised for any of us to behave in such a manner. Silver. That was all she meant to any of them. Nothing of the fact that she was a human with feelings. Nothing of the fact that she was a woman and might at least be treated with a bit of courtesy, because of that. No. She was nothing more than a full purse to them. Tears rolled down her cheeks, sneaking their way out from beneath closed eyelids. Damn all of them for making her cry this way. For speaking of her as though she mattered so little. Are you all right there lass? The leader called out. Aye, she replied, if only to assure him she hadn't run away. She did not wish to imagine how unpleasant it would be for them to come looking for her. Are you bastard, 
she whispered to herself, tapping her fists against the rough tree bark in time with the beating of her broken heart. I'm here. And I'm planning to get away from you, whether you like it or not. We'll see how clever you are. She would need a plan this time. No sense in running off without one. She hadn't gotten far before. Now she had four men who would certainly look for her, if she slipped away. There had to be some way to divert their attention long enough for her to make an escape. Or she might leave in the night while they slept. Yes. Even if one of them sat up to keep watch, there had to be a way to sneak off. She might behave as though she were going to relieve herself again, only the most brutish excuse for a man would demand to accompany her. Even Bryce wouldn't be that unseemly. Would he? Lass. We're growing impatient. Coming. It was almost as if he'd heard her thinking about him. Impossible of course. She wandered out from behind the tree and watched the men as she approached. If running away didn't work, there was always another option. Was she daring enough to do it? It would mean debasing herself terribly, but that debasement would mean her freedom from a life spent as the wife of the Earl. A man she'd never met. She only knew his name. Not his age, nor his appearance, nor whether or not he had a kind heart. As she mounted her mare once again, there was no escaping the gaze of the young man who'd been riding behind her. Not Bryce's brother. The other one. Handsomer than the rest. And his eyes had most definitely been on her backside, as she swung a leg over the horse's back. She'd felt the appraising gaze of Douglas Stewart's men enough times to know the feeling. Perhaps he would be the one to take her virginity, and leave her unmarriageable. The very idea left her shaken, cold. Hoping her mother couldn't hear from her place in the heavenly kingdom. Oh, what would she think of her daughter? How many tears would she shed? You two went through this, she silently reminded the image of her beautiful mother which was always in her heart. That sweet smiling face. That serene temperament, even Alana could admit that she'd inherited much more of Douglas than Elizabeth in that area. Mother, would you not have done what I hoped to do if you had to suffer all over again? Chapter 8 Bryce wouldn't have admitted to it, even with the threat of hellfire bearing down on him, but the quiet dressing down he'd received from Roderick while the lass took her good sweet time answering nature's call still prickled at his pride. You accepted this assignment just as the rest of us did, he'd reminded Bryce, the words coming out a bit garbled thanks to the way he clenched his teeth. I, I did that, Bryce had admitted. Why do ye insist on pestering the lass so? Roderick's brows had knitted together in a frown. I'll tell ye now, and it gives me no pleasure to say this, that you might as well go back to Porrick and the rest if this is how you plan to conduct yourself over the duration of the journey. The two of them had been more at odds than usual throughout the journey, and this appeared to be yet another example of the unspoken tension which had grown between them. Never had Roderick gone so far as to order Bryce off a mission, or even to suggest such a thing. Bryce fixed his friend with a steady stare. You're asking me to leave? Roderick wore a grim expression. I'm merely reminding ye that we still have quite a bit of riding ahead of us, and if you intend to start fights at every turn, it might be best that you accompany us no farther. I know not what it is that makes ye behave so, but it will only make this journey more difficult. I, Bryce growled. And I'll do what I must to keep my distaste under control. And silent if possible, Roderick added. Though I know that's difficult for ye. It was not the time for jests, yet Bryce strove to prove his friend wrong by holding his tongue. Which of course was exactly what Roderick wanted him to do. I'm certain we'll be able to find something in the morning, Quinn said, mostly for Alana's benefit. There are normally deer aplenty in the woods. Rabbits. I once hunted down a boar, though that was quite a task and perhaps not worth the trouble. If the lass found him interesting or even worth listening to, she gave no indication. Her face remained blank, the light of the fire moving over it as she stared into the flames. There were moments in which he could not decide whether he found her comely or not. 
When light and shadow played on her features, it was more difficult to tell than ever. Though it mattered not whether the lass was pleasing to look upon. He'd only have to look upon her for a week, at the most. The lamb will do for now. Since we covered much ground today, we might have time for hunting tomorrow, Roderick announced, impaling what was left of the animal on a stick which he propped over the fire in order to warm it. It had come from the kitchen of the inn, meaning it was far more palatable than anything they would have roasted themselves. It was what was left from the feast they'd enjoyed that afternoon. Alana nodded only once, indicating her agreement. She did not appear to be difficult to please when it came to things that truly mattered, such as where they set up camp for the evening. Perhaps she did not care. That was likely the truth of it. I expect you're looking forward to seeing where your Earl lives. Quinn sat not far from Alana, where he'd set up blankets for her comfort. He was besotted, plain and simple, which did not come as a surprise. He had a bad habit of becoming besotted with a lovely face and long beautiful hair. The lass possessed both, when she was not behaving like a spoiled child and making herself appear ugly. She shrugged as Roderick handed over a large piece of lamb, the fat dripping from it still. She licked it away from her fingers before tearing off a small bit of flesh. Not over much, was her eventual reply. Sullen, reluctant to give any of herself away. Who is this man you're marrying, then? Fergus asked in an obvious attempt to lighten the mood. Earl Remington, she replied, toying with the hunk of meat in her lap. The lass didn't even have the good grace to show gratitude for having been granted the largest piece of lamb. He'd often heard of certain highland lasses and their manners, or entire lack thereof. Up to that point he'd thought it mere stories and falsehoods. Like the type spread about highland men. He'd been wrong, evidently, because this Alana Stewart was the worst he'd ever seen. But who is he? Fergus pressed. You want to know whether he'll make good on the offer he presented you? She asked, with more than a bit of an edge to her voice. I do not think that was what he meant, lass, Bryce muttered. I believe your brother can answer questions for himself, she spat back. He's a grown man with a tongue of his own. Oh gods above, how she tested his patience. Fergus cleared his throat. Bryce is correct. I didn't mean to imply that I do not trust the man. I was only wondering what you knew about him. She wiped her mouth with the hem of her kirtle. What I know about him. I know that his name is Remington, and that he is an earl. I know he met my father while travelling the highlands this past spring, and the arrangement for my marriage was made then, but not finalized until the last fortnight or so. That is when I was made aware of it. Silence fell over them, the four men shifting uncomfortably in place at the looming implications of her simple tale. It was really all very simple, so simple that Bryce was at a loss for how they'd managed to misunderstand. She knew nothing of the man, for it was not her idea to be wed. She was not in a rush to get to him because she loved him or wanted to be with him. She had simply wanted to get on with the whole affair, which clearly disgusted her. She did not even know, until a fortnight ago, that a wedding was in her future. That bastard Stuart. Bryce saw how right he was not to trust the man. While his daughter was certainly no prize, and might or might not even survive the journey, depending on whether she could learn to keep her mouth shut and be amenable, she was more than a head of livestock to be bartered. Yet that was how he'd treated her. He'd sold her in marriage to a man he'd met while on the road. Without her even knowing of it until months had passed. Roderick cleared his throat, eyes darting this way and that as if searching for something new to discuss. I was married recently, he offered. You were. For once the lass sounded interested. He nodded. My wife's name is Caitlin and we only found out just prior to leaving to fetch ye that were to have a child. Bryce watched as Alana's expression softened a great deal. You are. That's lovely. I'm glad for you because I can see how glad you are. Aye, it's good news to be sure. Then her brows knitted together. You would rather be with her right now, would you not? Aye, I must admit. He chuckled, ducking his head and rubbing the back of his neck. 
Not that I blame ye, ye can. Why would you blame me? She blinked. I did not ask you to come. I did not wish for you to come. I did not know any of you existed until this very day. I'd assumed my, my new husband would come to me, that we would be married in my ancestral home and make the journey together. I thought. She trailed off, staring into the fire as though it held some great secret. Bryce wondered about her as he hadn't done before. What would it mean to be sold into marriage to a woman he'd never met? No, even that wouldn't be the same, as he would still hold the power in the marriage, as the man this would be expected. What if he were a woman, then? What if he had no choice but to travel to a foreign land, to leave behind everything he'd ever known in favour of this stranger's life and home and kin? The lass couldn't even have any of her family with her on her wedding day, not that she seemed overly fond of them. She had not even stopped to say a final goodbye to any of them before leaving. Perhaps she felt she was leaving nothing behind. He wouldn't know the answers to any of these questions unless he asked her himself, and he was not about to do that. She'd be more likely to scratch his eyes out than she would to answer in a pleasant manner. Besides, it was none of his affair. Once they'd finished eating, throwing the bones into the fire, they worked out the shifts in which they'd sit up during the night, while Alana made a show of moving her blankets farther from the fire. She kept her eyes on her work, not so much as glancing their way. It gets cool out here at night, Bryce warned. Ye might find yourself wishing ye were nearer the fire before long. I'll be fine, thank ye, she replied, not shaking out the blanket she intended to cover herself with. A sidelong glance at Roderick told him it would be best to leave the matter alone. And so he did, and sat up to take the first watch while the others settled in to sleep. It did not take long for the sounds of heavy breathing and snoring to fill the air, as all of them were still recovering from their illness. They might have the strength to ride half a day at a clip, but rest was needed afterward. Rest which Bryce wished for, truth be told. But he had sustained far worse as a member of the army. He'd once sat through the night with an oozing wound to his arm, half freezing in the rain which felt like ice as it battered his skin, listening to the death rattles of more than one of his friends as they suffered and finally succumbed. Staying awake for a couple of hours would hardly be a challenge after that. Even so, the tree at his back was welcome. He leaned against it, allowing himself to relax somewhat, not entirely but enough that he was content. The night air was comfortable and dry, unlike the heavy heat of summer. He drew a deep breath of it with a smile. And she moved. He went still. She moved once again, the curves beneath her blanket shifting as she rolled onto her back. Her eyes opened. She looked around. Then propped herself up on one elbow. The way her eyes darted back and forth told him she wasn't merely waking to answer nature's call. She was considering an escape. He snapped his eyes shut before she saw him, leading her to believe he'd fallen asleep on duty. Oh, how fortunate she must have believed herself. It was nearly too easy and too enjoyable. He watched through one half-open lid as she scurried to her feet as quietly as possible, her head moving back and forth as she watched her four escorts for any signs of movement. He had to give her credit. She was quiet, so quiet that no one who truly slept so much as shifted while she moved about. She drew up her skirts exposing her stockinged legs up to the knee, picked up her shoes in her free hand and darted off into the darkness while carrying them. He knew where she was going, to the horses. The moment she was out of earshot, he got to his feet and crept along in her wake. She'd take the time to replace her shoes, her fumbling around in the dark would give him even more time to catch up to her. For a man of his size, he had always been an expert in moving silently from one place to the next. A skill which had served him immeasurably well in the army, when ordered to perform dangerous spy missions against the Viking horde. He'd done admirably well then, and that had been while fighting men who'd been well trained in the art of combat. Alana was merely a headstrong lass. There she was, bent at the waist, sliding her feet into her shoes. She straightened, and he went stiff as a plank while she cast frightened looks about. She didn't see him. 
How could she possibly consider traveling in the dark, alone, when she couldn't make out the shape of a man of his size? Even in the poor light from a quarter moon, he would make certain to beat this point into her thick head when he had the chance. Or perhaps, he might be able to convince her now. She would either fight like the devil himself or faint. He would have to prepare himself for both outcomes. If she kicked him in his private area, well, he likely deserved it for what he was about to do. Chapter 9 It was working. She was almost free. The pounding of her heart was the loudest sound in her ears as she slipped through the tall grass to where the horses waited, flicking their tails to and fro as they brushed away the insects which tended to swarm at night. Shush, she warned on approaching, holding both hands out in hopes her scent would precede her and earn their trust. And they're quiet. She cast her eyes about her, praying silently that there would be no sudden noise or movement. If the men knew she was trying to escape, they would destroy everything. They didn't know what it was, to be entirely at the mercy of another. To have no control over one's life. They were men, free to come and go as they chose. Able to decide their fate. She'd wish for them to understand someday, but that would be too terrible a thing to wish on anyone. Even they did not deserve to know what it meant to be in this position. Her mare was the last in the row, tied off to the low branch of an ash tree. She eyed Alana warily. There, there, Alana whispered, stroking the mare's neck. I'm sorry to have come upon you like this, so late in the evening. I know you wish to rest, and you deserve to for all the work you've done today. I promise, once we get away from here, you'll get the rest you need. The mare still shifted uneasily from side to side, one of her front hooves pawing at the ground in an impatient manner. Alana barely squelched her own rising panic as she reached for the beast's reins, now in more of a hurry than ever. She had to get away with the horse before it alerted the others. That was when a hand clamped over her mouth. A large hand, strong fingers digging into her cheeks. There was no time to scream, for she hadn't known there was anyone behind her until it was too late. An arm slid around her body, holding her in place. She kicked out but to no avail, as there was little chance of escaping the strong tight grip of her captor. I then, a voice whispered in her ear, what's this? Alone in the dark, i.e.? She just about went wild with terror. Who was he? What was he going to do to her? She clawed at the hand over her mouth, desperate to pry it away from her for just long enough to let out one good scream for help. Images overlapped in her frantic mind, ugly images of pain and humiliation which were enough to inspire a fresh burst of strength. She slammed her heel into her captor's foot, and he let out a grunt of pain. And then? He began to laugh, though softly. All right, lass. All right then, he whispered, still holding her but not as tightly as before. If you'll promise not to scream, I'll release you. If you scream, you'll awaken the others and they'll know you tried to escape. It took a moment for her reason to catch up with her wild thoughts. The voice. He was speaking in a normal voice now, and it was a voice she already knew. Relief flooded her body, straight down to her bones. It was Bryce. It had been Bryce all along. He'd only been trying to frighten her. And he'd succeeded. Rage quickly took the place of relief. Do you promise not to scream, he whispered. Her hands out of sight balled into tight fists. She nodded. He slowly lifted his hand from her mouth, then even more slowly released the arm which held her tight against his body. The moment she had the room to spin around she did so, pounding her fists against his chest. What did you think you were doing, she demanded in a fierce whisper. Oh if she could only be as large as he was, just for a moment. Just long enough to take off his head. Calm down lass he urged, taking hold of her wrists. I do not wish to cause you harm, but a man's got to defend himself. What is wrong with you? Why would ye frighten me that way? To teach ye a lesson. How? By frightening me out of my wits? By killing me? Och it was not killing ye I had in mind, though you're making me wonder if that wouldn't be a fine idea after all. He smirked. 
She shook her arms, trying to free herself from his grip, but to no avail. She was already well aware of his strength, the pressure of his hand over her mouth was still fresh in her memory, as though he were still holding her. He might be able to hold her wrists, but he could not hold her legs at the same time. She drew one of them back, and delivered a sharp solid kick to his shin. He released her then, muttering obscenities as he reached down to rub his wounded leg. All right, all right, he whispered. Enough. I could not allow you to escape, and you know it. Or else there would have been no sneaking about. A flush colored her cheeks. I had to try. Why can't you see that? I see it. That doesn't mean I'm going to allow it. He sat down his back to the camp and the horses, still rubbing his shin. You've got quite a kick by the way. She scoffed but sat down beside him. You deserved it. Though I wouldn't expect a man such as yourself, to whimper so over the kick of a defenseless woman. Hardly defenseless, he muttered. And I'm beginning to suspect more trouble than you're worth. Release me then. Allow me to go on my way, and I'll never trouble you again. And I will not collect my silver, and I'll be robbing my friends of the chance to collect theirs. No thank you. He shook his head, chuckling in derision. Hopelessness settled on her, like a heavy weight sitting on her chest. Making it impossible to breathe. To hell with you then, she croaked, her voice breaking as emotion threatened to overwhelm her once again. He sighed turning his face toward hers. You do not need to take it so hard lass. How dare you say that to me, she demanded. You know nothing of what I'm suffering. You know nothing of me, or what it's like to have no say in your life. You're free. You're a man. You can do whatever it is you like. She expected him to come back at her with another accusation, but he fell silent instead. There was no escaping the slight twinge of smugness his silence granted her. He knew she was right, that there was no defense to offer. She was wrong. That isn't true at all lass, though I can understand how you would come to that, he murmured, looking off into the endless field of grass and heather. The fragrance of the latter was heavy in the air, sweeping over the two of them every time the breeze blew. She was nearly overcome with a deep, throbbing heartache, and the desire to gather all her arms could hold. Simply for the sake of having something to remember her childhood by once, she was someone else's wife. How is it not true? she demanded in a whisper. Look at the four of you. You're free to do as you please, to go where you please. No one tells you what to do or when to do it. Nay, but we made a heavy decision in order to arrive at this so-called freedom, he informed her. Everything we do is a choice he can, and no choice is made on its own. Not without payment required down the road. And payment is always required. The chirping of grasshoppers filled the silence when he ceased speaking. They were merely an echo of the buzzing in Alana's head, at Bryce's words. The need to know more about him struck her suddenly. What is it you had to choose then, she dared ask, hoping he would not rebuff her. Hoping too, that he would not look at her question as any symbol of interest in him, for she had none. It was merely easier to make conversation, than it was to suffer through his derision. Fairly simple, if you ask me. He grinned good-natured once again. He leaned back on his elbows, stretching out his long bulky body. Alana realized she was staring and quickly averted her eyes. He sighed gazing up at the sky. I can only speak for myself of course, but I had the choice of either returning to my childhood home and always serving the laird or striking out on my own. Your brother too, she whispered. Och I. Him as well, though I believe much of his decision to run off had to do with my deciding to do so. He did not wish to be the man of the place when our father passed on. Neither of us was looking to be the village cobbler. That was our father's trade. A shoemaker, she murmured with a smile. It all made much more sense, as though the clouds had parted to allow the sun to stream through. Woe to the man who ever tried to force Bryce to make shoes. It was an amusing picture, one which she needed to bite her tongue to keep from chuckling over. He must have understood her mirth for what it was, but he did not chastise her for it. You see then. 
Not that it isn't a noble profession, ye ken. A fine place any of us would be in, without shoes for our feet. I know mine are very nearly ready to fall to pieces. But I simply cool to see myself settling down into a life of nothing but making shoes for the manor house, and those who lived under its roof. It would likely be very boring to you compared to what you do now, she observed. He shook his head. Nay, it isn't just that. It's that I'd be doing everything, offering everything I had to the laird and his family and their people. That was what needled at me. I did not wish to do so, even before I went off to join in the war. Neither did Fergus, though we never spoke of it until we were well away from home. We're both what you would call rebels, I suppose. He chuckled softly. So you chose to do what you do instead. I. It's a free sort of life, after all. As you said, no one tells us what to do unless we accept their silver in exchange for a task they need taking care of. He stretched his legs further, crossing them at the ankle. Once again, his movement required Alana to avert her eyes. She'd never considered herself overly modest, but the presence of this remarkable person required her to recall everything the village priest had ever lectured. Good thing he was giving her plenty to think over then. She chewed her lip, attempting to place herself in his position. It was either returning home to be a cobbler for the rest of her life, the thought of which filled her with a strange sense of resentment, as she did not wish to make shoes for anyone until the end of her days or strike off on her own. Yes, she could see how he'd arrived at such a conclusion. It was a brave decision, in all. To leave behind everything one had ever known, in favor of something unknown. I would do the same thing, she decided with a firm nod. He chuckled, perhaps louder than he should have, considering the fact that they were trying to avoid waking the others. Would ye now? I, she insisted, looking him in the eye. I would. If I had the chance. But you see, this is what I was speaking of. You had the chance. You were able to make such a choice for yourself, while I've never been allowed to. It was never even considered. But. He held up a finger to stop her. You're forgetting something. As I said lass, every decision comes with another side. Like a coin. You can only ever look at one side of a coin at a time, but it's important to turn the coin over every so often. What was on the other side for you then? She wondered if you knew he sighed. She heard it but barely. Never having a home, he murmured staring at the sky again. What did he see up there? He looked almost wistful. Ah? You've turned your back on the comforts of a home and family, she surmised, and was surprised by the slight twinge of sympathy she felt. Her heart nearly went out to him then. I. You might put it that way. His jaw worked for a long time while he spoke not a word. When he did he said, not that it makes my heart heavy lass. Not at all. I enjoy my life. I'm my own master. I've always loved the out of doors, the very thought of a life spent in a workshop makes my stomach sour. She giggled. I can imagine compared to this, it would seem a very dull life. He turned his head, eyes meeting hers. So you see now. It might appear as though a man can make his way in the world, without answering to others, but that simply isn't so. My father never could. He had not the strength nor the spirit to live the life I chose. He had no choice but to labor, as others in our village did. I'm certain he worked until the day he died. The same with my mother. The way he spoke of them, it was as though he felt nothing for them. As though he were relating a story which had nothing to do with him. Perhaps that was as it needed to be. Perhaps he couldn't bear thinking of them as his parents, especially since it sounded as though he was uncertain of their final days. He hadn't been there with them. Her heart softened even further. Which was what caused her to jump to her feet, her chest heaving. What is it? he asked, staring at her in surprise as he sat up. Nothing, she said with a toss of her head. It's, it's very late and I need to sleep if we're going to cover ground in the morning. I, he agreed, though slowly. He stood, his body towering over hers once he reached full height. 
the memory of that body against hers, overpowering her, sending terror racing through every inch of her, hardened her even further. He had terrorized her, the fiend. And he expected her to feel sorry for him, because he once made the choice to not be a cobbler? She would have laughed if she weren't so furious. You're angry again, he observed, a smile tugging at one corner of his mouth. I would appreciate your not treating my feelings as something to be laughed over, she warned, ready to thrash him if need be. My apologies. He managed a solemn expression. What was it I said that upset you so? I only wish to avoid repeating the same mistake, ye can. What upset me so, she hissed. I'll tell you. It's the way you think you understand anything about me. You didn't wish to be a cobbler. Poor thing. What did you do then? You made a choice because there was a choice to be made. And others had to respect your choice, even if it wasn't one they would have made for themselves. Because you're a man. You're allowed. She turned away, tears of rage threatening to choke her, and stumbled her way back to the campsite through the grass. Who was she more enraged with? Him. Or herself, for almost allowing him to work his way into her sympathy. Chapter 10 The day dawned bright and clear, with a blue sky which foretold of the autumn ahead. After taking care of nature's needs, Bryce went about the business of watering the horses. On the branch of one of the trees was a caterpillar. He watched as it slowly crept along and noted its thick hair. Perhaps the thickest he'd ever seen. One of the signs of a difficult winter to come. All the more reason for them to be well on their way, so they might be back before the first frost. Anything they did between now and winter would likely require less travel. And they might settle in after that, enjoying the spoils of their hard work, new clothing, new shoes, not to mention the satisfaction of a little rest after spending the year, and so many years before that, with nowhere to rest their heads for more than a few days at a stretch. The rest were preparing for the day, ensuring the fire was truly out by covering it with dirt and wet leaves. Alana, meanwhile, stood at a distance. Her back was to a tree, arms crossed over her stomach. She would not meet his gaze when he looked at her. Even when he stared at her. There was so much anger there. Resentment. A lifetime's worth. It wasn't his concern. What was his concern was whether or not she would stay with them, rather than attempting to run away again. One look at her, and he was certain she hadn't learned her lesson. So insolent, so angry. In her mind, they were the enemy. He went to her while the others saddled the horses, pulling her aside and out of earshot. She wrenched her arm from his grasp but did not look at him. They were back where they'd started, apparently. With her refusing to acknowledge his presence. It was enough to make him regret what he was about to say, as she did not deserve his kindness. I haven't told the others about what ye did last night, he murmured, one eye on his friends. They didn't seem to notice that he and their charge were having a private conversation, too busy laughing over one of Fergus's stories. He had untold numbers, and while many of them involved members of their group, those involved still laughed as though they were hearing something fresh and new. His brother was a natural storyteller. She glanced up at him, then away again. You haven't? Nay. I felt it best we keep it between ourselves. If there was ever a chance to earn her gratitude, it was now. Surely she was not so daft as to spit in his face after he was kind to her. Her eyes narrowed, her mouth pursing as it had while she sized the four of them up the day before. She was thinking, weighing his words, deciding what they meant. He wished she weren't half as smart as she thought she was. It would make his task so much simpler. Thank you, she finally muttered, resentment still clear in her voice. You might try to sound as though you mean it. What do you want me to do, she asked, still watching Roderick and the rest. Fall at your feet. Weep until I faint from the strain. All right, he grumbled. No, truly. What is it ye wish for me to do or say? After all, you've been so kind to me, I want only to return your kindness. Her eyes were cold when they fixed on his. 
He had half a mind to tell her to look away again. He did not wish to bear the weight of her frosty glare. You do not need to behave as though we're the enemy. Let us begin there. But ye are. And it's sorry I am that ye feel that way. But we're not. We're merely doing as we're paid to do. It might as well be blood money, she hissed. Are you prepared to leave? Quinn called out, taking the reins of Alana's mare before swinging up onto the back of his black gelding. The two of them glared at each other, with Bryce struggling to keep control of his rage. So, that's what ye think, is it? It's finally coming to this. You believe the money we're collecting for your delivery is blood money? Or as good as she hissed, baring her teeth and all. He leaned down until their faces were mere inches apart. I'm likely the first one to tell ye of this then, but it's best ye know now there is nothing special about ye. Nothing different. This is how marriage has been arranged for years, for our parents and their parents before them. And fifty years from now, alas, no one will care about one spoiled Highland lass who kicked and fought, but still had to marry the man she didn't wish to marry because that was simply how it was done. He hated himself the moment the words were out of his mouth, hanging between them before a breeze swept through and carried them away, leaving the two of them staring at each other. Are ye coming or aren't ye? Fergus called out, sounding perturbed. Alana's throat worked as she swallowed. Bryce cleared his throat. Neither of them said a word to each other. When she took a step back, breaking the tension of the moment, Bryce blinked hard as though coming out of a deep sleep. She went to her mare, taking the reins from Quinn before favouring him with a bright smile. Many thanks, she murmured, taking her time about mounting the horse. Much to Quinn's delight. What was she on about this time? He was brooding. He'd always hated people who brooded, men in particular, but there he was. Unable to get the image of her stricken face out of his mind, as they made their way down what he supposed was meant to be a decent road. It was not. Roderick dismounted, hands on his hips as he surveyed the situation before them. The tree which had fallen and blocked the road was one of many they'd come across since leaving their camp that morning, up until that point, they'd been able to guide their horses around that which stood in their way. Clearly a rarely travelled road, Quinn had observed more than once, which Bryce supposed was for the lass's benefit. As though she needed to be told. As though it even needed to be spoken aloud. And yet she had favoured him with another smile each time he spoke. She was up to something. Bryce wished he knew what it was. The sun was directly overhead when they came to the largest tree yet. It looked to be hundreds of years old, easily spanning the width of the road with its trunk alone. The roots were to the right, the branches to the left. There was no telling how far off the road they would need to walk the horses in order to get around it. Quinn held Alana's mare in place as she dismounted, and she smiled again once her feet were on the ground. She happened to look in Bryce's direction next, and her smile disappeared. Flushed cheeks replaced that smile just before she turned her face away. She knew he knew there was a plan in place. She couldn't hide it from him. He only wished it had nothing to do with Quinn. The lad did not deserve her trickery. If he attempted to warn Quinn, he knew his warning would only be regarded as the result of the dislike which had tinged their interactions. He would not be taken seriously, and might in fact be accused of starting trouble. I suppose this way would be best, he suggested resolving to ignore her for the time being. Away from the limbs. Aye, Roderick agreed, while the others nodded. He and Fergus took the lead, followed by Quinn, then Alana. Bryce was last, guiding the horse carefully as they picked their way through the underbrush. Under cover of trees, the day's warmth quickly cooled until it was nearly chilly. A blessed relief, the perspiration at the back of his neck quickly turned comfortable, cooling his body and helping ease the turmoil inside somewhat. He'd always had difficulty using reason when he was uncomfortable and already out of sorts. How is it back there? Quinn called out over one shoulder, a roguish smile slashing across the lower half of his face as he looked at Alana. Bryce's jaw clenched as he fought the mix of emotion that smile stirred. 
Alana merely raised her free hand in greeting, assuring him she was well. She was not. Bryce could see it for himself. While a capable rider and blessed with a great deal of stamina, she had yet to complain of fatigue after riding straight through since sunrise, she was somewhat ungraceful. He'd seen her stumble more than once over half-hidden rocks and tangled weeds, throwing out her free hand to catch herself, and more often than not hitting the tree. He wanted to help her whenever this happened. It was in his nature, nothing more. The wish to be of service to one who needed assistance. It wasn't easy, leaving her to her own devices. He reminded himself of how she'd more than likely throw his kindness back in his face, every time he felt even an inkling of responsibility for her welfare. If she wanted to be difficult, he'd allow her to be just that. They were nearing the roots, and even he was taken aback by the sight which loomed over their heads. She stopped short, her mare whinnying. All right, lass? Bryce dared ask. She nodded without turning. Aye. It's impressive. And it was. When the tree had fallen, it had taken its roots and much of the ground around it in all directions. That ground now stood up in the air, still attached to the tree's trunk, the whole thing stretching upward until he had to crane his neck to take in the full height. Use caution here. Roderick called out. It's quite uneven. We'll have to go around the hole left by the roots. With that, Roderick disappeared behind the base of the tree. Fergus followed him. It'll be easy, Quinn assured her, smiling again. Bryce had never so wanted to tell him to shut up. He had no idea the fool the lass was playing him for. She had clearly picked him out as the easiest target, always eager to make the acquaintance of a comely lass such as herself, and he was falling for it. The fool. You lead the way and I'm certain I'll make it, she called back. Bryce rolled his eyes, reminding himself to pay attention to his own horse and where he was planting his feet, as the terrain grew even more difficult to travel. Quinn disappeared behind the tree's base, leaving only the lass and himself. She murmured to her mare in soothing tones, comforting the poor beast as it picked its way through the brush. Bryce spoke not a word, watching her whenever he had the chance. Be careful, he muttered before she cleared the base. He thought she might have sniffed derisively, but couldn't be certain. It was his turn to clear the base, when he did, an even more impressive sight greeted him. A mass of roots tangled together, some of them still attached to the ground and forming what reminded him of a tent as they stretched from the base of the tree to the hole left behind. They seemed to go on forever, and it was then that he marveled to himself over all the things that were hidden to their eyes. The trees themselves were majestic on their own, when what was beneath them was impressive in its own right. The horse seemed reluctant to continue, pulling on the reins, and Bryce was careful to calm him as they made slow progress. There was little light, twice he slipped and nearly slid into the hole where once there had been roots and a tree trunk. When it was over, and he rounded the base again, breathing a sigh of relief as he did, he found Roderick, Fergus and Quinn waiting. Where is she? he asked, looking from one of them to the other, expecting them to explain that she'd gone off behind a tree to relieve herself. The blank stares he received instead sent a bolt of fear to his heart. And a sense of understanding. He should have known better. Chapter 11 Hurry, hurry! Alana urged, leading the mare, nearly running in her haste to get away from them. She was almost free. She could taste it. A laugh of sheer joy bubbled up in her chest, but she did not dare give voice to it. That would mean alerting the men to her location. They were like as not still making their way around the fallen tree, the moment Quinn had disappeared from sight, she'd seen her chance. If she could not see him, Bryce would not be able to see her once she rounded the massive base, and the still-attached mossy soil hid her progress. He wouldn't give it a moment's thought, if she suddenly fell out of sight. Which was why, rather than continuing straight ahead, she darted off to the right and deeper into the dark woods. The only problem she faced, was the fact that she hadn't the first idea where she was exactly. She stopped to rest, tying the mare's reins off on the closest branch before leaning against the tree. A tall sturdy birch, its trunk cool against her cheek. Eyes sliding closed, she fought to catch her breath before moving on. 
She hadn't paid attention to the direction in which she'd run, which she feared would prove problematic. The heavens would not suddenly open up and shine a beam of light on the path she needed to take, which was something she needed to accept. There would be no perfect time. There would be no ideal situation. Rather than waiting until the men slept and taking her time to work out the optimal route, she needed instead to take the opportunity when it presented itself. That fallen tree had been an opportunity. She had been brave enough to take it. All she needed was the strength to follow through. Mother, she prayed. Please help me. Alana. Her eyes flew open wide at the echo as it carried through the woods, bouncing from tree to tree, until there was nothing left in the world but the sound of her name. Even the birds ceased their chattering when that echo reached the spot where she rested. Come, girl. She untied the reins and mounted the mare, determined to outrun her captors if need be. The mare did not wish to make haste through the dense woods, and while Alana could not blame her really, such concerns were of little importance at that moment. Her heart beat wildly as she urged the animal on, all but begging her to put on a little speed as they trotted through the trees. Bryce would not show her the same understanding he had before, if he caught up to her. He'd tell the others what she'd already done, and more than likely blame himself for not having warned them of her. Which meant he'd take their ire out on her in the end. That, plus the fact that they'd deliver her to her intended, was enough to bring panicked tears to her eyes. Oh mother help me. Elana. You'll get yourself killed out there lass. Damn it all. She patted the horse's neck, crooning as gently as possible to soothe it and prevent it from throwing her. There was no hint of light anywhere, no break in the trees to tell her she was moving in the direction of the road. Nothing recognizable. Only trees and moss and soft loamy soil and the plants which thrived therein. Not even a long abandoned huntsman's shelter for her to take refuge in. She knuckled away a tear, tapping her heels to the mare's sides to signal movement. Alana. The voices were closer. They were gaining on her. The thought of them finding her, of roughly forcing her to come with them, tying her up and throwing her across one of their saddles. She barely swallowed back a wave of nausea, the contents of her stomach threatening to reveal themselves. Alana threw a glance over her shoulder, certain she could just make out a dark shape looming behind her. She bit back a scream, but wasn't able to stop herself from jumping in fear. Which frightened the horse even further. The mare whinnied before coming to a dead stop, sending an unprepared Alana sliding from the saddle. One moment, she was securely seated. The next, she was falling to the ground, her hands still clutching the reins. The soil was soft at least, cushioning her backside when she landed with a thump. Pain shot up her back nonetheless, and she bit her lip hard enough to draw blood. The mare reared, forelegs kicking. Alana threw her crossed arms over her head, curling into a ball lest the kicking hooves should hit her. Then in a flash the horse was gone. She darted off into the woods, disappearing in an echo of hoofbeats. Oh no, Alana groaned slowly getting to her feet. The horse. How would she get along without her? While the pack containing her clothing and personal items was with the men, she would do without them if need be, even her mother's wedding gown, her food and water were in the mare's saddlebag. And it was gone. Footsteps came from behind her. She froze at the snapping of a twig, her heart sinking as the truth of her situation became clear. She'd run for nothing. Again. Show them it doesn't matter, she reminded herself as she turned in place. Even if it wasn't true, she would do so. They couldn't break her or frighten her. All right. Ye cannot blame me for trying, she said, taking a step toward the figure she'd noticed while on horseback. Only then, did she realize the figure was not that of a human being. Terror unlike any she'd ever known slammed into her from all sides, leaving her frozen solid. She could not move a single part of her body, not even her fingers. The fact that she was breathing at all was miraculous. It wasn't human. It was animal. A boar. She heard its breathing, heard the soft grunts and snorts as it sniffed the air and decided whether she was friend or foe. She was neither. 
She was food. And soon the boar would discover this and decide to rush at her. She had seen the results of a goring once. She had seen how the side of the poor wretched man's face looked like nothing that belonged on a human. It had been merely a mess of shredded meat, thanks to the boar's tremendous tusks. She remained still. Now more out of self-preservation than fear. Her body was beginning to come back to her, as the urge to run began pounding out a steady rhythm in her mind. Run. 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 No. That would be useless. It would outrun her, take her down from behind, tear her to pieces while pinning her to the ground. She'd be no match for it. Perhaps it would be for the best, if the animal were to end it all. The thought came upon her, hitting her unawares. While part of her mind wanted to reject it, push it away, refuse to entertain it, another part agreed. She would either die on her own in the woods, with no food or shelter. Or she'd be forced to wed Earl Remington. Or she could give up her life and be done with it all. This went through her head in an instant, more brief than it took to blink an eye. That, and the image of her mother frowning in disapproval of her for even thinking such terrible things. Help me, she whispered just before the boar snorted and rushed her. Chapter 12 I never should have let her out of my sight, Bryce growled through gritted teeth, using every foul word and expression he'd ever learned to silently curse her for her treachery. Ye didn't know she would do this. Do not blame yourself. We're all equally guilty in this. Roderick spat on the ground. I have to admit, I don't know how we'll ever find her now. She tried this last night, Bryce admitted. It mattered little anymore. He was no longer trying to keep their relations civil. What? Roderick hissed, turning to him. You didn't tell us of this. Why would you keep such an important thing secret? I wanted to smooth things over with the lass, Bryce nearly shouted. I stopped her and told her I wouldn't tell anyone, it could be between us. How was I to know she would use me like this? Perhaps you could have told me, at least, without letting her know you had. Roderick challenged. And I would have known to watch her more closely. Damn it all. I know. You can blame me all you like later. Bryce turned away, all but yelling for the girl to return. Aside from the fact that they would lose the payment from Remington, she would surely get herself killed out there. Hadn't he already warned her? Fergus and Quinn had moved off to the north and south, the two of them taking turns calling out for Alana. They would blame him too. All of them would, and they'd be correct to do so. Why had he remained silent over her attempt? They had a job to perform, and only with honesty could they be successful. That meant sharing everything with each other. And it was her fault. She'd taken advantage of him. If he found her, he'd kill her. A scream pierced the air. His head snapped up. She was in danger, and he had to save her. Alana. He ran in the direction the scream seemed to come from. Where are ye, Alana? Help me, she shrieked. His head snapped back and forth, his eyes and ears trained for any sign. It was dark, the trees closed together in clusters which blocked the light and broke any sort of view he might still be allowed. Where is she? Roderick panted when he caught up, having run to follow Bryce's progress. How would I know? Bryce asked. Panic grew with every passing moment. Ilana. Tell me where ye are. A boar, she shrieked. Oh gods, Roderick groaned. This way. Bryce pointed in the direction it seemed her screams came from, freeing the dirk at his side and hoping it would be enough to fend off a boar. Of all the trouble she could have found herself in, this was perhaps the most dangerous to all of them. Did ye hear her? Quinn came on the run, his own blade in one hand. Aye, what do ye think? Bryce shoved his way past Quinn, focusing as much concentration as possible on Alana's screams and the direction from which they'd come. Where are ye, Alana? Tell us where. Silence. Even the birds had halted in their singing. Oh gods, Quinn groaned. Bryce held his breath, straining to hear even the slightest sound. There was rustling coming from somewhere ahead of them, 
but exactly where it came from was impossible to tell. His eyes were becoming accustomed to the darkness, bringing the shapes of the trees around him into sharper focus. I climbed a tree. Bryce closed his eyes momentarily when he heard her voice, thanking whoever or whatever was keeping her safe for the time being. Stay where ye are, he called out, his voice steady, his head moving back and forth as once again he tried to determine where her shouts came from. Where is the boar? He's, she shrieked, then continued, he's rubbing his tusks against the tree. Are ye high up? Roderick asked, Dirk at the ready. As high as I can go, she whimpered. Please, please come. Be calm, lass, Bryce advised, his palms slick with sweat. Perspiration ran down the back of his neck and the sides of his face. Hold on and stay as still as you can. It amazed him that the creature did not turn and charge at the sound of his voice, but he'd seen Alana and caught her scent and was determined to have her. Bryce. Roderick. Fergus's voice came from Bryce's left, far enough that Bryce could not make out his brother's form. Where are ye? Roderick asked. I see her from where I'm standing, Fergus explained, an edge of strain in his voice, carrying both a dirk and a thin sword he'd claimed as his own after taking it from a dead Norwegian. He might be able to defend himself if the beast charged him, but Bryce did not wish to find out whether it was possible. Nor did his brother, like as not. Stay where you are until we're a bit closer. Bryce instructed, choosing his steps carefully as they made their way through the thick brush between the trees. If one of them stumbled or fell, the boar might easily overtake them. Alana whimpered. I'm losing my grip. No, you are not, Bryce commanded, keeping his voice steady in spite of his growing panic. We're almost with ye. There. Roderick pointed to where one of the trees shook slightly, some of its leaves falling every time it did. It was a relief. All right. We see ye, Bryce said. Hold on. Whatever you do, just hold on. Bryce? Fergus asked. We're going to have to frighten it off, Quinn whispered at Bryce's elbow. If we lure it away, it'll tear through us on its way. Bryce could see the boar, and Quinn was clearly correct. The beast was enormous, full-grown and enraged because it couldn't reach the lass in the tree. It butted the trunk, causing more leaves to fall and prying a dismayed whimper from Alana. Just a bit longer, he told her, his hand tightening around the dirk. Rocks, Roderick decided, bending swiftly to fetch one from the ground by his feet. If we hit it, it may run away from us. And if it runs toward us? Bryce asked. That's what the blades are for, he replied, handing another rock to Bryce. Large, with a good weight to it. Fergus. Follow my voice. We're going to pelt it with rocks. I don't want it to run at you while it's trying to get away from us. Bryce heard Fergus's footfalls as he did just that, twigs snapping underfoot. The boar turned at the sound, as though it had only just noticed the presence of others in the vicinity. Fergus. Look out. Bryce threw the rock with all his might as the boar took off in Fergus's direction, hoping against hope to steer the beast off course. Many things happened at once. Alana's screams filled the air, mixing with Fergus's shouts. The boar's grunts somehow rose above it all. Bryce ran in a blind panic, some small part of his mind warning against such panic though there was no hope of avoiding it. His brother. His brother. Where are you? He screamed, charging through the brush, low-hanging branches tearing at his face and hair as he ran heedlessly through it all. Here. Fergus stumbled toward him, one hand clutching the other arm. Killed the bastard. Sawed through his neck. Sure enough, the beast's body was behind him, the blood pooling on the mossy ground. That was nothing compared to the blood dripping from between Fergus's fingers. Bryce didn't dare lift those fingers for fear of releasing the pressure over the wound, but it was clear damage had been done. Quickly. Roderick put an arm around Fergus's waist and led him away, into a clearing where there would be better light to see by. Quinn, go back to the horses and fetch the water and the bundle of herbs and treatments. Bryce stood there for a moment that might as well have been an eternity, his chest heaving in great gasps as he struggled to make sense of what had taken place. Alana. 
He turned and went to the tree, where she was still waiting on one of the lowest limbs. Her body stretched out over it, feet dangling on either side, arms wrapped around it. She closed her eyes. All is well, lass. Come down. He extended his hands to her, amazed at the calm tone of his voice, when he wanted nothing more than to shout every obscenity he knew. Her eyes opened, blinked. It's gone, she whimpered. I. It'll not harm ye. Come on. He touched her ankle. I'll help ye. She sat up, swinging her left leg behind her to clear the limb. Bryce caught her by the waist, lowering her to the ground. He took her by the arms, holding her in place as he went over her with his eyes. Are ye injured? She merely shook her head. That was good to know. It would make what was about to come easier on both of them. The rage he was barely able to rein in broke loose. What were ye thinking? Are ye that determined to destroy yourself? He demanded, and it wasn't until she let out a groan of discomfort that he realized he was shaking her. He stopped but maintained his grip on her arms. He could not seem to release them. Her cheeks were wet, tear-stained. I wasn't trying to destroy myself. I was trying to save myself. By putting yourself in terrible danger. Do ye ever think before you act? You're hurting me, she whispered, eyes downcast. Only then did he loosen his grip, which she slid from. It was all too easy to forget how fragile she was when he was in a fit of anger over her foolishness. What's worse, he continued, your actions put us in danger as well. And you would not be able to collect your ransom if I were killed, is that right? She lifted her head, eyes red but blazing. Isn't that it? He opened his mouth to argue, but nothing came out at first. Her accusation all but took his breath away. Not because she'd hit the truth of the matter, but because he was no longer certain what the truth of the matter was. When he remembered her screams, his helplessness, his feverish struggle to find her before the boar shredded her, and the images in his mind of just such a thing, of her body torn from head to foot, her face bloodied, he could not in good conscience tell her it was merely the desire to collect a purse full of silver which drove his actions. He drew a deep breath, the weight of her accusing stare heavy on him, and simply replied, If ye think all any of us cared about was the price your delivery fetches, ye know nothing. For there's no amount of silver in the world worth taking on a full-grown boar, even four of us against one of it is still too unbalanced a fight. I might have lost my brother today because of your foolishness. She recoiled as though he'd slapped her, then shook her head as if to shake off the blow. The fury drained from her eyes, then from her body, leaving her shoulders slumped in defeat. I am heartily sorry to have placed any of you in danger. And I am sorry for Fergus's wounds. You are right, I never thought of what might come of my running away. I did not believe you would come looking for me as you did. Why would we not? He scratched his head, aware that he'd likely leave Boar's blood behind but brushing aside the realization. For sure, it was the thought of losing our purse which spurred us on. I can admit that. But when you screamed, it was a different matter, lass. He sat down, suddenly near the point of exhaustion. His blood had been up higher than he could remember since his days in the army, and he knew from that experience that once the thrill of the fight passed, bone tiredness would follow. There's something ye must know about us if we're going to travel together, he murmured, looking off to where his brother's blood had spattered the ground before the wound was treated. He couldn't seem to take his eyes from it. If Fergus had died, because his brother had been foolish enough to keep the lass's attempted escape a secret. What is it? she prompted, pulling his thoughts back to the present. We're not animals. He glanced her way with a snort of derision. No matter what ye think of us, how cold or heartless ye believe we are, it simply isn't the case. We do what we do for pay I, but not because we wish to see anyone hurt or made poorer for knowing us. We aren't thieves, we aren't scavengers. And not one of us would think twice about helping a lass in need of saving, even if it came at a price. He jerked his head in his brother's direction, where Roderick double-checked the bandage around Fergus's arm. There's your proof. She looked at Fergus, her mouth pulling down at the corners. 
He is lucky he can still move it, that it's still attached, Bryce continued, seeing the effect his words had on her. He wasn't trying to rub salt in her wound so much as he was willing to do or say anything that would get her to quit her stubborn foolishness. And he'll be luckier still if the wound doesn't become infected. We'll need to keep a watch on him, be aware of any signs of fever. Help him change his bandages and clean his arm. I'll do that, she offered, all but jumping at the chance. I will watch over him if you'll allow it. And how do I know ye won't purposefully try to harm him? he asked, tilting his head to the side. I'm not an animal, either. She squared her shoulders and straightened her spine before marching off to where Fergus sat. She crouched beside him murmuring, asking questions. A far braver lass than he'd given her credit for. Chapter 13 The rest of that day was spent there in the woods, while Fergus rested and regained his strength after losing so much blood. By the time Quinn and Roderick returned with the boar's meat to roast over the fire, Fergus's colour was still wan, his voice still without the energy it normally held. But he seemed in good spirits, even joking with Quinn that he could no longer boast about being the only one to kill a boar. How he could laugh about such things so soon after what he'd narrowly escaped was beyond Alana's understanding. But then it seemed a great many things were. She kept a close watch on him, quick to offer her services whenever it seemed he might be in the least bit of discomfort. She brought him water, washed the dried blood from his skin, even offered to take his bloody tunic to the stream they'd set up camp beside. I do not mind, she insisted. You should not sleep in a tunic crusted over with blood. The lass makes a point, Bryce agreed, kneeling beside his brother. And the sooner it's washed, the sooner it will dry. And you won't have to sleep in a cold, wet tunic tonight. It was clear Fergus did not possess the strength with which to argue, so he allowed his brother's assistance in removing the ruined tunic. Alana turned her back for modesty's sake, her cheeks flushing. I'll go with ye, Bryce announced, balling up the torn tunic in one hand. I can go alone. Do you really believe we'd leave ye alone now? Bryce raised an eyebrow. She blushed worse than ever but offered no reply. There was nothing worth offering. She merely walked to the stream, its banks close enough to their camp that she might throw a stone from the campfire and hit the water. Bryce sat, arms over his bent knees, while she slipped behind a nearby grouping of spindle trees to remove her stockings in semi-privacy. He did her the favor of staring straight ahead, rather than watching her. The water of the stream was cool and fresh, the stones slippery beneath her feet. She had been bathing, and even playing in the streams which ran along either side of her ancestral home for as long as she could remember, so the threat of falling caused her no worry. With her back to the current, she bent at the waist and submerged the tunic. As if by magic, the water flowing beyond the cloth turned dark red. A lump formed in her throat. It was her fault. Entirely hers. Judging from Bryce's stare, the fact that he would not speak to her unless spoken to, he agreed with her assessment. Careful to keep her eyes on her work she murmured, I'm sorry. It was my fault, and I know it. I would never be able to forgive myself if any of you had come to harm, or worse, on my account. One of us did come to harm. She fought back the tears which prickled behind her eyes at his flat, accusatory tone. She deserved it and much worse. I know. And I am truly sorry. I wish there was a way to make you understand why I ran away. I do understand. That does not mean I agree with ye. She dared glance over at him through lowered lashes. He looked as sullen as ever. We canna do what we want to do simply because we want to do it, he continued, still gazing across the stream to the rows of lovely delicate birch trees which spanned the bank. When the lives of others are involved, we must consider them too. I'm not a soldier. She stood, the dripping tunic hanging from one hand. You accepted the task of delivering me to my fate, without my agreement. Nay, without even my foreknowledge. I do not owe any of you anything. Except gratitude for keeping you safe. He turned his gaze to her. Of course I do now. I did not know there would be such danger. He grimaced in obvious disgust. You would have, 
if you gave anything more than a mere moment's thought. If that. I didn't have time to give it thought. And now we see where acting without thinking left you. And my brother, who might well have left you in that tree to perish. He'd at least have use of both of his arms now, and a tunic with two whole sleeves instead of one hanging in shreds. Her chin quivered as she searched for something cutting with which to reply. Words failed her. She went back to her work, plunging the tunic into the water and pulling it out again, beating it against one of the rocks, scrubbing the cloth together. It was as clean as it would get but still she worked. Anything to keep him from seeing how she wept. It wasn't until after they'd eaten that Alana understood just how much humiliation she would be forced to suffer. You're what? She blinked, clutching the blanket to her chest as Bryce settled in beside her. I'm sleeping here at your side from now on. Bryce placed his saddle on the ground, arranging it in such a way that he might use it to prop up his head. Not the softest pillow, but better than nothing. You'll do no such thing, she hissed horrified. You have no say in the matter. I don't. He shook his head, lying down on his side to face her. You gave up all say in such matters, when you nearly killed yourself and my brother today. I told you how sorry I was for that. I. I remember. And how I will never try anything such as that again. I recall that as well. Why then, she demanded in despair. Because I canna trust ye, he replied. It was as simple as that. Something ached deep inside her. Something she could not name or even locate. It caused a pressure in her chest, nearly hampering her ability to breathe. She realized at that moment that she cared about what he thought of her. All right then, she whispered, turning away from him, stretching out on her side with one arm beneath her head. She no longer had a horse, which meant there was no saddle for her to use as he used his. The thought brought another, even more terrible, realization to the forefront of her mind. She closed her eyes, wishing it were not so, but knowing it was. How will I travel from now on? she asked, hoping to sound more confident than she felt. As though it mattered not. He snorted hard enough that his breath stirred her hair. You'll ride with one of us, naturally. Now that you manage to frighten off that poor mare. It'll starve in the woods, like as not. Stop it, she warned. Damn her voice for shaking. Stop what? Reminding you of what your selfishness did? I do not need to be reminded. She bolted upright to a sitting position, turning herself as she did to glare down at him with all the hatred boiling over in her heart. You told me you were not an animal, but I believe you were lying. For only an animal would insist upon tormenting me this way. It is unfair. She turned away again, flopping onto the ground with a grunt. The others sat around the fire, talking in low voices. Fergus was looking better, which filled her with untold relief. She'd never had a brother or sister, at least none who'd lived past infancy. Their faces blended together, both girl and boy since babes looked the same at that age. As she watched Fergus and thought about the man lying behind her, it was easier to put herself in Bryce's place. The way he behaved toward Fergus made it plain that he was the elder of the two. His younger brother had come under attack, and it was all because a thoughtless young woman had behaved recklessly. It wasn't easy to remove her personal concerns from her thoughts, as she tried to understand Bryce's side of things. What did he care that she would have rather died, than become Earl Remington's bride? It was none of his concern. After they had delivered her, he would go back to his life. His life included his brother. Fergus would always be a priority, as would the others. And that meant more to him than her unhappiness. These thoughts did not cause her any happiness, but they made it easier to lie with him behind her. I'm sorry, she whispered turning her head slightly so her words might reach his ears. I truly am. You're correct, I was not thinking of anyone but myself just as my unhappiness matters not to you. We've both got to live our lives when this is over, which means thinking about ourselves and those we care for. He was quiet long enough to leave her wondering if he'd even heard her. Was it possible he'd fallen asleep that quickly? 
He sighed, stirring her hair again. I never claimed that your unhappiness matters not, lass. It's merely that there's nothing I can do about it. Nothing any of us can do. It isn't our place to come in between your clan and this earl. As I said earlier. He trailed off. She held her breath in anticipation of what he might say next. As I said earlier, he repeated, there are times in which we cannot think only of ourselves. She blinked. What did he mean? Did he mean he'd rather not deliver her, knowing what it meant for her to marry this total stranger? Or simply that she ought to consider her clan, and not only herself? If it was the latter, there was less than no chance of her ever doing so. My clan cares nothing for me, and as far as I am concerned, I am a Stuart in name only. Douglas Stuart all but cursed the day I was born prior to my leaving his unhappy household. Being away from him, is the only uplifting point of this. She turned her head again, whispering over her shoulder, do not ask me to do what I'm doing for their sake, for I cannot force myself into believing something which brings only pain. He snorted softly. I didn't mean that lass. Her heart soared, when all had seemed lost only moments earlier. He did care. He did not wish to deliver her. While that wouldn't stop him from performing his duty, after all he was not her only escort, it meant he was more sympathetic than he'd let on. This was a good sign. She did not respond, choosing instead to wriggle slightly as though she were adjusting herself for comfort's sake. What are you doing? he muttered. Attempting to make myself comfortable enough to fall asleep. If you keep speaking, I won't be able to do so. She wriggled again, grunting softly as she did. And if you insist on moving so, I will never be able to do so. You might move away then and give me greater space. I will not disturb you then. He snickered. So you might believe. I can tell you, it wouldn't be so. Not to mention, I intend to give you as little space as possible for the duration of our journey. She wriggled again, moving closer to him, and he growled. She let out an exasperated sigh. I did not invite you to join me. It was a blessing that he couldn't see her face, for it burned as though she'd lowered it to the fire. She would never have imagined using her body to tempt a man, especially not a man such as the one behind her. He was rough course a stranger. A stranger who had saved her life. It mattered not. He was still a man, with whom she was unfamiliar. His chuckle was dark, knowing, and it made her cheeks burn hotter than ever. Aye, but never has there been a lass unhappy after having done so, he murmured, humor plain in his voice. I am not one of those, she murmured, torn between gladness at his turn in humor and humiliation. I merely wish to get enough sleep before the sun rises. As do I. I bid you good night then. She closed her eyes with a smile, the plan on her mind. It would mean turning her back on everything she'd ever learned about the behavior of young women such as herself. One who'd been raised well, if not lovingly, at least with all attempts made at preserving chastity. What good was chastity when it meant being sold in marriage? She moved again, shifting her hips slightly and Bryce groaned without uttering a word. Her smile widened a bit just before she fell asleep. Chapter 14 it was due to be a long, miserable night. Bryce deserved no better, after all, it had been his idea to sleep at her side. No matter how many oaths she swore or tears she shed, he trusted her no farther than he might throw her. He'd had no inkling of how alluring she would prove to be. It was his fault for being weak. Not hers. Even so, would that she might stop tempting him by moving as she did. He was intensely aware of her, lying with their bodies nearly touching. The swell of her hip beneath the blanket. The curve of her buttocks as she all but rubbed against him. He'd nearly jumped from his skin the first time she attempted that. She was warm. Pleasant. He'd forgotten how pleasant it could be to sleep alongside another body, even though there was no chance of touching that body. Sweet smelling too, which seemed to defy logic. How could she smell so pleasant, after engaging in the same activities as the men? It was part of her, he supposed, 
the lingering scent of heather and roses. Or her kirtle had been washed in fragrant water, he reminded himself. No sense in thinking over much on it. There was nothing unique about the lass. She was merely a female, the same as any other, and she enjoyed carrying the scent of flowers on her clothing. And in her hair. The firelight turned it to gold, made it appear to shine. It all but pleaded to be touched. He ground his teeth together, clenching his hands into tight fists. He'd roll onto his back with his hands beneath him if he had to. Anything to keep from reaching for her. She sighed in her sleep, disrupting the even flow of her soft breathing. The side of her throat pulsed with her steady heartbeat. He wondered what it would be like to touch. He rolled to the other side, slamming his eyes shut. For both their sakes. Good thing the lass could not read his thoughts for she might reach out and slap him. If sleeping beside him had caused her any strain, it did not show on her face or in her voice as she checked the condition of Fergus's arm the following morning. How are ye feeling today? she asked in a gentle voice while unwinding the bandage. Seeing as I nearly lost an arm fairly well. He was grinning when he said it. Alana grinned in return. Were ye able to sleep? I called and stop myself, he admitted. Aye, well, I suppose that has to do with losing blood, she reasoned. But rest is important. I'm glad the pain from the wound did not keep ye awake. I was able to secure a number of tinctures from a healer and the instructions on how to create them, Roderick explained, as he handed Fergus a cup of water with a few drops of tincture. I'm afraid I'm not nearly as skilled as the healer herself, but my wife was able to brew a fresh batch before our departure. I don't need it. Fergus shook his head. It will make the ride easier for ye, Bryce argued. I said I do not need it. Alana knelt beside him, a frown pulling at the corners of her mouth. The reason you do not feel as though you need it is because you haven't moved it much this morning, and you drank the tincture last night. Once we move out, the pain will return, and it will take time for the tincture to do its job after that. Do you see what I mean? He grumbled, turning his face slightly away from hers. Aye. Will you drink then? He didn't answer, choosing to reach for the cup instead. Roderick and Bryce exchanged grins as Fergus drank the contents in a single gulp. She had a way about her, it seemed. By rights, Fergus should have resented her for leading him into mortal danger. He should hardly have smiled at her, laughed with her, and certainly could not have been blamed if he'd told her to go to hell for urging him to drink something for his pain. They seem to be getting on well, Quinn remarked as Bryce helped saddle the horses. Aye, it seems, he agreed, unwilling to commit himself either way. There was no mistaking the tinge of regret in his friend's voice, as though the lad mistook friendliness for something more. Then again, he'd already allowed Alana to lead his thoughts astray with a few smiles. It was for the best that he believed her out of his reach. After all, she was to be another man's bride. What say you? she asked, wiping her hands on her kirtle as she rose. Bryce hadn't overheard the conversation, and so had no knowledge of what Alana spoke of. Fergus looked sceptical. I don't like the idea. It makes the most sense, Roderick said, taking Alana's part. Your arm should be allowed to rest. I can ride with one hand. Alana assisted in placing the wounded arm in the sling Roderick had fashioned from Fergus's ruined sleeve. Why would you want to, when there is someone more than able to assist you? It is the very least I can do. You've done quite enough so far. Nonsense, she replied with a shake of her head, her jaw set in a firm line. He may not have known her well, but Bryce recognized her expression for what it was. There would be no winning an argument against her. What is it the two of you are, are on about? he asked as he finished with the last saddle. She insists on riding with me. Nay, on doing the riding for me, while I sit behind her, Fergus grumbled. Bryce frowned, then asked himself why he did so. It only made sense, the lass had no horse to ride, and Fergus had the use of only one hand. Why should she not do the riding for him? Besides, it would mean her staying with the group. No chance of running away with Fergus riding behind her, an arm about her waist. 
Something about the thought sickened him, and he did not know why. It makes sense. The more time you waste in arguing, the more time we waste when we might be making progress. We're already behind. With that, he took the reins of his horse and mounted, bringing the animal about until its nose pointed toward the road. Are we ready to leave then? Roderick chuckled as he mounted his horse. It seems the final word has been spoken then. I only wish to avoid losing more time, Bryce insisted. I naturally, Roderick said with a smile. I agree with ye. No need to argue with me. I'm not never mind. Bryce tapped his heels to the gelding sides and it took off at an easy trot in response. He did not look to see whether any of his party were behind him, as it mattered little at that moment. So long as he did not have to see his brother's arm about the lass's waist. Something about the very image perturbed him more than he felt comfortable admitting. Even to himself. Chapter 15 Perhaps it wasn't fair. This thought struck her more than once as they rode through the day, Fergus behind her with his good arm snug around her waist. Perhaps it wasn't fair for her to use his injury, which she had a hand in causing, as a way to get under his brother's skin. Perhaps it wasn't fair to feign innocence, to pretend as though she meant only to be of service. There had been no mistaking Bryce's interest in her the night before, lying next to each other as they had. The seed had been planted. It needed only water and sunlight and careful tending to grow into something much larger. A pang of fear struck her heart. Could she manage something much larger? She had no experience with men. The previous night had marked the first in which she'd slept beside one of them. Had she not been so thoroughly fatigued, she might have spent half the night fretting over his nearness. Exhaustion had proven itself a blessing then. No, she knew nothing of men. But she recognized jealousy when she saw it, and Bryce was jealous of the way she rode with his brother. Fergus on the other hand, was either too far gone to notice, thanks to the tincture, or simply did not care that his brother rode several lengths ahead of the rest. The day was grey, thick with clouds and considerably cooler than the day before had been. She shivered involuntarily when a breeze blew past. Are you chilled lass? Fergus asked. The wind must have blown his question in Bryce's direction, for his back stiffened not a moment later. Aye, she admitted, though I'm certain it would be worse were you not behind me. I'm grateful for your warmth. Was it her imagination, or did Bryce let out something like a bark? It could have been a laugh, a rather bitter one if so. Ye had both better make certain that warmth isn't fever, he called back over his shoulder. A fair point. Alana looked over her shoulder, up into Fergus's face. There was no flush on his cheeks, his eyes did not shine as though he were in the grip of fever. Just the same, she had to be certain. Whoa, she murmured, pulling the gelding to a halt. Quinn rode up beside them. Why do you stop? She held up a finger to signal his silence, then bade Fergus lower his head slightly. She pressed her lips to his forehead, feeling for warmth. Quinn gasped. Even Fergus seemed taken aback. It is a much better method of testing whether a person is feverish, she explained, facing forward once again. The mouth is far more sensitive than the hand. Bryce was glaring in their direction, having stopped when he noticed they'd come to a halt. And, he demanded. And your brother is fine? She bit the side of her tongue, straining to hold back her laughter. Quinn's jaw was all but trailing on the ground, Roderick merely looked pleased to hear that Fergus was doing well, but Bryce looked fit to strangle someone. Fergus was beyond the point of noticing. You seem to know quite a lot about healing and taking care of others, he noted. His arm tightened about her waist, and she was indeed glad for the extra warmth against her chilled skin, as another gust of air blew past them. I had hoped to train with a healer, she admitted. Healing has always held an interest for me. What prevented you from doing so? Roderick asked, bringing his sleek black horse in step beside her. She sighed. My father did not wish it so. His daughter would not heal the sick, for that would mean coming into contact with sick people. I suppose it makes sense in some ways, though I certainly do not share his opinion. 
It seems unlike Yi to simply give in to his wishes, Quinn pointed out. I hope I'm not overstepping my boundaries by saying so. Not at all, she assured him. He seemed like a nice enough lad, but rough at the edges. He tried so hard to be gentle and sweet for her sake. And there is truth in your words. I did go against his wishes at first. And? Fergus asked. And I did not sit without pain for a week. The men chuckled, likely remembering lashings they'd taken in childhood, she supposed they were no better behaved as children than as men, and likely much worse, but she did not share in their mirth. For she remembered the pain, the humiliation as each stroke of the leather strap made contact with her skin. She remembered the sound of it cracking against her body, the blood which had pooled in her mouth and trickled down her chin, as she bit her lip to stay her agonized cries. There was a moment that day, in the midst of her beating, when she'd wondered if he worked as hard as he did simply to get a reaction from her. When she hadn't cried out or begged for him to stop, she'd only enraged him further. She'd borne the bruises for a fortnight. Bryce did not laugh, but then he pretended as though he did not hear a word being spoken behind him. He might understand, she thought. If he was speaking to her. She might have explained it to him, recounted the humiliation for the first time. He would not have laughed. But he was too far away. There had to be a way to bring him back to her. The idea was not to repel him, but rather to pull him in. If she was to do what she planned and do it successfully, she had to place herself in his good graces. Tell me about you and Bryce, she suggested, looking up at Fergus. What do you want to know? Why did you join the army, she asked. He told me, you did not wish to live in the village for the rest of your life. He did, did he? Fergus grinned. Aye, he would. This sparked her interest, as it was not what she'd expected to hear. Oh. Was there another reason? I was the one who didn't wish to remain there, he explained. Do not get me wrong, neither of us was ever cut out to be a cobbler. I canna imagine sitting at the bench from sun up until sunset, and beyond. I'd rather be hanged truth be told. I cannot imagine either of you engaged in such a vocation, she admitted. They both looked as though they'd spent their entire lives out of doors. I approached my father, with the intention of joining the army. He wouldn't hear of it. Why not? You're the younger son, are you not? I. Did he not see the honor in serving his king? Fergus bristled at this. Alana blushed. I did not mean to insult him. He served his king, Fergus explained. Which was why he did not wish either of his sons to do so. Why not? She regretted the question when a cloud seemed to pass over his face. He took his time with replying. He saw many things. Terrible things. I never knew him as a younger man, you can, but I always heard he was changed when he came back. Older, haunted about the eyes. Small noises made him jump more than they should have. He loathed the sight of blood. She clicked her tongue in sympathy. I'm sorry. So when I announced my wish to join up, he was against it. Putting it gently. It was a terrible row, lasted for days. I'd never heard my father raise his voice prior to that. There were times when I wondered if it were even possible for him to do so, since he never had. And his sons gave him more than enough reason to do so over the years. Alana smiled. I would wager on it. Och how he bellowed, Fergus murmured half lost in memory. Mother wept, told me I was going to tear the family to pieces thanks to sheer stubbornness. I did not understand it, not all of it. Now that I've been through some of what he went through, and know somewhat of all he wished to spare me from, I see why he reacted as he did. What was the alternative, she asked. Did your family not have a responsibility to send one of its sons to the army? He'd rather I live with the priests, Fergus snarled, spitting on the ground as if to curse the very idea. Alana fought against the laughter which bubbled up in her throat. The church she choked. I. A silly idea, I know. He grinned. It's all right, lass. Laugh if you like. I would if I were ye. What decided him then, 
she asked, since he had certainly fought in the war. Bryce? He nodded in his brother's direction. He promised to look after me, to ensure no harm would come to me. It was the only way either of our parents would consent. I would either run off on my own, they both knew it, or they would send him along with me and hope for the best. They could hardly keep the both of us locked away, Yi Ten. They knew they were beaten, after all, once the two of us joined up on anything we managed to get our way. He did not have to go, Alana mused aloud, staring ahead. He might have claimed he needed to stay behind, learn his craft as the eldest son. Aye. Men he did, Fergus agreed. Bryce did not. He knew how important it was to me that I go, and as I said before, he did not wish to follow our father's path. In a way, it worked out well for the both of us. And did he make good on his word, she asked. Did he watch over ye? He let out a soft laugh. I'm alive to tell the tale thanks to him. He'd never agree with me, Yi Ten, always insisting he had nothing to do with both of us making it out in one piece. But I know he played a role in my safety on the field of battle. A strange mixture of emotions stirred in Alana's heart, as she stared at the broad back and shoulders of the man Fergus spoke. He had risked greatly to protect his brother. Perhaps it was foolish of him to do so. Perhaps he had given up a life of, if not comfort, at least security and safety. He'd likely broken his parents' hearts as well. What a strange man he was. Not nearly as easy to understand as she'd first assumed. Chapter 16 Alana stretched, groaning slightly as her thighs protested the movement. So, Roderick asked, frowning in sympathy as he finished skinning the last of the rabbits he and Quinn had snared. You might say that, she grumbled, wincing as she tried to walk the short distance to where Quinn had set up the fire for their evening meal. I'm not accustomed to riding day after day, as you lot. You've made a good show of it so far, he offered, trying to be friendly. She appreciated his effort, all of their efforts. None of them needed to be kind to her, and in fact, could just as easily have treated her as a captive after her second escape attempt. She was slow to lower herself to the ground, gritting her teeth as her legs and backside rejected any such idea, while Bryce returned from watering the horses, a saddle in each hand. She made a show of wincing and groaning as she finished lowering herself, hoping to play upon his sympathy. He glanced over at her, frowning, but did not say a word. It was enough to make her want to scream. If anything were to happen, it had to happen soon. They would reach Carlisle, Indiana two days' time. Her stomach turned at the thought. Only two days. She was uncertain whether the notion made her want to cry or vomit. Perhaps both, together. Two days until she'd meet her intended. Unless she enticed another man, to the point where he would ruin her purity. What then? She supposed, she would have to marry Bryce instead of Earl Remington. Unless Bryce rejected her, which she wasn't certain would be an altogether terrible turn of events. She did not wish to tie her life to his, did not wish to travel hither and yon. When the time came, she would want a home, a husband, a family. Only not with a man she hadn't met prior to their betrothal, no matter how wealthy he was or how comfortable he could make her. No matter how comfortable, a cage was still a cage. If anything, she reasoned, Bryce's decision to sleep by her side made the task easier. He'd already struggled with himself the night before. Perhaps he would lose the struggle once she put her mind to tempting him, rather than simply toying about and feigning innocence. The sun had set, the sky turning a deep purple which would soon fade to black. She turned her face upward, admiring the stars which had already begun to sparkle like jewels, just visible between the tops of the pine trees which surrounded the five weary travellers. The rich scent of pine and fresh earth was intoxicating. Alana breathed deep, filling her lungs with the air, hoping to clear her troubled thoughts the guilt which nagged at the back of her mind. Are you well lass? Bryce finally acknowledged her, taking a seat at her side, though he left a good deal of space between them. Saw from riding. She shrugged. I'm uncertain, how the lot of you manage it every day. We're far better accustomed to it than ye. He nodded toward his brother, 
who sat opposite them. How is he? The wound does not appear to be festering, she reported, having checked its condition after they'd decided where to make camp for the evening. And he appears to be in good spirits, does he not? You would know better than I, he replied with an edge in his voice. So he was still jealous then. It struck her as odd, since Bryce did not seem the type to allow for such base emotions. He'd struck her as stoic, as though he held much of life at arm's length. Would you rather have allowed him to ride on his own today, with one arm in a sling, she challenged. Nay, I would rather he not have been wounded at all. And you're still on about that, she accused with a scowl. His eyes narrowed. Forgive me if I find it difficult to excuse behavior, which left my brother unable to ride. In case you hadn't noticed lass, a great deal of our lives has to do with being able to take care of ourselves. That means being able to ride on one's own. She wished most fervently that he might be a bit more agreeable. It was nearly impossible to remember the task at hand, while he was all but begging her to slap him. Instead of continuing to argue, which would only make things worse, she turned her attention to Roderick and Quinn as they set the rabbits to roast over the fire. Her mouth watered when the scent reached her nose, mixing with the pine and the soil and the sweet fragrant breeze. If it weren't for their destination and the saddle sores which all but brought tears to her eyes, she might have enjoyed herself. She shifted slightly in hopes of easing the smarting of her backside, grimacing as she did. Bryce let out a grunt. It's truly bothering you is it not? He asked, sounding much kinder than he had before. Aye. It is, she admitted, blushing. It was difficult to maintain one's dignity, when the topic was so plainly undignified. You might take some of the tincture Fergus has been drinking, he suggested. I'm certain he wouldn't begrudge you a sip or two, just to make you more comfortable. She watched Fergus, laughing and joking with the others. Nay. I want him to have all of it, as much as he needs. He deserves it far more than I do. He's a bit of a hero to you then? The abrupt change in his tone did not escape her notice. She turned her head slightly to the side to look at him. His face was blank as he watched his friends. But his hands were a different matter. They rested on his thighs clenched into fists. All of ye are heroes to me, she admitted, blushing. There was no pretense in her admission, no ulterior motive. We're no longer the enemy. I'd be no more than an ungrateful wretch if I still thought of ye as such. A smile played on his lips. That's no answer. She laughed in spite of herself at how easy it was for him to read her, and he laughed as well. Fair enough. You make nothing easy. Nor do ye, lass. Nor do ye. Is this still necessary? She muttered, putting on a show of resentment when Bryce joined her as he had the night before. I have no desire to run from ye any longer. I've learned my lesson. I as have I, he agreed, making up the bed beside her nonetheless. Which is why I'm sleeping at your side. She rolled her eyes, huffing and puffing, all while glowing with satisfaction inside. He made it almost too easy. She rolled onto her back, hands folded over her stomach as Bryce settled in. Roderick, Fergus and Quinn were seated around the fire, as they'd been the night before, with Quinn agreeing to take the first watch. Fergus felt himself up to the task of keeping watch too, lessening the burden on the others. They were nearby, yet far enough away that Alana was confident her conversation and whatever else might occur, would not be overheard. She was downwind from them, the fire smoke wafting her way. It was not an unpleasant odour, especially when it meant her words would be carried away from them. I wish there was something to do about your snoring, for you snored in my ear all last night, she informed Bryce as he made himself comfortable. Once again, he took the saddle for himself, while she used her bundle of clothing as a pillow. He snorted. Truly. You seem to sleep deeply every time I looked upon ye. You watch me sleep, she asked, raising an eyebrow. I must admit, I'm uncertain as to how I feel about that. It meant nothing, he was quick to assure her, nearly tripping over his tongue in haste. She bit the inside of her mouth to conceal her smile. Oh. It meant nothing then? 
Am I that unpleasing that you did not wish to be near me then? I did not say that. So you did enjoy being near me? He grunted before swearing under his breath. There's no reasoning with ye. Everything turns into an argument. Because you make it so. I take offense to that, he whispered, propping himself up on one elbow and looking down at her with eyes narrowed. I'll have you know I'm normally a very agreeable man. Ask any of the others. I'm the best humored of all of us. I have yet to see evidence of any such thing, she hissed. Because you're the sort of lass who could make a deacon take to drinking, he snarled, flopping down on his back. It was so easy to forget that she was supposed to be enticing him, encouraging him to take liberties with her. How was it that they always managed to fall into the same arguing and sniping at each other? She took a few deep breaths to calm herself before whispering, I admit I was having a bit of fun with ye. I noticed, he muttered staring up at the stars. I apologize. Truly. He let out a grunt. You're forgiven. But I don't enjoy feeling like a prisoner, she added. Why must ye insist on having the last word? He turned his head, looking at her as she looked at him. He was rather handsome, she was surprised to realize. He had a rather nice way about him. Fine features, crinkles around the corners of his hazel eyes which told her he laughed quite a bit. She forgot what she was going to say. Because you insist on being unpleasant, he replied on her behalf. You're unhappy, and you wish to take that out on others. You certainly do know me well. It isn't difficult. She turned her face back toward the sky, despairing at the turn of events. All she seemed able to do was push him further away, rather than drawing him in as she needed to do. I have not known many people, she whispered. I had a friend. The daughter of our cook. My nurse as well, and I will never see either of them again. But that is as far as my interactions with others have gone for most of my life you see. That is not an excuse for being so difficult to get along with. He rolled onto his side again, squinting at her as he had before. Besides, you seem to get along wonderfully with the others today. Laughing and talking. Not a single harsh word reached my ears. She looked at him, her eyes widening in what she hoped was an enticing manner. I do not wish for it to be this way. Arguing with you, that is. His forehead creased when he frowned. Why do you do it then? She clenched her hands tightly, waiting until the sharp retort which begged to be voiced wasn't so near her mouth before replying. I'm unsure. I've never known men before now. I've never known what it feels like to. She averted her eyes, both out of artifice and genuine embarrassment. Was she going about things the right way? There was no telling for she'd never attempted anything like this before. He waited a moment before prompting. What it feels like to what? She shrugged, her fingers now playing with the edge of her blanket, her eyes still averted. To not be able to speak what's truly on my mind. Why can you not? What stops you? She shook her head, scrambling to her feet. I need a moment to myself, she whispered, stumbling through the darkness, away from the fire. You're not going anywhere alone, and you know it, he reminded her as he charged along in her wake. He was following her. This was good. She wiped her sweaty palms on her kirtle, before running her arm across her forehead where sweat had begun to spring up as well. Her nerves were frayed, her mind racing. I cannot, Bryce. I cannot. Don't you see? She came to a stop between two pines, the dry needles crunching beneath her feet. After what occurred yesterday with the boar, I cannot. Cannot what? He took her shoulder in his much larger, stronger hand, turning her to face him. They were inches apart, and his breath was hot on her face as he looked down at her, waiting for a response. The moon was behind his head, casting his face in shadow. What was he thinking? If only she could read his expression. She swallowed back the panic rising in her throat. I cannot be so near ye without wanting to. She reached for him then, touching her palm to the side of his face. 
His whiskers were softer than they appeared, his skin warm. Bryce? She lowered her eyes, focusing her gaze on his lips. They were rather nice lips. Full smooth. What would they feel like against hers? A stunning realization made itself plain to her. She would not mind finding out. In fact she wanted to know, just as she wanted to know what his thick arms felt like around her. Before she knew it, she was on tiptoe, straining to reach his mouth with her own as her eyes began to close. Alana. He hooked a finger beneath her chin and held her in place. Look at me. I am looking at you, she breathed, wondering all the while what she was doing wrong. Why was he not responding favorably? He looked away, back toward the fire as if to assure himself of their privacy. When he returned his attention to her, he shifted slightly so she might see his face better. His gaze was hard, not full of passion as she'd hoped. You know this cannot be. There was a sickening sensation in her stomach, as though she were falling from a great height. Why can it not be? We're here now and you, you saved my life and I? Just stop it lass. He took a step back. You're making a mistake, thinking along these lines. You do not know what it is you're playing at. Despair threatened to overwhelm her. Only digging her nails into her palms kept her focused as she stared at him. I only know I want you Bryce. I'm not playing at anything. I believe ye are, even if ye aren't aware of it, he murmured. Now unless ye have need to relieve yourself, I think it's best that we return and go to sleep. There are still two days of travel ahead, and we'll need to be sharp. She blinked, unable to believe her golden chance had slipped away so easily. One moment, she'd been all but certain of victory. The next. On the verge of hot, angry tears. You do not want me then, she whispered, willing herself not to cry. Damn it all, why did he have such an effect on her? And why did she have to choose the wrong man? Out of the three unmarried escorts, she'd fixed her attention on the one who did not want her. He surprised her by chuckling. Oh lass, he murmured, running a hand over the back of his neck as he bowed his head. You've no idea. What does that mean, she demanded. It means we ought to get back. Now? Before any of the others come looking for us. He stepped aside as if to leave room for her to pass. She refused to look at him as she marched back to their makeshift beds, turning her back to him as she stretched out on the blanket. It was not lost on her that he moved slightly farther away, before settling in again. Chapter 17 That had been close. Too close. Bryce had come nearer than he ever had to making a terrible decision, and it would have been so easy to do. Just the two of them, in the darkness, protected from the view of the others by the towering pines. With a thick layer of needles on the ground, which they might have sunk to before desire took its terrible toll. The image alone was enough to stir his loins. He turned his back to her, and willed the surge of desire away, wishing on everything he held dear that the lass wasn't so tempting. Perhaps it was the way she got his blood up whenever they argued. It was easy for her to get his blood up in other ways then. And she certainly had. She was using him. He was well aware. If he took her virtue, she would no longer be of any value to her intended. He would no longer want her in his bed if she'd been another man's. Even once. Ridiculous, really, and he had always believed so. Though he wasn't certain of how he'd behave if he knew his intended bride had belonged to another man before him. None of it mattered, especially the reason behind her actions because he'd seen the attempt for what it was and had refused her though every part of his being, body and soul, had urged him to take her up on it. What did he care why she'd all but thrown herself into his arms? Nothing would come of it. He did not take it to heart either, as the lass was clearly stricken to her core at the thought of marrying this earl. She must have been greatly troubled by it, if she was willing to give herself to another man to prevent its taking place. And she claimed he didn't want her. How he'd managed to avoid laughing at the accusation was a bit of a miracle, or at least a testament to his self-control. 
which he had just used in order to avoid temptation only moments earlier. Good thing she had given up when she had. If she'd pressed him again, he might not have been so strong. It was Alana's turn to brood the following day. He had expected as much. She wouldn't meet his eyes for any reason, ducking her head and muttering in reply to anything he said. If the others questioned this, they did not show it. He supposed they thought nothing of it, since he and the lass had hardly gotten along for more than a few minutes at a stretch up to that point. I would like to wash out the bandages before we leave, she announced as the men put out what was left of the fire and saddled the horses. She had already tended to Fergus's arm, which looked better every time Bryce saw it unbandaged. Alana had replaced the linen and was holding the stained strips in one hand. Of course. Roderick moved as though to accompany her through the line of pines to the stream just beyond, but Bryce held up a hand to halt him. Alana's already creamy complexion went a bit paler. Roderick can accompany me if he wishes, she murmured, looking down at the bandages as though they fascinated her. I wish to wash my face and hands after dirtying them, Bryce insisted, having smeared himself with ashes while putting the fire out. He led the way without giving her the chance to argue the point. There was something they needed to put straight between them, and they had to be alone when they did. Why he felt the need to explain things to her was beyond his understanding, for she did not need or even deserve an explanation. After all, he owed her nothing. She was the one who'd attempted to lure him into compromising her. He'd merely done the thinking for them both. She made a point of ignoring him as she made her way down the rocky bank which led to the water's edge, stepping carefully over sharp jagged rocks, which might have been uncovered when spring's heavy rains had washed away the soil. Even though she would not deign to look at him, he hovered close by in case she stumbled. He cursed himself as he did so, reminded himself of her being a grown woman who insisted upon behaving like a child. The memory of her wide, questioning eyes and the scent of her hair and skin as she'd strained upward for a kiss, her palm warm on his cheek, was enough to let him forget what an obstinate creature she could be. It was a good thing he had a cold stream in which to dunk his face, which he did in hopes of cooling his inflamed thoughts. It was impossible to forget how close he'd come to giving in. She was a damned pleasant thing to look at, after all, and not a man alive would blame him except for Earl Remington. When he raised his face, snapping his head back to send his hair away from his eyes, he caught her looking at him over her shoulder. Yes, he asked, wiping his eyes with his tunic. Was there something you wished to say? What would there be to say, she asked, turning away from him again. He'd caught the flush of her cheeks just before she did. I must admit, lass, I'm at a loss for what you would say, he admitted, standing. I know what I wish to say, however. I'm not altogether certain I wish to hear it, she murmured, plunging the bandages into the rushing water. I believe ye need to. He watched her work, the early morning sunlight making her blonde braid gleam, her shoulders moving beneath the homespun kirtle she wore. Someone had dyed it a fine shade of blue, someone who must have loved her enough to make the effort to do so. He took the chance of stepping closer, careful not to alarm her until he was at her side. I will not be telling the others of what happened last night. It isn't the sort of thing a man discusses with his friends. She snorted, still looking away. I would think it would be just the sort of thing you would brag about. A willing lass throwing herself at you, only for you to reject her. For one most would call me daft for doing so, he informed her with a rueful smile which she could not see. For another, I would not wish to embarrass you that way. No. You've done a fair enough job of that yourself. I didn't tell you to try such a thing, he reminded her, anger creeping into his voice. Why take pains to be a kind person when this was the thanks he received? It was ye who embarrassed yourself, if anyone. She shot up like a bolt, sodden bandages in both hands. How dare you? I only speak the truth, he replied, standing his ground in spite of the fury he'd inspired. She raised her arm in a flash, pulling back as if to strike him. He caught her wrist as her hand swung toward his face, stopping her just as she was about to make contact. 
The bandages she held in her right hand were all that hit his face. Her attempt at wrenching away her wrist was fruitless, as his grip was clearly tighter than she'd anticipated. She'd gone too far and she knew it. Fear was written plainly on her face. He pulled her to him, bending her arm behind her back. Neither of them said a word as they stood there, bodies pressed together. He was aware of so many things, the way her lips parted slightly, her breath sweet and warm. The stray bits of hair which hung around her face, the breeze gently blowing them toward him. A slight fleck of gold in her left eye piercing the blue. Her heart beat like mad, pounding as a drum against his chest. Echoing the rhythm of his own. He was certain everything around them had stopped. The birds no longer sang, the squirrels and rabbits no longer ran to and from among the pines. Even the bubbling stream halted its progress, the water lying still over the smooth stones. All that was left, all that mattered, was her warm body against his, her eyes moving over his face as though to understand him. Would that she might, for he couldn't understand himself. The longing she stirred in him, something he hadn't understood until that moment, something beyond physical need. Something deeper. Dangerous. The danger was what loosened his hand, releasing her. It took every bit of strength in him to walk away from her. We'll be leaving shortly, he grunted, not daring to turn back. He wasn't certain he'd want to see her expression. Chapter 18 Alana rode with Fergus against her back, and the way he and Quinn called back and forth to each other told her he was in high spirits. It did her heart good to know it, and meant one less thing for her to fret over. There was already more than enough. Her right wrist still smarted somewhat thanks to Bryce's rough handling. She hadn't felt it at the time. There had been no feeling anything but his unyielding chest and his arm about her. None of them commented on her silence. Likely they supposed she was more anxious and sullen the closer they came to the Earl's land. Are we in England yet? she asked at one point, roughly halfway through the morning. Her thighs were already sore, and her hands chapped and aching thanks to the rains, and there was still nearly an entire day to go. Her misery seemed never-ending. I, Roderick replied. I believe we crossed the border this morning. We ought to come to a village soon, and we'll be certain then. They hadn't seen a village yet, not since riding through the one just outside Stuart territory. The road they travelled had been nearly empty for the duration of the journey. It only just occurred to Alana then, at that very moment, that the men had deliberately avoided anywhere she might have the chance to blend in with villagers and escape. The realization might have sent her into a fit of rage when they first met. Now though, riding along with Fergus, the memory of Bryce's warmth and strength still fresh in her mind, she could only smile in spite of herself. They had foreseen her attempted escape from the first. Bryce rode ahead of them beside Roderick. Only once every so often did he turn back to look at her, though she would have guessed his intent was to check on his brother. They had come so close to something. Closer than they'd come before. She doubted they could have done much there in the open, in the daylight, with the rest of the group awaiting their return, but it was still promising. On the rare occasion that their eyes met, a silent knowing passed between them. The presence of something the others were unaware of, something which bound the two of them together. She might still be able to tempt him. The thought of it sent a thrill through her, making her tremble slightly. She'd been afraid before, uncertain, not knowing whether she even wanted to be that close to him, or how his nearness would make her feel. She knew now. It made her feel, alive. Aware, in a way she'd never been before. As though something had awoken after lying dormant. This time, she would be successful. There would be no other opportunity. Remembering the breathless anticipation of their near kiss between the two pines, she thought she might even enjoy it. Her gaze fell on him as they rode, he and Roderick were having a quiet conversation while their horses progressed down the rather narrow section of road, and another thought struck her. Left her with greater hope than ever before. He did want her. It was plain as day how much he did. He'd been all but ready to kiss her, by the stream, perhaps more than that had there been the opportunity. The knowledge bolstered her courage, 
and she suddenly felt a great deal more cheerful as they began their journey through English soil. It would be best to take a room at the inn tonight. Roderick looked about the village, which was slowly beginning to take shape around them, buildings appearing on both sides of the widened road. What makes you say that? A room? That would spoil her plans. Alana had spent the day's ride plotting and imagining exactly how to lure Bryce into her arms, and none of those imaginings had involved a room. We shall reach Earl Remington's castle tomorrow, he informed her, a bit of a rueful smile touching his lips. You'll want to be well rested, and as clean and presentable as possible, lass. I. She fixed her gaze upon the space between the gelding's ears, refusing to look elsewhere as she absorbed this bit of news. It did make sense for her to spend time washing and grooming herself. Perhaps the inn would allow for the use of a wash tub, where she might clean her hair and rest her aching muscles in hot water. All for a man she had no desire to meet, much less marry. The village was a thriving one, by all appearances. They passed three buildings in the process of being constructed as they rode into the heart of the place, where the road they travelled crossed another wide, bustling thoroughfare. Alana's eyes bulged at the sight of people jostling one another out of the way, of teams of horses and livestock being driven down the centre of the road, while single riders and horse-drawn carts attempted to navigate at the same time. The stench was palpable, enough to make her raise an arm to cover her nose. Rather strong, is it not? Fergus asked with a grunt of disgust. You become accustomed to it, when you make a village your home. So this is how it smelled all the time for you, she asked. It was little wonder he'd want so badly to leave, if so. I perhaps not as woeful, as our village was not as large as this. Summer was worst. And the flies everywhere. He shuddered. As I say, a body grows accustomed. I suppose that's the way of life. We adjust to things, until they're no longer uncomfortable. She snickered to herself at his choice of words. Were they deliberate? Was he trying to offer reassurance? That her life might not be such a struggle, if only she would allow herself to grow accustomed? Or was she merely imagining things? Sitting at the corner of two intersecting trails which jutted off of the main road, was what could only be an inn. Two floors thatch-roofed, with windows lining the front which would allow a guest a view of the people and animals below. I shall see about securing rooms for us, Roderick offered dismounting. Quinn went along with him, leaving Bryce. Are ye certain we shouldn't all go? Bryce asked, frowning. Nay, she could need protecting, Roderick grunted, nodding in her direction. She sensed the anxiety and turned to Fergus. What is the trouble? We're in England, lass, he murmured, eyes moving back and forth. The English do not take well to the Scots, especially Highlanders. I'm half English, she replied with greater confidence than she felt. Aye, but not by the looks of ye. We might do well to hang a sign from your neck though, if it would make you feel better. All right, he grumbled seeing his point. There was no way to tell by looking at a person whether they were English, but the rough wild appearance of her escorts spoke of their origins. And, knowing how the English felt about men such as they, she now noticed the cold and sometimes outright hostile expressions on the faces of those passing their horses. Bryce only seemed to be at ease, anyone who knew him even as little as she would see how he tensed, ready to fight should need to arise. She could hardly look at him, suddenly overcome by nerves. What was wrong with her? What had changed so abruptly? He was still Bryce. Just as he'd always been, with a talent for being disagreeable. Why did the momentary meeting of their eyes make her cheeks flush so? Why did her hands tremble? Do you have any pain? he asked Fergus, pointedly ignoring her. She did not pay any mind, and was in fact grateful for the distraction. Nary a bit, Fergus assured him. I've suffered much worse of which you're well aware. Worse than this? Alana asked, raising a skeptical eyebrow. I. I once took a sword to my side. I would show you the scar, but it would mean being rather immodest. His eyes twinkled. I assume this was during the war. Nay, twas a lass I jilted. How she managed to heft the sword is still a mystery. 
She laughed along with him. Bryce, however, did not see the humor. It was no laughing matter at the time, he reminded Fergus. To his credit, Fergus contained himself. Aye, you're right at that. Such a wound would have sent me home, were the war not already drawing to an end and my time nearly up. But that was true pain, I'll tell ye. And I had not the services of a lovely lass, such as yourself, to cheer me. Ilana smiled at the compliment, though the fact of her playing a part in his being wounded hung unspoken between them. He truly did not seem to hold it against her, something she could scarcely understand. Roderick emerged from the inn, a satisfied smile on his face. Once I let it slip that we're accompanying an important person to the Earl's castle, the man who owns the place became much more amenable, he informed them. And the rooms became much more affordable. A sick pit of dread formed itself in her stomach. Why did he insist on announcing her? The Earl would know she had arrived in the village. He would know she was on her way. It would make everything more real. It confirmed the fact that she had no chance of escape. None of them noticed her stricken expression. None of them but Bryce. He seemed to peer into her very thoughts. She avoided his gaze, knowing that if their eyes met it would be too much. She would be reduced to tears, out there in the middle of the bustling crowd. Come, he said, swinging a leg over the saddle. I'll see to the horses while the rest of you are settled in. Chapter 19 Alana's stricken face seared itself into his mind. There was no choice but to get away from her as quickly as possible. As though he might outrun her despair. Her disappointment in him. As though it were any of his affair. It was a dreadful mistake, coming to think of the lass as anything more than a means to an end. A new saddle, new shoes. Each stone in his path smarted against the soles of his feet, the leather worn to the point where it was nearly non-existent. He needed the silver Earl Remington was prepared to grant, in exchange for her delivery. They all did. His needs and his desires were not the only ones in question. And the loyalty of his friends, the ones whose hands he placed his life in time and again, outweighed the concerns of a frightened lass. No matter how much he had begun to want her for himself. He hadn't known it, truly known it in the deepest corners of his soul until he'd all but held her by the banks of the stream. Until they'd been but a breath away from sharing a kiss, he was certain would have led them down a path of pain and regret. Once he'd kissed her he was certain, he would never be able to free his soul from her grip. It was for the best then that he hadn't. They never could. Not ever. Not once in his life had he known the sort of longing which consumed him when he imagined her as another man's bride. The ache in his chest, the shortness of breath when he saw her in another man's arms. Are ye hearing me? Quinn nudged him. They stood outside the stable, waiting for the owner to attend them while the horses dug at the ground with impatient hooves. Bryce did his best to clear his troubled mind. My thoughts were elsewhere, he admitted. Thinking about the lass, are ye? Bryce rewarded him with a sharp look. What makes ye say so? Ye needn't be so high and mighty. Quinn chuckled. I meant nothing by it. Only that we'll be delivering her on the morrow, and she seems none too pleased with it. Oh, were ye thinking so? Bryce snickered. She did attempt an escape after all. Aye. Quinn rubbed the back of his neck, grimacing as he did. Can I share something with ye? If his friend was about to confess love for the lass, Bryce wasn't certain that he'd be able to control himself. Since when are ye asking me such daft questions? You've always been able to. Aye, but I don't want ye thinking I've gone soft or anything of the sort. Especially not toward her, if ye get my meaning. Bryce's eyebrows lifted. Go on. Quinn looked back and forth as though wary of being overheard before leaning in. I do not feel quite right about it. Delivering her, I mean. We've never been tasked with such a mission before. He managed to avoid a sigh of relief at the knowledge that he was not alone in his regret over the lass's predicament. It is a difficult situation to be sure, he admitted. 
It's as though we're delivering her over to be hanged, Quinn muttered with a shake of his head. I don't know that it's that dire. It seems that way to her. It was an effort to raise his shoulders in a shrug. The last thing he wished to do was to disagree with Quinn, as his thoughts on the matter were so similar, if not stronger. To agree would benefit no one. It would only serve to make the entire endeavor more arduous. We were tasked with a responsibility, he reminded his friend and himself. We must see it through. How the lass feels about it is none of our affair. Whether we believe it's in her best interest is again, nothing we need trouble ourselves with. He wondered if it sounded as flat to Quinn's ears as it did to his own. There was no reason for the lad to know his true beliefs on the matter. He only said what he felt compelled to say as a friend and a partner. As the innkeeper had all but offered the rooms for free, they'd taken three in total. Alana's faced the street and was the largest of all. Bryce and Roderick shared the one beside it, only a thin plank wall separating the two. Fergus and Quinn would share the next room. What do we do if she decides to make a run for it now? Roderick asked in hushed tones, seated on the straw-filled tick which served as a bed. Far preferable to another night on the ground, in Bryce's opinion. He sat on his own tick, against the opposite wall which separated them from Alana. All was quiet in there save for the occasional splashing noise. The innkeeper had secured her a large washtub. Once the men had carried it upstairs, the innkeeper's wife had seen to filling it. The water was likely little better than lukewarm by the time of the filling, but Alana hadn't seemed to care. She won't, Bryce predicted. Now that the innkeeper knows who she is, like as not someone has gone ahead to announce her arrival. Ah. Roderick frowned. Perhaps I ought not to have mentioned it then. Oh. He shrugged, his features twisted in guilt. Bryce knew that look well enough to recognize it at first glance. I suppose I feel sorry for her. She's a nice sort. Bryce chuckled, mostly in surprise. He only say that because she's been a willing pair of ears. Roderick's mouth fell open as though he wanted to protest, then he laughed. I suppose you're correct. I've enjoyed speaking of Caitlin so freely. Alana had plagued him with questions as they'd shared the evening meal around the fire, and he had been more than glad to speak at length. It had been a welcome reprieve for the rest of them. You would not allow her to escape, would ye? Bryce ventured, fairly certain it was the wrong question but unable to keep himself from voicing it. Of course not, Roderick was quick to reply. I do not wish to imagine what would come of us if we allowed her to slip through our fingers. I agree. Even so. Roderick shook his head. I canna help but remember how Caitlin escaped my brother after their wedding. She was desperate. Foolishly so, perhaps. She brought danger on the heads of all those who cared for her. I hope Alana is a bit wiser. Bryce held back from giving voice to the protestation which immediately came to mind. Caitlin had been reckless and foolish. But her actions had led to happiness with Roderick. The splashing stopped after a time, telling Bryce that Alana had finished her bath. And he'd thought it was difficult enough to keep her from his mind when she was bathing. How foolish of him. For knowing she was out of the wash tub meant knowing her dripping body was exposed as she dried using linen sheets the innkeeper's wife had provided. It was the closest thing to torture he could imagine, having her right there on the other side of the wall, knowing he was unable to touch her or even look upon her beauty. I need a breath of air, he decided, standing before the words were out of his mouth and leaving the room before Roderick could ask any questions. He barreled down the narrow split log stairs and out the door into the street. It was quieter than it had been when they'd arrived, most villagers in the comfort of their homes at that time of the night. The sky was darkening to a deep blue which would soon lend itself to black. He avoided meeting the eyes of anyone who happened past him, just as he refused to look in through the open doors of the homes in his path. Why interest himself in what others were doing? How they lived their lives? He would not be staying. Anger simmered just beneath the surface of every movement, 
as he very nearly marched up and down rows of homes, places of business. He considered ducking into a tavern and downing all the ale his stomach would hold, which he knew from experience was quite a quantity, but stopped himself in time and merely kept walking on. Perhaps if he exhausted himself, he might fall right to sleep and not lie awake thinking of her. Then again the others would wonder at his absence, it was a strange village and English. He owed it to them to return. The innkeeper looked put out when Bryce first stepped through the door, though in a moment he recognised one of the four escorts of Earl Remington's soon-to-be bride. When recognition dawned, so did friendliness. Ah, you were out for a walk, were you? The accent sounded amusingly unfamiliar to Bryce's unpractised ear. He returned the man's smile, willing himself not to react. Aye, a fine soft evening. The portly, bald-headed man held up a hand to keep Bryce from continuing up the stairs. My wife cleaned your lady's riding clothes, then hung them to dry by the fire. She asked that I deliver the bundle, but have been otherwise occupied. Might I press you into service? Bryce's teeth were gritted when he nodded in agreement. The very last thing he wished to do was see her, yet there was no way to refuse. He merely accepted the bundle of folded clothing and climbed the stairs with heavy feet. It would not do to ask one of the others to deliver the bundle. He would have no reason to give as to his being unable to do so, and anything he managed to concoct would sound pitiful and childish. And so he continued down the narrow corridor after reaching the second floor, his knuckles sharp against her door when he knocked there. Yes. She sounded tired and wary. It's me, lass, he murmured. The innkeeper asked me to bring your cleaned clothing. Her footsteps shuffled across the floor, coming closer, and she opened the door to him. The wariness in her voice extended itself to her expression, for she appeared distrustful. He held out the bundle almost as though it were a peace offering or a gift, willing himself to turn his eyes away from the wet hair which hung about her shoulders. He'd never seen it down before, out of her customary braid, and thought he could become lost in its waves. Thank you, she whispered, her hands brushing against his as she took what he offered. It seemed as though he ought to say something more. Is the room to your liking? Quite. She nodded. I'm certain it shall serve me well. I'm glad. They fell silent then, merely staring at each other. Her lips parted as they had earlier in the day, drawing his attention. They fairly begged to touch his own, pleaded with him to taste them. Something flashed in her eyes and there was no denying her. Or himself. He stepped into the room and closed the door behind him. Chapter 20 It was happening. It had worked. If he hadn't come to her, she would have found a reason to draw him in. Knocking something down, weeping loudly, something to bring him to her door. This was much better. It made the entire affair appear to be more his idea than hers. She took a step backward, then another, until the insides of her knees touched the bed. Her skin broke out in goose flesh, a tremor running from head to toe at the sight of his eyes. He wanted her. She'd known he did. And she knew then that she wanted him too. It was wrong completely, but perhaps better this way. She would not be giving herself to a man she cared nothing for. As she likely would have done, if the man in question had been the earl her father sold her to. Bryce reached for her, his strong hands taking her arms, pulling her to him until their bodies touched once again. This time, she wore only a light linen shift with nothing beneath it. Her heart raced at the illicit thoughts which ran rampant throughout, while her body reacted in ways she'd never experienced. He leaned down, still looking into her eyes, his mouth a hair's breadth from hers. She could not help but tremble, whether it was fear or something darker, deeper which caused her to do so she couldn't tell. She only knew that whatever he wanted from her was something she wished to give, rather than forcing herself to do so. Her eyes closed, her head fell back in anticipation of his kiss. She held her breath, as delicious promise, and the possibility of freedom, lingered just a moment away. A moment, which extended itself longer than she'd expected. Finally when nothing happened, she dared open her eyes. And found him looking at her, as though he was enraged. 
What is it? She whispered, still half lost in a daze. He looked so angry with her. I almost fell into your trap. He nearly shoved her away from himself, forcing her to fall back onto the bed with a startled cry. What? I was not trying to trap you. In the cold light of his rejection, she suddenly felt underdressed. Immodest. She scrambled to cover her thin shift with a blanket, her hands shaking. You would have trapped us both, he snarled. She flinched away from the animal sound of his voice, memories smashing into her from all sides. Memories of fear and rage and pain. At the sight of her reaction, something in him changed. His eyes softened, his face shifted, his shoulders fell. He no longer reminded her of a hulking beast fighting himself to refrain from harming her. Even so, it did little to relieve the rising rush of dismay his rejection inspired. She rolled to her side away from him, and burst into heartbroken sobs the pillow was barely able to muffle. Elana! Do not do this! The bed shifted as he sat beside her, at her back. She curled herself into a tight ball, knees drawn up to her chest, arms wrapped around herself. As though she might protect herself that way. You don't. Understand, she sobbed struggling even to breathe much less to speak clearly. Nor do ye, he insisted murmuring close to her ear. Please leave me alone. Not until I try to make you see. It's for your own good lass. I wish I could make it clear. Stop. Please. I asked you to leave me alone. It was hopeless. There was no escaping her fate, not any more. If Earl Remington were to find you ruined, he would not wish to marry ye. That much is true. But what would he do after that? I do not know. I. Ye do not. The hand he placed upon her shoulder was not rough, but gentle. Perhaps even tender. Elana. I could not live with myself if I were the reason for him, or your father, to abuse you in any way, he added as an afterthought. She tried to shake away his hand, comforting though it was when she imagined what he'd described. He was more than likely correct, at least he was when it came to Douglas Stewart. He would use any excuse to punish her. The memory of that lashing was fresh enough, even after so many years. She had better control over herself then, and was able to whisper, You've no idea how humiliated I am, and before you remind me it's my fault I'll ask you to save the effort. I'm well aware that any humiliation is on my head. You needn't feel as such, he murmured. I can understand why a lass would go as far as you nearly did. I would never blame you for being afraid. Worse than afraid, she whispered, shuddering at the thought of what being Remington's bride would mean. Perhaps it won't be as bad as all that. She snorted, wiping her eyes with the sleeve of her shift. Come now. Ye do not know him. He could very well be kind, considerate, a good husband. He bought a wife. It could be he needs to carry on the name. I may not be in the acquaintance of nobility, but everyone knows it's important for the line to carry on. Even I. That did not make the thought of marrying him any easier to bear, but she saw the futility of further argument. Bryce was correct, damn him. If she were ruined and Remington were to learn of it, he would hold both her and Douglas Stewart and even Bryce accountable. I'm terribly sorry, lass. He patted her shoulder in the most awkward fashion. I truly am. I wish. Please. Spare me your wishes. She waved a hand over her shoulder. Leave me alone now. I beg you. Will ye? I will be all right, and I will not attempt to flee, she added. I know how thoroughly ensnared I am. There is no further chance to be free. Oh, Elana. He got up, the bed shifting with the loss of his weight, and closed the door softly behind him when he left. Only once it was closed and she was alone did she turn onto her back, staring up at the ceiling, as tears rolled down the sides of her face and soaked into her already damp hair. It wasn't like before, the first time that he had turned her away. She hadn't truly wanted him then. He'd merely been away for her to escape her fate. When he'd pushed her away the first time, her pride had stung. Now, 
Lying alone in a foreign village, a foreign country, it was her heart which ached unbearably. Chapter 21 Earl Remington's castle sat high atop a hill overlooking the River Eden, surrounded on three sides by thick green forest of what appeared to be birch, asher and elm trees. They would soon turn from green to a riot of colours, which Bryce nearly wished he would be there to see when the time came. The castle walls were a pearly grey and gleamed in the midday sun, towering high into the sky. Even at a distance it was impressive, reminding Bryce of nothing so much as a shining jewel. That is where you'll make your home. Quinn asked Slackjord. Alana merely nodded. Her skin was paler than normal, the dark circles under her eyes standing out in contrast. It looked as though she'd been awake through the night. Bryce could barely stand to look at her. I suppose it is, she whispered as they continued the ride along a winding road which cut through farm-studded fields. A few of the modest houses were near enough to the road that they who lived inside watched the procession. A freckle-faced young lad, whose smile revealed his missing front teeth, waved to them and followed alongside until his mother called him back. They know who ye are and are anxious to see ye for themselves the new bride of their earl, Fergus observed. His arm was strong enough that he could ride on his own, leaving Alana with a horse which they'd purchased for her from the stable in the village. A gift from them, Roderick had announced. To celebrate her wedding. She'd barely managed to stop herself from crying. The bundle of clothing and personal items she'd brought with her from home sat behind her in the saddle, and Bryce realised he was looking at everything she owned in the world. Her mother's wedding gown, a kirtle or two, stockings, a linen shift. And the horse she'd been gifted that morning. It was a sorry image, to be sure, and he felt worse than ever as he watched her ride along with her head as high as she could manage. Prideful, willful. She would not be humiliating herself again. At least, not in front of them. How he knew this, Bryce could not tell. It was a sense he got from the lass was all. He'd certainly had enough time to think about her, and about everything he had not been at liberty to tell her, in those terrible, painful, embarrassing moments in her room. Such as how badly he'd wanted to give in and throw caution to the wind. To accept what would come after he'd had her for himself. To promise her anything and everything in the world so long as he could give in to what his body and soul so desperately craved. Better men than he had found themselves in unenviable situations after giving in during moments of madness. It was for the best that he had managed to control himself. Perhaps if he repeated this enough, he would believe it. The brown mare which Alana rode made a striking sight prancing almost proudly down the road. As though it knew where it was going, how important the woman it carried. He'd chosen it for her himself, the white star on its forehead making it stand out from the others. The least he could do for her, as he was letting her down in so many ways. It was madness really, the fact that he cared at all. She would no longer be his responsibility once she crossed the threshold of Remington's castle, which was more astounding the closer they came. It seemed to be built into the hill itself, the rocky surface meeting the stones which comprised the walls and nearly blending together. As though some ancient creature had carved it, rather than it having been built up by the hands of men. They had hardly reached the edge of the forest, the alder and ash trees beginning to replace open field, when the pounding of hooves caught everyone's attention. That took longer than I'd expected, Roderick observed with a wry smile. I expect they spotted us from one of the lookout towers. And were waiting, Fergus added. He looked apologetic. I suppose they'll have a great feast to celebrate your arrival, lass. To her credit, Alana attempted to smile, but that smile only served to make her look more pained than ever. Within minutes a half-dozen horses appeared, their riders pushing them to a hard gallop through the woods. Bryce and the rest pulled up on the reins, waiting for the welcoming party to reach them. They look a bit fiercer than any welcoming party I've ever seen, Quinn observed. Remington is asserting himself, Roderick muttered, and perhaps impressing his intended. He might have done well to spare the effort, Alana whispered. The first of the riders reached them, a tall, healthy-looking lad with a glow to his skin and a wide smile. 
Golden hair swept high off his forehead, glistening in the beams of light which filtered down through the trees. This boded well, Bryce thought. Remington's men weren't mere brutes. A sobering thought occurred to him then. What if this was Earl Remington himself? Young, handsome, virile. Would that change anything for Alana? And thus make leaving her more difficult than he'd imagined? Welcome. The lad smiled. Earl Remington sent us to escort you the rest of the way to the castle. His eyes fell on Alana, who rode in the center of the group. And you would be Alana Stewart, I presume. Aye, she murmured, nodding. He bowed in the saddle, as did the men who waited behind him. It is a pleasure and an honor to meet you. The Earl has been most anxiously awaiting your arrival. All preparations have been made for the wedding celebration. He looked around. Let us proceed then. Roderick and Bryce exchanged a glance. Alana merely rode ahead, positioning herself between Remington's men and her escorts. Bryce's heart sank. She was already leaving him, in a way. She was never his to lose. He lifted his chin, determined to complete the mission Earl Remington had set for them. How were your travels? the smiling young lad asked as they progressed. Lengthy. Fergus snorted. You've been injured? The lad spied Fergus's bandaged arm. Aye. A bore. He came out the worse for it. I'm glad to hear it. Just the same, you might visit the healer who lives within the castle walls. She can provide anything you may be in need of. Many thanks. The lad raised his voice, likely for Alana's benefit. The castle affords every comfort and consideration. To my knowledge, there is not a single thing a countess would want for, though should you think of something, I've no doubt the earl would acquire it for you. A countess. Countess Remington. Hearing the title come from the lad's mouth was a cold reminder indeed. A reminder that she'd be a noblewoman, living in a castle where she might look down upon everything and everyone. Including men such as himself. Remington's men were well dressed, their fine tunics and trousers dyed the deepest red, their leather saddles shining. Each of them wore a gleaming sword freshly honed and polished. Their horses were beautiful creatures, sleek and muscular and well-groomed. There was no reason to assume Remington would not be just as fine as the men and animals in his employ. Better even. While Bryce was merely a Highlander. He'd never thought little of his beginnings and never would, proud always of his Scottish blood and his strength and abilities. It was Alana's opinion he questioned. Surely she would begin to see now what a grave mistake it would have been to align herself with a man such as himself, when she had everything she might ever need at her fingertips. The lad turned to him, still smiling, as they came out of the thickest of the forest and began the somewhat steeper climb up a long curved road walled on both sides by jagged stone. It would take them to the castle's courtyard. I've been instructed to offer you the benefits of the Earl's hospitality as well. Arrangements have been made for you to spend a few days in the stables. Roderick coughed, Quinn sputtered, Fergus gave a sharp intake of breath. Bryce was neither surprised nor amused. I'm certain we would be glad for the chance to rest, he managed to reply with all the dignity he could muster. The stables. Alana finally seemed to come to life, shooting a sharp look over her shoulder at Remington's man. There is not enough room in the castle keep for them. The lad chuckled. It is not a matter of room, but rather one of the Earl's wishes. I'm certain he would be glad to make things clear to you himself. Bryce stared at her, hard as he could, willing her to look at him. She'd hardly looked at him all day, but this was when he needed her to most. Do not question him, do not question him, do not cause trouble for our sakes. Make it easier on yourself. She merely turned her attention back to the road, her shoulders squared in determination. Fergus cleared his throat to catch Bryce's eye, and his grimace told him they shared the same thoughts. There was no time to instruct her, for they were near enough to the castle that Bryce heard the voices of the many men and women who bustled about outside. A few of them paused in their activity when they realized who approached, ravenously interested in the young woman who would be their mistress. 
It has been a very busy time, the young man explained. The stable boys and scullery maids and cooks have been working throughout the day and night to prepare for the wedding. The earl led a hunting party this morning with the other men, but ought to be refreshed enough to receive you immediately. I do not understand, Bryce spoke up. If the earl did not know when we would arrive, how are there already guests awaiting our arrival? They have been staying at the castle for a fortnight, as is sometimes the case in situations such as this. There are entire seasons which Earl Remington spends at the estate of a friend. He was in Nottingham for much of this past summer. But there has been plenty of time left to see to your comfort. He will wish to extend his hospitality to you in person when I escort you to his study. He was speaking to Alana, who merely nodded in reply. She would go in to see the Earl alone. Her escorts were not welcome. This guard of Remington's clearly did his lower business for him, the tasks he did not wish to take on himself, such as alerting the new guests to their very low status and shuffling them off to the stables, where men such as them belonged, while fetching his bride and bringing her to him. Bryce reminded himself yet again that she was not his. And now that they were on the Earl's land, riding into the courtyard of the Earl's castle, she was not even his responsibility. He'd done his duty. She was safe. Remington's men dismounted, tossing the reins of their horses to the stable boys in a practice gesture. They seemed to ignore the eyes and whispers of the servants who observed their mistress's arrival. Come then? The leader of their group smiled up at Alana. He will wish to see you immediately. She cast a nervous look in Bryce's direction, but lowered herself from the saddle nonetheless. My horse, my belongings. They will be taken care of, the guard assured her. Your belongings will be taken to your room, and this beautiful mare will be fed and watered and shown to its stall. I see. She hesitated, one hand still on the mare's neck. Bryce wished more than anything that he'd had the chance to offer one more word of encouragement, to assure her that all would be well. Alana lifted her chin, her blue eyes clear and determined, and only looked back and Bryce and the others for the briefest of moments before following Remington's men through the castle's tall wooden door, which sat open as if in anticipation of her arrival. He wondered as he watched whether the crushing sensation in his chest was grief. Come on then, Roderick muttered as he dismounted. No one will see to us unless we see to ourselves, I'm thinking. As if on second thought, the young man who led Remington's band of knights or guards or whatever he considered them stopped and turned back. The Earl will wish to see the four of you at some point, as well, to settle the matter of payment. Bryce wasn't entirely sure he wished to lay eyes on the man. Chapter 22 It was an effort to keep her knees from knocking together as Alana walked into the castle keep, her eyes moving this way and that, as she took in sights which she'd never seen the likes of before. It must have taken a hundred years to build something so wondrous. The vaulted stone ceiling stretched far above her head, supported by stone columns so thick she doubted she'd be able to wrap her arms around them and touch her fingers together. The floor was stone as well, though strewn about with straw which crunched underfoot. Large wooden fixtures hung from chains affixed to the ceiling, holding thick candles which dripped wax onto the floor. A wide staircase caught her eye, leading up to a second floor. At the head of the stairs, across from the landing, was an arched window which nearly reached the vaulted ceiling above. Everything was so large, overwhelming her at every turn. And it would be her home. Hers to manage. How would she ever do it? And could she ever feel at home in a castle, which made her feel so very small? This way, the young man who'd led the way thus far beckoned, motioning for her to follow him through a narrow passage of columns to a large open room, which boasted a blazing hearth at both ends. Bloodred tapestries hung from high up on the walls embroidered with golden thread, and tall narrow windows which came to arched points at the top allowed the sun's light to fill the space. The Earl's study, the young man explained. This is where he spends much of his days, going about the business of overseeing the earldom. You will be expected to assist him in the management of the estate. Her head spun as her eyes fell on a table covered in scrolls and ledges. She would be expected to assist in the management. 
an overwhelming prospect, but this was an overwhelming situation on the whole. It came as no surprise that yet another aspect of her new life left her breathless. Sharp strident footsteps met her ears, and her heart seemed to freeze in her chest. Her intended. She lifted her chin in what she hoped was a confident, defiant gesture, even as she questioned her ability to hold her water. She'd only known true terror twice. Once, while in a tree as a boar waited to make her his next meal. And now, at this moment, knowing she was about to meet the man who'd brought her to his home. He swept into the room, throwing his cape over one shoulder as he did. Her first impression was one of his great size, though he was not an inordinately large man, in fact he was somewhat shorter than Bryce and more compact in build. But he was forceful, commanding attention with every step he took. His raven black hair was streaked with white at the temples, telling her how much older he was than she. Yet his face retained a youthful smoothness even so. Likely because he had spent his time out of doors in the pursuit of hunting with friends, as he had just done prior to her arrival. While the management of an earldom could not be simple, she was not naive enough to believe anything else, it surely had not taken a physical toll on the man. He came to a halt while still several paces from her, standing with hands on his hips as his eyes took a brief tour of her face, hair and body. So this is my bride. Alana could not tell if he was pleased with her or not. My name is Alana Stewart, she murmured in a voice which sounded little like hers. She had so hoped to sound confident, sure of herself, in control. Instead, she might as well have been a shaking child. He held his head high, his features sharp. They reminded her of a bird. A hawk. I'd heard you were a beauty. I'm glad to see I was not misled. She felt as though the compliment, if it was one, deserved a reply. Thank you kindly, she murmured, nodding in acknowledgement. Edward. Pardon? My name is Edward Remington. Best become accustomed to addressing me as such now, as we will be sharing so much time together. Dark eyes narrowed as he studied her face. Yes. I find you pleasing. Why, when his words were so pleasant, did they send a sick chill down her spine? He regarded her, in much the same way as she'd regarded the lovely little mare Bryce and the others had purchased on her behalf. As though she were an animal. Edward waved a hand to the steward who had accompanied him into the room, and the young man hurried off through a door cleverly concealed in the wall. He shall fetch refreshment for you, my dear, as I'm sure you must be quite weary and malnourished after such a long journey. I, I am at that, she agreed, feeling again as though she ought to be gracious. It was impossible to get a feeling for the man, to understand where his true intentions were when he spoke to her and offered refreshment. Impossible to know whether he truly cared about her comfort, or was merely behaving out of habit or custom. He perched upon a chair cushioned in red velvet. Please. Make yourself comfortable. I wish to know about you, so that I might be better able to answer the questions my guests have already been asking. She swallowed hard as she sat, hoping his questions were not too probing or uncomfortable, and that she might be able to come up with the correct answers for them. While she still had no intention of marrying the man, she did not wish to anger him either. He looked her up and down once again as he sat back, leaning one elbow on the chair's arm. Long thin fingers tapped against his smooth-shaven cheek. The men who escorted you here. They treated you fairly, I presume? I indeed. None of them. Bothered you, in any way? Interfered with you? Her cheeks burned hot, though she managed to maintain eye contact so that he might not think her dishonest. They did not. They were gentlemen. He snorted. Scottish gentlemen? I've yet to meet one. Now that you mention them, she ventured thinking quickly, might they not spend their evening here within the walls of the keep? I understand you were to offer them arrangements in the stables. And it's far better than they would receive at any other estate in the country, Edward assured her, sounding bored rather than angry. They're fortunate I'm even giving them space inside the castle walls. She bit back a stinging retort, reminding herself that they were strangers. The man's hands did not appear as though he'd ever done a day's hard work with them, 
but that did not mean he was unable to hurt her. At any rate they were kind to me, she assured him. He waved a dismissive hand. And you are intact. I was led to believe so by your father. The fact that the two men had discussed something so intimate turned her stomach, but that was the way of the world. She wondered what would have happened if she'd answered in the negative, if she told him she'd been compromised by a man along the route to the castle, or even years earlier, outside the awareness of her terrible father. What would he have done? I am intact, she whispered, lowering her eyes. It was all unbearable. One indignity after another. I'm glad to hear of it. That was one of the conditions of my agreeing to wed. Alana was unsure whether she wanted to know what the other conditions were, but felt compelled to ask, after all she reasoned it was her life at stake. What were the other conditions, she asked. I want a wife who will bear me children, he explained, his tone clipped. I need Viscounts to carry on the family line. The Remington name is a good one, an old one, but I am the only living son. My brothers all either died in infancy or on the field of battle. I am sorry to hear of it, she murmured. I am the last hope of the bloodline you understand, he continued, ignoring her or simply not sharing her feelings. And the fact that you are half English makes you a very attractive mother to my children. Your mother's family name was a good one in this part of the world until the family fell into ruin. Hence marrying her off to a Highland clan leader. The man's nose wrinkled as though he smelled something rotten. Self-righteous anger rose in her chest. How dare he? She bore no love for Douglas Stewart, nor for the clan he led, but it was clear the man's distaste was for Scotsmen on the whole, and Highlanders in particular. She would have enjoyed watching Bryce put the man in the velvet cape in his rightful place. You've no other living relatives? Edward asked. She shook her head. Good. No family coming to call then. I have several sisters who occasionally bring their brats here for holidays. I've little time for such matters, but that will be your affair to manage. I see. She did not see at all, and the fact that he referred to his nieces and nephews as brats told her all she needed to know of his feelings toward children. Of course I plan to have you with child within one or two moons, but you will be up and about before your interment comes. You will find every possible need has already been attended to. He would have nothing to do with the raising of the children naturally, taking credit for their excellence while heaping blame upon her whenever they fell short. He would likely ignore the girls, marrying them off to strategically sound young men while focusing his attention on the boys. The poor babes. She felt terribly sorry for them, though they had not yet been born. The steward returned with a tray laden with wine, bread, cheese, meat and dried fruit. Edward took everything in with a practiced eye. The kitchen is currently being put to use for tonight's feast, and the wedding preparations too. I hope this is acceptable to you. It was a veritable feast on its own, better than almost anything she'd enjoyed since leaving home. It looks quite fine thank you. You, he murmured, pouring wine into a chalice. Excuse me. You. You keep saying ye as some Scottish peasant. You are to be a countess. You must use proper English. I will do my best, she said, speaking carefully, even when there was nothing she wanted more than to claw his eyes from his head. The way he spat out his words when he spoke of the Scottish. He handed her a chalice before pouring wine for himself. I expect you to share my bed at my command. When I am not in need of you, you will sleep in your chambers. Your ladies-in-waiting have small chambers of their own just beside yours, and will be at your command. I care little what you do with them. I also care little for what anyone thinks of what I do with my time, or who I choose to share my bed with when I am not with my wife. Her hand shook, causing the wine to spill over the top of the chalice and stain her kirtle. I do not understand. He leaned forward, speaking slowly as though he were addressing a child. I will have whichever woman I choose. I might grow fond of one of your maids, or of a friend, or of a harlot. It is not your concern. She swallowed. Say it, he whispered. It is not your concern. 
It is not my concern, she whispered. Of course, he continued with a satisfied sneer, you will behave as a countess is expected to. You will be where I want you to be, when I want you to be there, whether it is my bed or the dining table or the hunt or a banquet or at my side as the farmers bring gifts on holy days. You will be chaste, obedient, and you will keep your sharp-tongued opinions to yourself. Your father warned me about your temper, and your inability to keep a thought in your head without speaking it aloud. He sat back, shaking his head as he did. I cannot have that, and I will not. When she found her voice she whispered, Why did you agree to the marriage then? If he told you about my temper and my opinions? He smiled almost charmingly then. It is easy to correct such ill-mannered behavior, my dear. I've corrected it, in many a woman. But none of those women were the type of man in my position, weds or employs in the bearing of his children. You are. That is all that separates you from them, Alana Stewart. He studied her reaction, perhaps expecting to find her shaken by his words. He knew nothing of her, naturally, or else he would have known how little the threats of a man affected her. Douglas Stewart had raged and shouted and sworn at her throughout her life. She knew how to control herself when the time came to do so. I'm certain you will find me a pleasant man, so long as my needs are attended to and my wishes not circumvented, he assured her, his mood brightening. I'm quite agreeable, even good company. So long as I get my way, and the woman at my side is agreeable as well. I shall do my best to be agreeable then, she murmured. He broke off a piece of bread, dipped it into his wine and licked his fingers once he'd eaten. Please. Help yourself. You will need your strength for what is to come, the greeting of my guests the feast this evening. She willed her hand into steadiness as she broke off a piece of bread, a chunk of cheese. While she had no appetite whatsoever, something the Earl had said rang true for her. She would need all of her strength, for there was no way she would stay in his castle through the night. Chapter 23 Never in her life had Alana felt more out of place. She had suffered through great banquets at Douglas Stewart's table, the men half drunk before the meal even began, and only growing worse as the night went on. She had even borne witness to celebrations which lasted three or four days. She'd also witnessed the back-breaking work of cleaning up after such an event. Those banquets and such had meant nothing but discomfort for her. Discomfort over being stared at by men who enjoyed laughing together over what they'd like to do to her. Discomfort over being the only woman in the immediate area. She had never much enjoyed the sight or sound or stench of a very drunken man, but she had learned to manage her disgust. Sitting at Edward Remington's right hand while he held a banquet was an entirely different matter. For one, she had never so much in her life felt like the center of attention and she loathed it. Even during clan banquets when the men had leered at her and shouted untoward comments, she'd been able to shrug her shoulders and blame their behavior on their rough upbringing and the lack of proper teaching in their youth. What was the excuse then, for a few dozen nobles who'd like us not received a fine education in all of the social arts and graces? Why did they not bother to hide their obscene interest in her? They commented on her hair, her skin, her eyes, her height, her figure, right in front of her. To her face. It stretched the bounds of belief in her mind. Were these wretched, overdressed men and women, never taught how terribly ungracious it was to stare and speak of a person as though they could not hear the conversation? It was as though she weren't really there. Or as if they weren't aware of her ability to speak English. As though they might voice their opinions with impunity, because she could understand nothing they said. Was that what they believed? Could it be possible? For a wild Scottish thing, she makes a good showing, one of the women commented, fingering a jeweled brooch at her breast as though to draw attention to it. Or to her breast, half revealed as it was in a low-cut gown. Yes, I suppose. Her mother was one of us, after all. I assume her English blood tamed the wild Scottish side of her, her companion noted. She, like her friend, wore richly embroidered silk and jewels in her lustrous hair. Much like all of the women present. They were beautiful on the outside, stunningly so really, but ugly within. 
would she become ugly too, after spending enough time among them? If her intended was aware of any of this, he gave no indication. He was far too busy holding conversations with the men, reliving their success during the morning's hunt. They spoke of their dogs, the falcons their falconers had raised, other such tedious topics. She sat in the middle of all of this, not belonging on either side. It was doubtful that the women would ever accept her, mean cats that they were. She would always be an outsider, an other unfit to be in their company, no matter how many Remingtons she bore. Why did Edward not turn to one of his kind for marriage? Perhaps none of them would have him, she thought to herself, eyeing him from beneath lowered lashes. He was perhaps forty or fifty years of age, ancient in her opinion, but still reasonable for a man who never spent a day engaged in hard labor. He seemed capable of making pleasant conversation. He even sounded as though he'd been well educated. One glance around the castle was enough to prove his wealth. Alana could scarcely believe the sumptuous feast laid out before them, and this was not even the wedding feast, which promised to be much more lavish. Roast duck, sizzling pork, roast beef, four long tables and all loaded to the point where they seemed ready to collapse from the strain of tray after tray. And the wine flowed as though there was a stream of it, running past the castle. Endless amounts. She witnessed one rather portly man who she'd heard others address as Lord drink no fewer than eight cups, and still call for more once that was through. If Edward was truly wealthy enough to afford such a feast, why had he not found a bride before now? Why would he debase himself with someone as low as herself? Not that she saw herself as being any lower than he, on the contrary, she considered him to be fairly vile, but he certainly felt that she was beneath him. As did everyone present, based on their stares and whispers and the occasional ill-concealed laughter. It was her mother's blood, and the fine family she'd been attached to. Alana had never learned the name. Douglas had never once spoken it aloud. Evidently it was enough to make up for her lack of finery, though Edward had provided a gown, and one of her maids, no, ladies-in-waiting, had dressed her hair in an intricate mass of braids and curls. He'd seemed pleased with her appearance upon visiting her chambers earlier, commenting on the fullness of her figure, and complimenting the smoothness of her skin. To her dismay, she had merely nodded and thanked him for saying so. It was as if she had become a different person, which horrified her, no matter the reason. Even if it was merely a matter of surviving, until she could feasibly escape, she betrayed herself every time she allowed one of his ill-mannered, unfeeling, overly intimate comments to go by unchallenged. What would happen to her if she stayed? Would she simply cease to exist? Would everything that had ever made her the person she was no longer be? All the more reason to get out while she had the chance. Edward raised his chalice then, encouraging the others to do the same. I would like to make a toast to my good fortune in finding such a lovely bride. I am certain my Alana will make a good wife and bear me many fine children. The toast left her feeling cold. It was all about him, his good fortune, his luck, his children. To the happy couple, one of the noblemen shouted, a bit too eager but he was well past drunk by that point, and the rest of the room echoed the sentiment. She wished she could speak. Just a single word to show them that no, she was not simple. She spoke English and understood every word they said. Would that embarrass them? Force them to be a bit more polite to her? It mattered not, for she was never granted the chance to speak in the smoke-filled room, the hearth and candles making it nearly impossible for her to see the wall opposite the one to her back. She would have to wait. The night dragged endlessly on. Musicians entered once the food had been cleared away, and began playing on the flute, the lyre, the tambourine. Some of the men and women around the room began to dance, others to clap in time with the music. Wine flowed heavier than ever, and the more the men drank, the greater their appetites for things other than food. Several of them pinched the backsides of women other than their wives, or attempted to steal kisses. Much laughter rose up at this behavior, while Alana would have loved nothing more than to cuff the men about the head for behaving no better than children. One glance at her betrothed told her he was no better. It wasn't as though he'd lied to her, 
he had made it plain that he enjoyed the company of women, and expected freedom to do as he liked with whomever he liked. He eyed up one of the servant girls tasked with pouring wine, staring pointedly at her breasts whenever she bent over her work. When he caught Alana's eye and knew she had witnessed his behavior, he merely smiled. What he challenged? Is there something you wish to say to me? She bit her tongue hard enough to hurt, then smiled in return. Not at all. I'm glad you are enjoying your feast. At this his smile widened. Became more genuine and less taunting. You see? I told you how agreeable I can be once it's understood that I will have my way. He leaned in, reeking of wine and sweat. And I will have my way with you by tomorrow at this time. You had better hope I find you intact, as you claim to be. She was certain she would vomit, not from any fear, for she was truthful in regard to her lack of experience, but from his utter indifference. His coldness. His callous attitude. Would it hurt when the time came? She thought it would. I must retire now, she said, not caring whether her abruptness in changing the subject would be construed as evasiveness. She only knew she had to get away from him. Immediately. He eyed her up, weighing her words. Fine then. You'll need all the rest you can get, for tomorrow will be a very important day. Yes. It would. Though not for the reason he believed. She would be long gone by the time to exchange their vows arrived. Chapter 24 The sounds of revelry reached their ears as they sat outside the stables, just inside the gate set inside the stone walls. The keep rose in front of them, candlelight blazing from the windows, shouts and laughter and music coming from inside. They're having a grand time of it, Quinn observed, drinking heartily of the mead which had been provided them. It was the least Remington could do, seeing as how he did not find them fit to sleep beneath his roof. Aye. Though I highly doubt she is, Bryce muttered, spitting on the ground for lack of anything more purposeful to do. There was no way to adequately express his sorrow, his fear for her, the disappointment he felt toward himself. How had he been daft enough to allow the lass into his affections? You never know, Roderick observed, gnawing the last of the meat from a bone before tossing it to the dogs which roamed everywhere. It seemed every guest of the Earl had brought at least one hairy, slobbering beast along with them. You've never been the optimist, Bryce reminded him. Aye, but there is something to be said for allowing the lass to find out for herself whether or not she'll be happy in this new life of hers. Remington might not be a bad sort at that. He's forcing us to sleep out in the stables, Fergus reminded him. Does that surprise ye, knowing he's English and we are certainly not? Roderick counted. I expected no better, and neither did any of ye. We've all developed soft feelings for the lass is all. We're all too quick to wish to protect those in need of protecting. She is no longer in need of that protection, and we must remember that. Bryce did not wish to remember it, because that would mean remembering how little he meant to the rest of her life. Nothing at all, in fact. A burst of raucous laughter rang out from inside. I didn't know the nobles enjoyed themselves so heartily during feasts. Fergus chuckled. I'm reminded of a tavern, after the men have just collected their wages. I suppose that once a man is in his cups, he stops being a nobleman and turns into a normal man, Bryce observed, and the four of them shared a wry laugh. Servants hurried about near the keep, running back and forth with jugs and casks and such, giving instructions and passing orders to each other. Bryce wondered at the sort of household Remington ran. It seemed efficient, even though those who did the work seemed rather highly strung and irritable. He supposed he would be too, if he were in their position. How long do ye think he'll give us leave of the place? Quinn asked, wiping his mouth with the back of his hand and letting out a hearty belch. Not very long, Roderick mused. I would be greatly surprised if he allowed us to stay through the morrow. I do not wish to stay, Bryce announced. I would rather leave the moment he hands over our silver. Even if there's chance of our staying an extra night. I wouldn't mind another fine meal such as this, Quinn protested. And the thought of not having to get on horseback for another day is almost too good to refuse. 
I, my hindquarters are a bit worse for wear, Fergus agreed. It's a long way back to the Anderson house. With what we're about to collect from Remington, we might be able to spend a day or two at the inn in the village, Rice counted. Do you truly believe they would have us back, now that we're no longer in Alana's company? Roderick pointed out. I do not. Bryce brooded to himself for a moment. Why did they all insist on being so difficult? Fine then. The first village we come to on the other side of the border. We can take the main road this time, all the way through to Lockerbie. Aye, now that we're no longer in danger of one of our party running off. Fergus nodded. We'll find an inn by the end of the day tomorrow, I'm certain. So long as they did not stay in the castle. So long as he did not have to be there when Alana married another man. It would be too great a pain to bear, hearing voices raised in celebration of her new life. Why does this matter so much to you? Roderick asked, one eyebrow lifting. Because I wish to get home, and I would think you would too with a wife waiting for ye, Rice prodded. Of course I wish to be back with her, but I would not mind the chance to catch my breath either. One more day will not make that great a difference. It was as though they were all against him. How could he be the only one wishing to get away? Did they not see? No, of course they did not. None of them felt for her as he did. Damn him for being so weak. Fergus looked up at the star-filled sky, smiling. A grand night indeed. It is fine country. Aye, Quinn agreed with a grin. A shame it has to be on this side of the border. It was the second night in a row in which he knew he'd get no sleep. How long could a body go without sleep? He'd spent days at a time in the army, but that had been under rather more dire conditions. A man tended to forget such things as fatigue when his life was in danger. He'd think it would be no trouble falling asleep after having stayed awake much of the previous night back at the inn. Just the opposite was the case in fact. He stared up at the planks which comprised the stable ceiling, listening as the horses shifted in their stalls. At least the stable lads had mucked out the stalls Remington had seen fit to allow them. His contempt was clear, they were beasts. Bryce was uncertain whether he looked forward to meeting the man simply to get a look at him or if he dreaded it, knowing he would want to give the bastard a piece of his mind. No good could come of a mistake such as that. It made him think of Alana. Had she pleased her new husband? Bryce hoped for her sake that she had, and that she had managed to hold her tongue against any stubborn foolhardy retorts. He liked that about her, he decided, though her penchant for speaking her mind had irritated him terribly at first. If anyone were to silence her, to wear the lass down to the point where she feared speaking out, she would no longer be Alana. His Alana, even though she was never truly his. Roderick, Fergus and Quinn were soundly asleep, the three of them snoring and grunting in turn. They could sleep. They were not as concerned for her as he was. He wished he shared their good fortune. The snoring and grunting, paired with the noise from the horses, nearly concealed footsteps on the straw which covered the floor. He heard the gentle crunching, but just barely. It was not a man walking past the stall in which he rested. He stood, moving as quietly as possible, peering over the stall door. There was hardly any light in the stable, as leaving an unattended lantern or candle would be tantamount to welcoming an accident, but his eyes were already adjusted to the darkness. So much so that he recognized the blonde hair immediately, the curve of her cheek. The gown she wore was nothing like anything he'd seen her in up to that point, a deep purple velvet which seemed to mold itself to her body. It reminded him of nothing as much as a little girl playing at being a grown woman. He opened the door, stepping out of the stall watching as she searched up and down the rows. He knew what she was looking for and what she intended. Lass, he whispered. She jumped, throwing a hand over her mouth as she turned to look at him. Her eyes were wide above that hand bulging from her head. What do you think you're doing, she breathed, moving her hand to her chest. You nearly frightened me to death. What do I think? This is my bedchamber for the evening, he reminded her. It's what you are doing which concerns me. 
She chewed her lip, looking down at the floor. I was looking for my mare. To run away. What do you think? She shot him a defiant look. Do not try to stop me. You're still on about this. I cannot marry him. I will not. She pointed a trembling hand toward the keep. I tell you I won't. Is it that terrible, lass? He took a step toward her, uncertain whether he wanted her to confirm his fears or deny them. Did he want Remington to be a monster, so as to assuage his guilt at wanting her for himself? Or would it be better that she overreact? He wants nothing more than a broodmare, she hissed. I'm to warm his bed when he wishes and bear his children. Otherwise, I'm to keep my mouth shut, laugh at his terrible jokes, look the other way when he touches or ogles another woman, pretend to be interested in his conversation and smile through it all. Bryce blinked. Is that it? Does there need to be more? I lass, he murmured. I believe there does. Her face fell. I should have known. Before he could react, she darted away, running out of the stable and into the night. After muttering a string of obscenities, he followed. Chapter 25 Alana could hardly see for the tears in her eyes, but she ran nonetheless. Even though it would mean running into the woods, where she would most certainly become lost. It would be better than marrying that beast. She couldn't have explained it to Bryce, for it wasn't the sort of thing that could be explained. It had to be felt. The coldness of him. The smile on the surface, which only barely masked a violent, uncaring man underneath. It would be the same as marrying her father, in essence. She would not do that. She ran for the road, beyond the courtyard, the gown she'd been instructed to wear pulled up to her knees. A ridiculous thing really, heavy and tight at the elbows and bust. It made drawing a deep breath, all but impossible. Still she ran, moonlight showing her the way. Alana. She had hardly gone beyond the castle walls before he caught her, taking her by the arm and swinging her about. E canna do this lass. A broken sob wrenched itself from her chest. I can and I will, and you cannot stop me. You can pretend not to know. Just let me go please. Alana. He gripped both of her arms tight, shaking her slightly as he did. Alana, I could never let you run out into the woods like this. I would have to go with ye, which would mean I knew of your escape. You said your intended is not a good man. What do you think he would do to ye? You could help me be free. I cannot. I'm sorry lass, but I have no right. I'm in a foreign country, where I'm unwanted. There are four of us in total, against Remington's knights. I must think of Roderick and Quinn, and my brother. What would happen to them? Alana, what if they were executed over this? He shook her once more, grimacing. His question hung heavy in the air, and in her heart. Yes, what of them? She hadn't thought of the men, who had escorted her. She had considered them captors, the enemy, when the journey had begun. Now they were friends. She cared for them. She thought about Caitlin, a woman she'd never met, who carried Roderick's child. It was a sobering reality. And a terrible one. Come. I will escort you back to your chambers. He attempted to pull her, in the direction of the castle. She dragged her feet. What if you left then? She whispered, clutching desperately at every last bit of hope. If you had already left and were long gone by the time I escaped, no one could blame you for it. You might be able to get away. Put it out of your head, lass, he replied in a sharp whisper, glaring at her. Stop thinking about it. Accept the way things are, and let the rest go. It is for the best. The best for whom? He growled, shoving her into a darkened corner near the wall where they would not be seen. The sky was beginning to lighten, the feast and celebration having gone through much of the night and nearly into dawn. She'd slipped away from the keep once most of the revelers had fallen asleep, some of them still seated at the long banquet tables. Whom do you think? Yourself of course. This is foolish. The man up there, he said, pointing up to the keep, will hunt you down. 
He will make life miserable for ye. You think things are bad now when all you need do is smile to his face? Imagine, if he were to hurt ye for attempting to thwart him. And what of the guests who've already arrived for a wedding? What about the humiliation he'd face? He would punish ye for that too, lass. Make no mistake. She wept openly, though as quietly as possible to avoid being overheard. Bryce's face was a mask of misery. It gives me no pleasure to do this to ye, lass. He sighed. To do what? Rather than answering, he bent at the waist and threw her over his shoulder. She gasped, shocked beyond reason and pounded on his back and shoulders. Put me down, she hissed, with only the fear of discovery keeping her from shouting. I cannot, and ye know I cannot. You'd best direct me to your chambers then. He marched them to the keep, straight in through the door she'd left open after dashing out into the courtyard. Bryce. If he sees you in here. Best be quick about it then, he replied in a whisper. The castle was mostly quiet, save for the occasional dog or cat passing by. It seemed the place was crawling with them. They might raise a fuss if she did not put a stop to things right away. As little as she wished to do so, she pointed Bryce up the stairs and down the corridor on their right. He carried her all the way, bouncing her against his back. She was too enraged to even cry any longer. She had no one. No one to understand her desperation. No one to comfort her, once the ceremony came to a close and she was Countess Remington. Perhaps she would throw herself from a window. It would mean her escape, without bringing danger on the others. This door, she whispered, motioning toward the one which opened to her chambers. They were lovely at any rate, large and comfortable. Her bed was solid wood, rich and shining, with heavy tapestries at the posts to keep her warm once the weather took a turn. She had no plan to be in that bed once the weather turned. One way or another, she would be free. She could share none of this with Bryce as he set her on her feet just inside the room. There. Now. I am sorry lass. Believe it. I will not believe it, she whispered still defiant. A rueful smile touched the corners of his mouth. I. I have no doubt. If ye did, it would not be Alana I was speaking to. I won't be Alana much longer. I will be Countess Remington. Nay. You'll always be Alana. He reached out, stroked her hair just once before taking a backward step. Good night to ye, Alana. And goodbye. She could hardly breathe for the pressure in her chest, as he disappeared down the dark corridor, blending into the shadows before the echo of his footfalls died away. Chapter 26 It was perhaps the most difficult thing Bryce had ever been tasked with doing. Saying goodbye to her, seeing the tears still damp on her cheeks the red eyes and downturned mouth. Knowing her misery, and being unable to end it. Did she not know he wanted nothing more than to free her? Even if she did not wish to be his, at least she would not live an unhappy life as the silent wife of another man. A man unworthy of her, it was clear. Halt. He froze in place halfway down the stairs. The door was so close. He'd nearly made it out, undetected. Footsteps rang out behind him coming down the stairs. He recognized the lad who'd escorted them through the woods, and his smile was one of relief. I was just about to leave, he said, hoping the entire event would be overlooked. After all, it seemed the occupants of the castle had heartily enjoyed themselves at the feast. Perhaps he might make the best of the high spirits from earlier in the night. The lad did not smile in return, in fact his right hand lingered just over the hilt of his sword. Earl Remington will wish to see you, he said, nodding to the men who stood behind Bryce. I meant no harm, Bryce insisted, but it seemed to matter not. They led him the rest of the way down the stairs and through the keep, turning down a narrow corridor. It was an impressive place to be certain, and he looked around in wonder at the room in which they came to a stop. At a table sat a man with black hair touched with grey, wearing a fur-lined cape fixed about his neck by a jewelled pin. He looked up at his visitors, eyes widening slightly at the sight of an unwelcome Highlander. What is this? 
he asked, sneering as though he'd found a rodent in his stew. Bryce instantly disliked him intensely. Sir, we found this man on the stairs. Inside the keep. Remington, for it could only be Remington, stood, hands on the table. You cannot be serious. It is true, Bryce spoke up. I found your bride wandering about in the courtyard, and escorted her to her chambers. Nothing more. The Earl's eyes narrowed until they were nearly closed. Leave us, he decided, waving a hand without looking at his men. You are certain, sire? His men did not sound as certain. Not at all. Perhaps their master had never been in the presence of a true man, one who would gladly snap their necks like twigs if the situation called for it. Since when are you in the habit of questioning me? Remington's tone was cold, promising woeful danger to any who refused to obey him. The men scurried out, closing the door behind them. Leaving Bryce alone with him. Would you care for a drink? Remington asked, reaching for a jug. Thank you, but no. You do not appreciate good wine. I am not thirsty. Remington made a small noise as though he were amused. I see. Now. Tell me plainly. What was my bride really doing outside at this time of night? She told me she was retiring to her bedchamber. As the celebration was all but finished, I gave her leave. Why was she out of doors rather than in her bed? Bryce took great pains to keep as neutral an expression as possible. I'm afraid I cannot say. We did not discuss it. Remington's eyes never left his as he lifted a chalice to his lips. She was not attempting to run away then. She was on foot. I doubt a lass could find her way to the woods then through them on foot, Bryce replied, finding it a reasonable argument. It almost made good sense too, though Alana had not been thinking sensibly at the time. Right you are, naturally, but you are a man who has seen his share of difficult terrain, I'm certain. You would know better than to attempt such a foolish act. Remington sat once again, calmer than he'd been before. If a woman were desperate enough, she might be moved to take any number of drastic actions. Cold fingers of fear seemed to touch the back of Bryce's neck, though the fear was not for himself but rather for her. The man seated across from where he stood was not one to be trifled with, it was plain to see. True, but she was not acting in desperation. She was merely taking the air, I'm sure the feast and the celebration were a bit much for her to take in at once. You make a good point, the Earl agreed, nodding slowly. You seem to understand her motivations rather well, I notice. Bryce merely shrugged. I do not believe so, begging your pardon. It merely seems to make sense that she might need to breathe the night air prior to retiring. That is all. And you just happened to hear her out there. I was not sleeping. Oh. Remington raised an eyebrow, smiling. Did you not find your sleeping arrangements comfortable? Bryce was reminded of a cat playing with a mouse it knew it intended to kill. Drawing out the experience for its own amusement. That was what Remington was doing with him. Having a bit of fun, drawing out the uncertainty of what this meeting might bring. I was answering nature's call, he replied. Remington laughed. I see. Then, it's fortunate you happen to answer the call at the right moment. Or else there is no telling what might have occurred. His eyes took on a sharp look. His laughter was mirthless. He did not trust Alana. He might not even have liked her. This did not bode well. If ye do not mind then, I would like to get what little sleep I still can, Bryce suggested, intent on telling the others of this meeting and the impression he got of the man. Do that, and be gone by the time our wedding ends. Remington bent, retrieving a small sack from beneath the table, dropping it onto the surface. It landed heavily, the coins inside rattling prettily against each other. I trust you will find this amount satisfactory. It compensates the four of you for your troubles, travel, accommodations both to and from. If you and your companions know what is good for you, you will take it and be grateful to have it. It was as though he'd gone from being one person to being an entirely different man, just that quickly. Gone was the offer of hospitality, 
he was barely behaving in a civil manner. We were led to believe we might be allowed to stay for more than a single night, Bryce murmured, reaching for the sack. You were misled. That was all the explanation he would receive, it seemed. My men will be outside the door, waiting for you to emerge. They will lead you to the courtyard. You will rest as much as you like through the morning, but you will not be anywhere in or around the castle by the time I am through with my wedding ceremony. And I will have my men search for you. You can be certain of it. He motioned to the door with a wave of his hand, dismissing his guest. Bryce retrieved the sack, it was heavy, speaking to the Earl's generosity, and made haste in leaving Remington's presence. He did not wish to breathe the same air any longer. Guilt plagued him as he followed the men out to the courtyard. No wonder Alana had been willing to run away on foot. He might have if he were in her place. Roderick stirred on Bryce's entrance, rubbing sleep from his eyes as he sat up. Where were ye? he asked before spying the canvas sack. Collecting payment. He tossed the bag Roderick's way before sitting down with his back to the stone wall. Before sunrise or nearly? Why? Roderick opened the bag, his eyes widening when he saw all that was inside. She was trying to escape again. She was? Roderick chuckled, shaking his head. I must give her credit for trying. She does not know when to stop. I, and I'm beginning to understand why. Roderick grunted a sleepy warning. It's none of our affair. We were not paid to convince the lass of Remington's finer points. Bryce snorted. Nay, and we'd have been pressed to find any if that had been the case. He's that sort of man, eh? Bryce nodded. Roderick sighed. I'm sorry to hear it. She's a nice lass. He wants us out of the castle by the time the wedding ceremony is through. His men will search the place for us to be certain we've gone. I do not think he likes us over much. Roderick looked around at their sparse accommodations with a grin. What gave you the first hint? Bryce did not see the humour, dark though it was. He tapped the back of his head against the wall, anxious and irritated and seeing truly how useless he was to Alana. Would that he could knock himself senseless and allow sleep to overtake him. He would merely dream of her, like as not. There is nothing we can do to help her, Roderick reminded him. As though I needed you to tell me this. I thought it best to speak it aloud just the same. I know how much you wish to help her. So do I. But we are not involved. I know. Bryce stretched out on the straw, pulling a blanket up to his shoulders and closing his eyes. It would be easier to feign sleep than it would be to continue answering questions. All the while, that sack full of silver weighed on his conscience. Was that all a lass's life was worth? Chapter 27 The day dawned bright and sunny, a gentle warmth in the air which spoke of summer's final days. There was hardly a cloud in the sky. The river Eden sparkled and danced, like an endless flow of jewels which moved past Alana's window. It would have been the perfect day for a wedding. For anyone else's wedding. Rain would have felt more appropriate for hers. She stood at the window, wearing her mother's dress. A lovely thing pale blue silk. Plain, no embellishment. Just as Elizabeth Stuart had worn it. While her family had once been well off as Edward had pointed out, their fortunes had changed dramatically. They hadn't the wealth necessary to order the creation of a fine, embroidered masterpiece. Alana ran her hands down the front, smoothing the delicate cloth, wondering if her mother had been as terribly frightened prior to her vows. The gown which Edward wished for her to wear, much finer sky-blue velvet with exquisite gold embroidery around the sleeves, neck and train, was on the bed as it had been placed for her that morning once her ladies-in-waiting had left her alone. She would not wear the thing. She needed in some small way to feel close to someone who had loved her. She was not a child. She understood the nobility did not wed for love. But she had not been raised as a noblewoman. Her clan was not even the largest or most prosperous in the Highlands, hence the need to marry her off to someone with a great deal of wealth. It was unthinkable, 
the idea of sharing her bed with a man she did not love or even like. In fact she loathed Edward Remington. There was something about him which made her skin seem to crawl, as though tiny insects ran along it. She would be his bride in a matter of hours. Then came the feast, then the bedding. Her mouth twisted into a snarl as her stomach churned. The flowers she wore in her hair, tiny white buds whose name she did not know, as it was a species specific to England, gave off a charming scent when the breeze blew through the room from the open window. It reminded her of her days on the road, riding the little grey mare from home. The countryside had been thick with heather, sometimes as far as the eye could see, and the breeze had blown the scent her way time and again. It made her think of Bryce. Then again, so many things did and likely always would. The thought of bedding Bryce did not disgust her, as did the thought of bedding her soon-to-be husband. For she knew what it meant to be near him, to wish for nothing more than the pressure of his lips upon hers. She had almost bedded him at the inn, and would have if he hadn't stopped in time. Her body responded favorably, to the memory. No, being with him in such an intimate manner would be no hardship. She might even have enjoyed it, as he would undoubtedly have been good and gentle with her before sweeping her up in the fullness of his embrace. He'd always been good and gentle with her, after all. Even when he was anything but gentle, even while he shook her or threw her over his shoulder or accused her of being difficult and argumentative, he'd been good to her. He'd only done what he felt was best for her. He had even returned her to her chambers out of concern for what Remington would do to her if he found her missing. She saw him in her mind's eye, his bushy hair and beard, his twinkling eyes. The way they had only to exchange a look to know what the other was thinking. His almost shy smile when they'd presented her with the mare. The calmness of his voice when he'd spoken to her in the woods, when she'd nearly been attacked by the boar. The sense of relief which had washed over her like a soft spring rain, when she knew he was going to make everything all right again, somehow. A single tear overflowed her eye, running slowly down her cheek. She loved him. And she would never see him again. Bryce, she breathed, turning and dashing from the room with only one purpose in mind. She had to see him, had to tell him. Even if nothing were to ever come of her admission, he would at least know she had loved him. That he was the only man she'd ever love, no matter how many Viscounts she was forced to bear by another. The castle was in a near uproar, bodies moving to and fro, hardly any of them taking notice of her though she was the bride. She did not know any of them naturally, making it easy to slip between and through groups of them. She loved him. That knowledge alone made her feet feel light, her head a bit dizzy. She loved him, and she thought he might love her too. Or at least like her very much. She burst from the entry, her head swimming, the sunlight almost alarmingly bright. She looked around at the stable boys and servants, the maids and butchers carrying great sides of pig and lamb to the pits behind the kitchen. He would be in the stables, of course, and she lifted the hem of her gown, to prevent it being ruined before hurrying that way. Would that he were alone. He was not alone. He was not even there. Bryce, she whispered, not daring to speak his name any louder for fear of someone getting the wrong notion, or rather, the correct notion which would get her into quite a bit of trouble. There was no answer. None of them were there. The horses they'd ridden all the way from Scotland weren't in any of the stalls either. They had left for good. A cry of grief escaped her. It was over. All of it. He was gone from her life forever. She walked from the stables on much heavier feet, wandering in a daze. Once again, no one seemed to notice her presence, merely rushing around her. Was that the way the rest of her life would proceed? Would she be invisible to all those around her? Except for her husband, who would take her when he wanted her and otherwise leave her lonely. She went to the gates which opened up to the road, and looked down its length, down to the emerald forest below, wishing harder than she ever had that she might have been able to escape that morning. Being there, even with the animals and the cold nights and no food, would have been a step up from where she was just then. Even dressed in silk, waiting for her wedding to take place. 
Her heart leapt into her throat when she recognized four riders on the road, so far from the castle that she'd almost missed noticing them. Bryce's hair stood out from the others. She had only just missed him. Oh how she wished she could call out to him, to beg him to return and take her along. She bit back a sob, and the scream which would undoubtedly follow it. He was leaving. She couldn't stop him. Perhaps it was a matter of her being fanciful, but... He heard her. Or he heard something or felt something which made him turn back. Whatever the reason, he looked up to where she stood. She lifted a hand in silent acknowledgement, wishing most fervently that she could do more. It would have to be enough. He lifted his hand in return, then he rode on with the others. What more could either of them do? What is the meaning of this? Edward's accusatory tone brought her back to the present moment, and to the truth of her situation. She turned, already searching about for the right excuse. I wish to bid my escorts farewell, but I see they have already been on their way. Yes, he agreed. And a good thing too, as I warned them to make haste. Why, she asked, perplexed. It seemed as though they were welcome. He took a step closer, overwhelming her to the point where she flinched away. Because I wished it that way. Haven't I warned you, Alana, about questioning me? Did I not already tell you I would have none of it? I am in yes, of course. I was merely curious. I have no time for your curiosity. He stepped away, smoothing down the front of his velvet tunic. Bloodred seemed to be a favorite color of his. Gold buttons decorated the front, matching the embroidery at the collar and along the black fur cape he wore. He must have noted the way she took in his garments, for he did the same to her. What are you wearing? What is this rag? Her face flushed more out of anger than shame. It was the gown my mother wore during her wedding. It is hideous. Some Scottish garb no doubt. Barely fit for the peasantry. It is silk, she whispered. Far too rich for peasantry. What did you say? he hissed, closing the distance between them once again. Are you hard of hearing my wife or simply daft? When I only just reminded you of the ill-advisedness of contradicting or questioning me. This is the gown I wish to wear, as it was worn by my mother. My English mother, she added with a defiant glare. He spoke not a word. He simply slapped her so hard a light flashed before her eyes. She staggered back, falling to the ground, dirtying her precious gown when she landed. One hand cupped her throbbing cheek. Her eyes met his and found nothing. Not even contempt. Go to your chambers and change into the gown I chose for you, he ordered. There is not much time before the ceremony begins. With that he returned to keep where his guests awaited him. He had not bothered to help her to her feet, and naturally none of the servants in the courtyard paid her so much as a cursory glance. They left her alone. Sitting in the dirt in a ruined gown. Holding her stinging face in one hand and wishing the boar had done its worst. Chapter 28 Bryce would carry the sight of her in his heart always. Standing there at the top of the hill, the castle walls to her back wearing her blue silk. The most beautiful creature he'd ever seen, even from a distance. Would that he could fool himself into believing her life would be a happy one, or even a long one. We're better off leaving now, at any rate, Fergus announced, trying to lighten the mood around him. That was normally a task taken up by Bryce, but he did not have the strength for it just then. Why do ye say that? Roderick asked. The sooner we leave, the sooner we return home. I would enjoy resting a short while. Aye, and ye deserve it more than any of us, after nearly losing an arm. Och, it wasn't nearly so serious as that. Fergus snorted. Though I would not mind over much if ye were to tell tales of my bravery. Particularly while in the presence of a comely lass. Three of them laughed. Bryce did not. There was a heaviness in him, something terrible enough to make him question whether he would ever be the same. If there would ever be a day when he did not awaken with her face at the forefront of his thoughts. If he would ever stop questioning what was happening to her, 
how she was faring as a countess. Whether she was at least content with her lot in life, perhaps with a few wee bairns to take her mind off her troubles. She had changed him, no question. I've made a decision, Roderick announced with a glance in Bryce's direction. With the silver from Remington, we have more than enough to keep ourselves comfortable for a while. I believe it would be best to winter with Porrick and the rest. I was stubborn. I apologize. This managed to work its way through even Bryce's dark mood. Truly now. What changed your mind, he asked. I've had time to think about it, is all. It isn't charity to accept an offer from a brother. It is good sense. Especially when my wife is expecting. Her name is Caitlin, isn't it? Fergus snorted, raising his wounded arm as a defense when Roderick glared his way. You would not hit a man you only just called a hero, would ye? I don't believe I called ye any such thing. Roderick smirked. Even Bryce had to chuckle along with them. Life would return to its natural state. They would go on as they had, spend a long winter at the Anderson house, then take to the road again in the spring. All would be well. It was for the best, leaving Alana behind. That was the job they'd been paid for. The woods thickened around them, casting them in semi-darkness. It was peaceful there, quiet, the only sounds those of the animals scurrying through the brush and their voices. It was almost possible to believe they were already back in Scotland, back where they belonged. Would that it were true. The more ground he could place between himself and Remington, the better. At least he would never have to set eyes on the brute again. Hooves pounded the road behind them, causing the four of them to split off to either side in anticipation of what was to come. Who might that be? Quinn asked as they waited. Whoever it is, they're in a terrible rush, Fergus observed just before the horse came into view. A brown mare with a white star on its forehead. Oh gods, Bryce muttered, bringing his gelding about in hopes of stopping the creature. It was riderless, merely running at full speed through the woods. If anything, it would kill itself before long. The mare reared, hooves pawing the air before it landed on all fours again. Bryce held up both hands, hoping his familiar scent would help calm the beast, while taking pains to calm his horse at the same time. What does this mean? Roderick asked, though none of them could possibly find an answer. The mare calmed herself, breathing heavily. Something spooked her, Fergus murmured, stroking the already sweat-soaked animal. Then what is this? He slid his fingers beneath the pommel, and came back with a ragged strip of blue silk. The same shade of blue Alana had been wearing. Bryce's blood turned to ice. She ran away, he whispered. Oh, for the love of all that's holy, Roderick muttered. Does she truly mean to kill herself? Possibly, Bryce replied, though he was hardly paying attention. Something spooked the mare while Alana was riding. She fell from it. She may have been hurt. It will be nothing compared to what happens when Remington finds her, Quinn observed. Bryce shot him a filthy glare. Quinn held up both hands in defense. Come now. You think we were all sleeping when you returned this morning? We heard what you two were on about. He's a beast, not fit to marry anyone, much less a nice lass such as herself. I would run if I were her, Fergus agreed. Bryce locked eyes with Roderick, asking a silent question. Should they? And if they found her, what would they do? Many more hooves shook the ground, signalling the coming approach of a team of horses. He had to think quickly. Get the mare off the road, he decided, tossing his reins to Quinn before dismounting and leading the horse into the shadow of an alder, where he tied the reins off to a branch within moments of the arrival of four of Remington's guards. He recognized the leader, the same blond-haired lad. He must have been the captain of the guards, always taking the lead. Have you seen her? he asked without preamble. Bryce returned to the road, hands tugging at the waist of his trousers as though he'd just been relieving himself. What's the trouble? he asked as he took the reins from Quinn. Earl Remington sent us out to look for his bride, the lad snapped. Gone was the bright cheerful demeanor, replaced by cold disgust. She seems to have run away. Bryce exchanged looks with his friends, shrugging. We've just been on our way from the castle. 
She did not ride past you, one of the other men asked. Nay, I'm certain we'd have noticed, Roderick replied, frowning and stroking his chin. It does seem strange, does it not? She may well have cut through the woods and come around us, Quinn offered. After all, if she ran into one of you or even one of us, her plan would have been ruined. That's so, the captain agreed with a sneer. The earl is terribly vexed, the guests are waiting. He wishes for none of this to reach their understanding. I would feel the same way, Bryce lamented, shaking his head. She's a slippery one, that lass. Tried to give us the slip once twice along the way, in fact. The men brought their horses about, prepared to continue on. If you see her, make haste in returning her. Earl Remington will make it worth your effort. You can be assured of it, Bryce said, waving as the four anxious guards continued at a high rate of speed away from them. Only when they were truly alone again did Bryce mount his gelding, looking both ways down the road. What do ye plan to do? Roderick asked. Find her, of course, he replied. If they didn't see her on the road, we know she did not fall there. She must be in the woods, somewhere. You three go ahead. I will take this on myself. You'll do no such thing, Fergus replied. Ye cannot stop me, Bryce argued. I don't believe any of us are wanting to stop ye, Quinn assured him with a grin. We're going with ye. Aye. Do ye think none of us knows what the lass means to ye? Roderick snickered. Besides, she's a Scottish lass. She's one of ours. Bryce's heart swelled with pride. It's a dangerous thing. What if he finds out? What of it? Roderick shrugged. And he will not. This is hardly the first time we've found ourselves in a tight spot. And so, rather than continuing down the road and through the earldom, the four of them left the road and began walking the horses through the forest with Bryce leading the mare by the reins. Alana! Bryce called, albeit quietly, so as not to arouse the attention of any stragglers to the search party. Elana? Where are ye, lass? Chapter 29 Alana crouched with her back to a birch tree, arms wrapped around her knees as the enormity of what she'd done sank into her bones. She had defied him. He might find her. And she no longer had anything to ride. For the second time, a horse had thrown her and bolted. This time she had a squirrel to thank for it, as it had darted out from beneath a bush and spooked the poor thing. That mare was all she had left from Bryce, and it had deserted her. Now she would never catch up to him. Oh Bryce, she whispered, lowering her head as she began to weep. Tears stained her ruined gown, soaking into the silk. Such a beautiful gown too. Yes, beautiful but it would not serve her well once day turned to night and she began to shiver in earnest. She might just as well be unclothed. She would freeze to death. Or starve. When her bruised cheek throbbed it served as a reminder that there were worse things to suffer through. Physical pain was one thing, it faded in time, sometimes rather quickly. Humiliation, on the other hand, did not. It grew and festered long after a blow was landed. He would have humiliated her time and again, and thought nothing of it. That had been what decided her. It was not as if she had made her decision lightly. She'd known what she was getting herself into when she slipped into the stables, and saddled up her mare with trembling hands, hardly breathing all the while. The seams along the bottom half of the gown had split when she'd climbed into the saddle, but the garment was already a lost cause, and there was no time to mourn it just then. She'd driven her heels into the mare's sides and ridden at full gallop through the courtyard, through the gates, down the road and toward the woods. She might even have laughed at some point, though it was all a blur by then. A rabbit hopped near her, causing her to jump and whisper one of the many colourful words she'd learned from Bryce and the rest. Would that she had something to snare the rabbit with, then again, roasting would require a fire, and she did not dare build one for fear of attracting attention. What was he thinking, her would-be husband? His rage would be a frightful thing. His guests would soon wonder where she was, when the ceremony would begin. And there he would be, waiting in his red velvet, unable to answer. It was nearly enough to bring a smile to her face. At the very least, she had made certain he would not forget her. 
she'd hurt his pride. Strangely, her biggest concern of all was for Bryce and the others. Would they get far enough from the castle and the Earl's lands before he sent someone to collect the silver they'd earned? For she would not have put such a despicable thing past him. Please let them get away safely, she prayed, closing her eyes momentarily. Please let them be all right. Let Bryce return home where they cannot find him. She could not stay where she was, so near the road, granted she was deep enough into the forest that she could not see it, but that did not mean a search party would find it impossible to locate her. Standing was a slow process, her backside smarting even worse than her cheek had after having landed on it from horseback. If I make it out of this with my life, I may never ride a horse again, she muttered, lifting what was left of her gown, to avoid tripping or ensnaring herself in brambles. Her slippers were rather ill-suited to the task at hand, having been intended for a wedding ceremony and the feast which would follow. Every stone, every root made her wince but still she continued. The memory of Edward Remington's empty eyes was enough to keep her feet moving in spite of the pain. The trees grew sparser the longer she walked, the sunlight brighter, making her travel even more treacherous. Rather than wandering between them in plain sight, she took to darting from one to the next, waiting a moment in between to be certain there was no one watching. While she would have hoped to hear an approaching horse, there was no certainty that she would. There were times when the blood rushing in her ears drowned out the sound of anything else, even her own footsteps over twigs and dry leaves. Even so, the sound of a stream eventually reached her. Thank you, she whispered to the unseen presence which clearly guided her footsteps. The trickling grew louder, louder, with Alana nearly running out of sheer thirst until she burst through a green leafy bush and found herself teetering on the sharp sloping banks which led to the rushing stream. It was lined on both sides by towering mighty trees, the species of which she was uncertain. She only knew they were enormous, as big as the tree which had fallen on the road and led to her second attempt at escaping. The trunks were thicker than the columns in the castle, and in some places they grew nearly horizontal to the stream. As though they wished to bend down to take a drink, as she did once she scrambled down the steep decline. The water was a blessing, cool and fresh and nearly enough to revive her. She washed her hands, then carefully applied a handful of water to her aching cheek, providing a little relief. Where would she go from here? She might follow the stream but where would it lead? Into one of the farms which belonged to the Earl? Or past his land? Would word spread of her escape? That was a difficult question to ponder, for spreading the word of her escape would mean admitting his bride had run from him. Surely, the guests in the castle, she remembered them vividly and with disgust, would return home full of tales of Edward Remington's humiliation. She had already heard how they gossiped, and knew they would consider this a tale worth telling. And telling again. Even so, that might not happen for another day. Perhaps longer, depending upon when the guests left for home. She might have time to distance herself before she became infamous. Then, looking down at herself, she wondered how in the world a woman in a torn stained silk gown would escape notice. Tears of frustration and fatigue filled her eyes, and she stomped her foot in consternation. Then, as if in reply, a twig snapped nearby. Her heart took off at a furious rate as her eyes moved back and forth, searching for a place to hide. The sound had come from behind her, so she dashed toward one of the low stretching trees in front of her. A quick scramble up the bank meant scraping her hands and knees, but she was too far gone to notice. She hid herself behind the tree, gathering the ends of the gown up into a ball to avoid their hanging down in plain sight. It was difficult to breathe. She leaned against the rough bark, straining to hear what might be said, if in fact the intruder was human. It might easily have been a thirsty animal, in search of water. This is as good a way as any, I suppose. She froze holding her breath. A man's voice. For a moment she saw herself back in the keep, starved or beaten, locked away in her chambers. They would capture her, take her back no matter how she begged and pleaded. Even if they did, she would find another way. Even if it meant jumping from her window, she would do it. So long as she could be free in some way. It was difficult to hear everything over the sound of running water, but she managed to pick out some of the conversation. 
We'll need water. If only we knew how far it runs. I if only we knew a great many things. She clutched her chest, not daring to believe what her ears told her. That was a Scottish brogue, belonging to someone with a sharp tongue. That was Bryce. She dared lift her head past the trunk, peering over it to where she had only been standing moments earlier. Sure enough, Bryce and Quinn stood there, looking rather put out as they scanned the area for any signs of her. Bryce, she gasped allowing her body to slide down the sloping bank. He was on her in a flash, lifting her to her feet before enfolding her in a tight embrace. Oh class, I feared we would never find ye in this forest. I thought I would never see ye again, she murmured, her face pressed to his shoulder as her heart shouted for joy. It was him, really him, and he was holding her, and he would keep her safe as he always had. She need not fear. Do you think I would leave you in these woods, all alone? How was I to know you would find out? She was reluctant to pull away, but wished to look up at him. How did ye? The mare met us on the road, he replied with a smile which turned into a snarl when he got a better look at her face and the bruise she bore. Ock the bastard. I'm all right truly. In fact it no longer pained her, strange as it seemed. She wondered if anything would ever pain her again. Is this what made you run? He struck ye. Aye, she whispered, swallowing back the lump which had formed in her throat. He did. I couldn't. You'll never have to. He held her tighter than before, one hand stroking her hair. You'll never have to, lass. I will see to it. Well, well, Roderick called out from over Bryce's shoulder. It's glad we are to see ye, lass. No gladder than I am certain, she whispered with a shaky laugh. His jaw clenched tight when he spied her bruised cheek. I will kill him, he vowed. Please. No. It's enough that you're here with me. She was certain her heart glowed as Quinn and Fergus joined them, then informed her of the recovery of her mare. You brought her along. That was enough to tip her over the edge, and she burst into tears. Bryce patted her shoulder, assuring her they would never have left her beautiful horse behind. And we'll ride out of here, all of us, he promised. How? She looked around at them, wiping her eyes. If Edward sends his men out to look for me, they'll surely be searching the roads. We know. We saw them ourselves, Bryce muttered before spitting on the ground. How will we manage it then? She asked again, looking from one of them to the other in the hopes of them having an answer. We'll simply have to wait until night, Roderick decided. Late at night well past dusk. We might be able to avoid notice if we travel while those living along the road are asleep. We could even get through the village if we're very careful. I have a cloak in my pack you might wear when offered. You would be noticed otherwise. I I would that. She looked around at them, overcome with affection. That they had searched for her alone was reason enough for her to love them always. That they intended to once again escort her, this time out of the country. She did not have the words to express her gratitude. It didn't appear as though they expected thanks in any case. Chapter 30 Quinn and Fergus went ahead, intending to ride a distance up the road to look for signs of a search party. The night sky was clouded over, the moon and stars hidden from view giving them an advantage. A search party would like as not need to use lit torches in order to progress. They would be easy to spy from a distance, giving Alana time to hide herself. So Bryce needed to believe. His gelding pawed the ground impatiently, shifting forward and back as though it wished to break free and run full out. As though it sensed the tight nerves, the raw excitement they all felt as they awaited the signal. Alana sat beside him, astride her mare. There was an intensity about her, a cold rigidity. She stared straight ahead, as though focusing on only what was just in front of her, though her eyes seemed to see something far beyond them. She was looking at, what? Remington's mistreatment. What would undoubtedly happen to all of them should they be found? If her thoughts frightened her she did a marvellous job of pretending otherwise, her back ramrod straight, her head high self-possessed always in control of her skittish horse. He would have ridden into battle with her, 
at that moment. A low whistle floated to them on the night air. Quinn's whistle. Roderick nodded to Bryce, who led the way out of a thick patch of bushy buckthorn and onto the road with Alana close behind. Roderick would bring up the rear, watching over his shoulder. They brought the horses to a quick trot, easily covering the stretch of road between them and their lookouts. By the time Fergus and Quinn were with them again, the entire group was outside the forest. I walk so far. Alana whispered, eyes round with surprise. Aye ye did. No wonder ye wore those slippers down to nearly nothing. She was all but barefoot, not to mention half naked in her ruined finery. He would make certain to purchase new garments for her when they reached their homeland. Quinn's cloak served well to cover most of the lass, but she would be in need of something to serve through days of travel. They moved quickly, as quietly as they could through the darkness. Bryce did what he could to affix an eye on the road ahead, while also keeping watch over Alana. It appeared she was hardly in need of watching, her head slowly swinging from side to side as she watched for any signs of danger. He would have reminded her once again that she need only ride and leave the watching and protection to the men surrounding her, but that would have been wasted effort. They passed one farmhouse then another, riding alongside rock walls which lined the road. The houses appeared dark, the occupants asleep. He attempted to remember how many such houses they had passed on their way from the village, but could not. He hadn't known there would be a need to pay attention to such things. Who could have foreseen what they would find themselves doing? The past one final house, dark as the others had been, the only sound coming from the area the lowing of cattle in the barn. A cat walked along the wall to Bryce's right, its green eyes glowing in the dark as it watched the party progress. If that is our only witness we should be safe, Fergus whispered. Bryce did not share his attitude. It seemed too easy. He would not feel satisfied until they were in Scotland, and even then would likely be on his guard until they reached Anderson Lands. They reached the top of a hill, which Bryce remembered cresting upon exiting the village. This meant they were close, and closer than ever to being captured. Do you think the guards would have spread the word in the village? Roderick asked in a low voice. The question was likely intended for Bryce, but it was Alana who answered. Nay. It would mean embarrassment for him, and he would not want that. I agree. Bryce nodded. Remember, they said he did not wish for word to get out among the guests. They would not have come out explained who they searched for or why. If only that were true. He was not certain whether he could believe it. Roderick pointed to Quinn and Fergus. Perhaps the two of you ought to go ahead and ride through the village, see if there are any guards still on the watch for her. They might not even recognize you, if they're so concerned with finding her. I. Can you imagine what it would be to return to the castle without her? Quinn agreed with a grim smile. I canna say I would return if I were in their position. I might take a new name and learn a trade. Fergus smirked, bringing the horse around. We shan't be long. We will await you here. A grove of birch trees would provide shelter and cover in the meantime. Alana rubbed her arms, shivering after she dismounted. Bryce longed to wrap her in his warmth but held back. It was not the time, nor was he certain she would accept his embrace. It was enough to have her there, safe, under his protection. When he remembered his despair at believing he would never see her again, and the certainty that her life as Countess Remington would not be a long one, the ability to look at her and hear her breathing was more than he could have hoped for. She looked over her shoulder to where he stood, waiting, watching. What will happen to me after this, she whispered. I do not know what ye mean. He exchanged a glance with Roderick, who was wise and discreet enough to give them some measure of privacy. Bryce knew without asking that his friend would keep watch while he and Alana spoke. She was unaware of this, too concerned with looking at him as though he'd gone simple. What will I do? Where will I go? I cannot return to the Stuarts, of course. Douglas would either personally escort me back, or have me killed for defying him. The lass was merely conjecturing, but the very idea was enough to set Bryce's blood to boiling. Ye know we would never allow such a thing. 
She turned to him, head tilted to one side. He could hardly make out her expression in the deep darkness, but thought he might be able to imagine the pursed lips, the narrowed eyes. She always looked that way when she was assessing someone or something. She had, when they'd first met, standing outside the door to her father's home. How his feelings toward her had changed since that day, when he had found her tiresome and disagreeable. It seemed as if an eternity had passed since then. Why would you not, she whispered. It seems you are going to all this trouble for nothing. I would hardly call ye nothing, lass. There was so much he wanted to say, an entire lifetime's worth, but he did not dare speak it. You have put yourself in a precarious position, she insisted. When the Stuarts get word of my escape, for ye know Edward will be certain to demand things be made right, though I have no knowledge of what that would entail, he will be looking for me as well. And if I am with you, he held up a hand to stop her, shaking his head. Do not worry yourself over that. How can I not? Are ye daft? She laughed softly, throwing her hands into the air. Last night, ye begged me to consider the others. Roderick, his wife and child, your brother. Quinn. And now ye tell me it's no matter, that I need not bother myself. Which is it? Now that the thing is done, there is no choice but to follow through, he replied. I do not blame ye for fleeing. None of us do. We wish to see ye safe, out of his control, unharmed by him. I suppose I wonder why it is you're taking this on yourself then. And what you plan to do once we've crossed over into Scotland? He could not quite answer that, for he did not have a plan. All that mattered just then was getting her away from her betrothed, there had not been time to think beyond that. He knew what he wanted, what he wished for. That she be his. First, the matter of escaping England. A horse approached on the road. They waited with bated breath, Alana's hand finding Bryce's in the darkness and squeezing hard. He held a finger up to his lips, urging her silence though he did not need to do so. She would know well enough. He looked to Roderick, who held the horses in place as best he could, and endeavoured to quiet them. It is only I, Quinn whispered. Alana let out a sigh, falling against Bryce who bolstered her. All is well, he murmured before leading her out to where Quinn waited. We saw nothing to give us pause. The village is asleep, or as good as. We ought to make haste. Bryce did not disagree. They hastened to mount the horses, and proceeded to the village at a trot, still watchful but somewhat more hopeful. Fergus met up with them at the crossroads of the two main thoroughfares. It could be that we miss them, he murmured, or it could be that they took rooms for the night and planned to continue their search on the morrow. All the more reason to make haste, Roderick observed, looking to Bryce for agreement. He nodded firmly, and all of them spurred the horses to greater speed once they'd made it through the heart of the village. Only when the sun was on the rise did they stop, all of them at the point of exhaustion and yet very nearly delirious with gladness at their escape. Did we make it? Alana asked again and again, as though she could scarcely believe it. Aye. It would appear as though we did. He helped her from the saddle. She was stiff, groaning in discomfort after everything she had endured. Now that the excitement had passed, and they were reasonably certain of their escape, she would feel the pain and exhaustion more acutely. One of the many things he'd learned in battle. Find her a place to sleep, Roderick suggested. We'll tend to the animals. And so, with her leaning against him, Bryce led Alana into a clearing well away from the road. Pine trees surrounded the open space, providing seclusion. The only intruders he spotted were a pair of frolicking squirrels who darted away at the sound of needles crunching underfoot. Have I thanked ye? she asked, her head lolling back when she looked up at him. There was barely strength left in the lass to speak, yet she insisted on trying to do so. I canna remember, he answered in truth, though it matters not. I know. We all do. But you especially, she whispered as he cleared a place for her to rest. She swayed on her feet, prompting him to hasten his work. Once he removed her cloak and spread it out on the ground, she sank down upon it with a happy sigh. Why especially? he asked as he wrapped the ends of the garment around her. 
because I know it was ye who wanted to find me. Her eyes slid shut. How? Why it was important for him to know at that very moment was beyond him. The lass needed her sleep, so in fact did he, and yet he would have shaken her just to keep her awake long enough to answer. Because? But it was too late, for she was already sleeping by the time the word escaped her lips. He sighed, running a hand through her hair to loosen the last of the white buds which had been tucked into it. Sleep, lass, he whispered. Sleep, my love. Chapter 31 Riding astride was much easier when one wore trousers. I do not know that I will ever wish to go back to wearing a kirtle, Alana confessed. This is much more comfortable. I can understand why you wear them. I do not think I would make a fetching sight in a kirtle. Fergus snorted from in front of her. Do not give yourself too little credit. She laughed, and the others laughed along with her. It was easier to join in their jesting, without the sense of a noose tightening around her neck. She enjoyed the scenery as well. They had followed the Irish Sea on leaving England, rather than following the road which would lead them to Lockerbie. They were far west of Stuart Lands by the time they reached Solway Firth, which they'd followed north along the River Nith. She'd never seen so much of the world, had never witnessed fishermen bringing in their day's catch. Had never seen so many people, heard so many voices raised in so many varying dialects from all around the kingdoms. All the while, the men had taken turns stopping in at the occasional tavern and inn they'd passed on the way to listen for word of her escape. Nothing had come of it yet. They tended to sleep during the day and ride at night for the sake of avoiding notice whenever possible. Alana had grown accustomed to the night air, which grew cooler with each passing evening, and had come to look forward to the beauty of dawn as it encroached, spreading across the sky and the land beneath it. It truly is beautiful, she sighed one morning while the group rode farther north. Ben Lomond stretched up toward the sky, well ahead of them, its glorious peaks blending in with the early morning mist which hung about them. At its base was Loch Lomond, as blue as the sky above it. The wooded areas about the base of the mountain had begun to trade their green leaves for red, orange and gold. It took her breath away. Aye that it is, lass. The two of them rode somewhat behind the others, and there were moments in which it seemed as though only they were on the road. No one else. She was merely being fanciful. Roderick and Quinn were in the middle of a good-natured argument over the cloth Quinn had acquired for the making of a new tunic, while Fergus laughed until it seemed as though he might be sick. She had grown fond of all of them, not merely for the fact that they had gone out of their way to rescue her. Gone was the assumption that they were merely rough, unseemly highlanders. She enjoyed speaking with them, listening to their stories. Each of them had lived a rich, interesting life. Including Bryce. The trousers suit you well then? He asked in a softer voice than before for her ears only. I a bit large. She grinned, double-checking the rope they'd used as a belt to cinch in the waist. Bryce was considerably larger than she, after all. But serviceable. It had become increasingly clear that, cloak or no cloak, she could not continue wearing the silk gown any longer. It sat in her pack, folded carefully in spite of the way it had been ruined. Since then, she had taken to wearing the extra garments the men had packed for themselves. Modesty was something she could ill afford at that point, though she'd still suffered a slight pang of embarrassment at first. She looked out over the countryside, the early morning light casting everything in a soft golden glow. How much longer do ye think it will be, until we reach the River Nevis? Three days, perhaps four, he estimated. If the weather holds out. What then? She did not dare ask for fear that he would remind her of the need to part ways. They had not spoken of it, like as not because she was afraid to bring it up. She did not wish to hear for a fact that they would go about their lives on their own. There had been several moments over the course of their journey back through Scotland that she'd been certain of his intentions. A look, a pause, a soft word. Something to give her hope. But nothing had come of it, but more of the same. Camaraderie, mostly. That was not what she wanted. Being his friend was not enough. 
Perhaps she had been granted enough favors by the Lord and his angels. She had escaped an unhappy marriage. She was no longer beholden to a heartless father. She might have died in the forest twice over but had not thanks to her rescuers. What more could heaven possibly allow her? She decided as they rode on toward Ben Lomond that she would find a way to be happy with her lot in life, whatever it might be. The men had spoken of a need for a woman's help in the Anderson household. Perhaps she might be suited to the task, if poor Eric Anderson would only be patient with her at first. What are you thinking, lass? Bryce asked his voice soft. Would that he were speaking words of love in that soft tone. Oh, many things, she said, waving a hand as though it meant little. Wondering what will become of the rest of my life. Nothing too important. He snorted. Nay, nothing requiring much concern. I do not believe I ever gave enough consideration to what I would do for the rest of my life, she admitted. I assumed I would marry, most likely someone chosen for me. Not someone so dreadful, of course. Of course. And yet, I never gave thought to the rest of it. Where I would go, what sort of life I would lead. I always considered myself. I know not how to explain it. Above certain things. Above being told what to do by a man, above being pushed around or treated as though I were a mere possession. How foolish of me. Not foolish. It was when I had no better plan to follow. I did not consider what I might do instead. Ah. I see what you mean. He fell silent for a moment, the two of them riding with nothing but the sound of hooves hitting soil between them. This was the time. If he were ever going to tell her he loved her, that he intended to make her his own, this was when he would have to say it. There would be no better chance. She watched him from the corner of her eye. What was he thinking? Why was it so difficult for two people, who'd once easily spoken their minds to one another, to get to the heart of the matter? When he offered nothing in return, she finally decided she'd had enough. Go oh, there, she murmured, pulling on the reins. He looked over his shoulder in surprise. What made you stop? You? You did. She shook her head, laughing at herself. I've been a fool. Afraid to speak my mind since leaving England because I felt I owed it to ye. I would no longer argue or be disagreeable, as you once accused. He frowned. I do not understand ye, lass. I am not surprised. She smirked. What I'm trying to say is, what do you want from me? Do you want me to be yours or do ye not, Bryce MacDougall? He sputtered, his face going as red as a beet. You've got a tongue on ye, Alana Stewart, he managed to choke out. Aye, so you've told me. What is it then? Do you want me, or shall I find a way to earn a living elsewhere? I know I'll never find another man, so that is not something I can consider. Why can ye not, he counted. She rolled her eyes. Because I only want one man. She pointed to him, jabbing her finger in his direction. Is it not clear to ye yet? Have ye not seen it? I've done everything I can aside from speaking the words plainly, and all that stopped me from that was the fear that ye did not feel the same. I cannot understand ye at all. Why would ye go to all the trouble to rescue me time and again, if ye did not at least care for me? Why indeed, he asked. Well then, what are ye waiting for? The sky to fall on ye? I love ye Bryce MacDougall, and if ye do not feel the same now is the time to tell me so. The words came out in a rush before she could stop herself, and once they had been spoken, she would have liked to crawl into a hole and never come out. How could she be so brash, so bold? This was not the way she had imagined things at all. Disappointment weighed on her heart, while tears welled up in her eyes. He sat still, straight, as though he needed to absorb all she'd said. Ark, what did he think of her? She had shown him the sharp side of her tongue many times, but never to such a degree. Thank you for putting it plainly, lass, he said, nodding slowly. I see I took too long. I didn't wish to make you wonder or fret. You are still causing me to wonder and fret, she pointed out, wishing she could strangle him. I'll put it plainly then. 
He swung his right leg over the saddle, dismounting smoothly before reaching for her. She placed her hands on his shoulders, allowing him to lift her and place her on the ground. He took her face in his hands, thumbs stroking her cheeks, a slow smile tugging at the corners of his mouth. I do love you, and wish for you to be my wife. She let out the breath, she only just then discovered she'd been holding. Truly. Truly. He nodded. I didn't know how to say it, or when would be best. I thought perhaps I ought to wait until we reached the Anderson home, but now I see that was folly. Forgive me. There is nothing to forgive, she assured him, smiling through the tears which had begun to fall in earnest. He loved her. Of all the strange, unpredictable turns her life could have taken, this was one she would never have imagined in a million guesses. For she never knew such complete joy was possible. You will marry me then, he asked. Yes I will. His hands dropped to her shoulders so he might pull her closer, his lips finally meeting hers as she had dreamed they would. His kiss was just as sweet as she had hoped, sweeter even because there was love behind it. Love, and the promise of a life together. She was certain her heart would burst. You've finally done it then? Roderick called out from where he and the others had stopped. It took you long enough. You'll want to talk, Bryce grumbled, wrapping Alana in a warm embrace. Welcome to our family. Roderick smiled with genuine affection. I know Porik will be glad to have ye, and woe to any who think they can do ye harm. They would spend the winter in the Anderson house then, and work to build a life together as Caitlin and Roderick had. If the two of them could be happy, there was no reason Alana could not be happy with her husband. Thank ye, she whispered, reaching up on tiptoe to kiss him again. For what? There was so much to thank him for. So many ways in which he had changed her life. He'd shown her love, shown her there were men who would stand up for those in need of friendship or protection. He had spared her a life of misery, of heartache. She would spend the rest of her life thanking him for that and so much more. There was only one simple way to express it. For saving me. I hope you've enjoyed this latest production. Don't forget to subscribe and to ring the bell to be notified of new releases.